my philosophy. Lesbians, lesbians, lesbians. Chapter 1. What you are about to read is a true story. I was driving to work on the Long Island Expressway. It was mid-morning. Not much traffic. I turned the radio on. About half an hour later, it happened. I put my hand on my pants. I couldn't believe it. I had to pull over. I pulled over into the shade. Someone one or two car lengths behind me certainly could have seen what I was doing, that's for damn sure. It was the first time I had ever done anything like this before. But the show was making me nuts that morning. I was beating off to a radio call-in show. Here I was in my business suit. I didn't want to spill my love gunk all over my pants. What the hell could I come on? The only thing I could find was an old leather glove. I grabbed it. The girl was young, and she was being seduced by an older woman. When she started talking about her 34D breasts and the fact that she was wearing no bra, that really got me turned on. Lisa, I'm a blonde. People tell me I look like Catherine Oxenberg. I have a really good body. Howard's turn, how big are your breasts? Lisa, 36D, I think. Howard, what do you mean, I think? Lisa, I never wear a bra, so I don't know how big I am. I think a D. Howard, what about your waist? Lisa, 24. Howard, hips? Lisa, 36. Howard, and you really dig lesbian sex? Lisa, yes. Howard, how old were you when you first had lesbian sex? Lisa, 18. Howard, who with, a friend? Lisa, no, my mother's friend. Howard, an older woman seduced you? Lisa, yes. She was 32. I was very frightened when it happened but it ended up feeling good. Howard, and you were fully developed at 18, were you not? Lisa, well, yeah, I guess so. Howard, your breasts were a full D cup, your body had developed, you had hair on your body. Lisa, I sprouted out early. Howard, do you shave? Lisa, yes, I do. Howard, you groom very nicely? Lisa, yes. Howard, yeah, close cropped? Lisa, yes, very close cropped. Howard, are you blonde, ah, uh, all over? Lisa, light brown. Howard, really? Excellent. Robin, well, now, let me ask you something. This friend of your mother's, what did she look like? Lisa, really dark hair. She looks like Demi Moore. With long legs and big breasts and stuff. She was thin and tall. She had a beautiful face. Howard, so your mum was real young when she had you? Lisa, yeah. Howard, so, how did you end up with your mum's friend? Lisa, she would always come into my room and watch me change. Howard, had she ever seen you nude growing up? Lisa, yeah, yeah. Howard, had she seen you nude at 11, 12? Lisa, I would say so. Howard, had she seen you nude at 15? Lisa, yeah. Howard, oh, man, I'm so turned on. I'm making, that's how horny I am for you because you look like Catherine Oxenberg from, Dynasty. The long blonde hair, the perfect body, perfect. And you've run away modeled. I'm offering you to the lesbian community today. Am I not the greatest friend of the lesbian community? Do lesbians adore Howard's turn? If any oh you friggin homos say a bad thing about me again, I am going to complain to somebody in the gay organizations. So what were you wearing the day she came over? You were probably in your sleepwear, weren't you? Lisa, no, I was wearing a sundress. Howard, oh, my god, I love that. A sundress? God, I'd have fun with you as my girlfriend. You know what I do? I just put you in different outfits every five minutes. Dress you like a Barbie doll. So there you are, 18, you're in high school, your mom's friend comes over, and you're wearing a sundress, with a kind of a low cut top, short skirt. Lisa, yeah. Howard. And you're showing off your beautiful long legs, right? And you're wearing heels? Lisa, yes. Howard, I can't stand up right now. Do you believe that? 
Why don't you stand up, Jackie, comma the joke man, one of my writers. You big-bellied bastard. Jackie, I don't have a hard-on. Howard, yeah, I don't know what you have. You got a one-inch penis, that's why. You're probably aroused, no one can see it. All right, anyway, where were we? So why did your mom's friend come over? Lisa, she was in the clothing business, so she brought a big bag of leather clothes and stuff, and she had this blue leather outfit for me to try on. Howard, so she said, hey, this is a great outfit. Do you want to try it on? Lisa, yeah, and I said, great. So we went upstairs and... Listening to her first lesbian experience was more arousing than I imagined. I wanted to come while she was telling the story. I loved Howard's lesbian stories. At least five different guys told me that they jerked off to the show. Especially the lesbian stories. The story was getting better and better. I stroked and manipulated my shaft, careful not to hit the steering wheel. Careful not to pump too hard. I wanted this to last. I wanted to milk it for all it was worth. Howard, so you go upstairs, you're in your sundress, you go in a room together, and you say, hey, I'll try this on. No big deal to try it on in front of her. Now, here you are, with one of the best bodies I've ever seen, and all of a sudden you take off your sundress. Now, under your sundress, are you wearing a bra? Lisa, no. Howard, panties? Lisa, yes. Howard, are they thong panties? Lisa, no, just little white panties. Howard, little white panties. Lisa, so she said, well, why don't you take your clothes off so we can try the dress on? So I did, I unzipped my dress in the back, took it off, and put it on the bed. And I took my high heels off. Howard, MMMHMM. So you're completely naked except for panties. And then what happened? Lisa, so I tried on the leather dress. Howard, was it very tight? Lisa, very tight. Howard, and skimpy? Lisa, it was really nice. And she zipped it up for me, and she looked at me, and she told me, you look wonderful. You look great. Howard, and she's holding you when she tells you this? Lisa, no, she was standing behind me. We were looking in the mirror, and she was standing behind me and looking at me. So I just said, thank you very much. And then I started walking toward the bed, to take the dress off, and she followed me, and she kinda. Like turned me around and sat me down on the bed. Howard, low voice, talk slow. Lisa, and then she. She held me. Howard, she hugged you? Lisa, she put her arms, yeah. Howard, and you said? Lisa, she put her arms around me, you know. Howard, from behind you? Lisa, no, in front of me. Howard, in front of you. Lisa, she sat me down so I was facing her, and she put her arms around me and my face was. Howard, close to her. Lisa, chest. Howard, your face was on her chest? Lisa, yeah. Howard. She held you and hugged you against her chest. Lisa, yeah. I was very nervous. I didn't know what to do. Howard, did she kiss you? Lisa, she started caressing me and touching my arms and all. Howard, and it felt good. Lisa, and I started to get aroused. Howard, you got excited. Lisa, yeah, I did. Howard, you didn't resist. Lisa. Absolutely not. Howard, you didn't say, hey, what's going on here? This is very unusual. Nothing. Lisa, no, no. No, I was Howard, and what did she say? Lisa, there were no words spoken after that. Howard, no words spoken? Lisa, no, no. Howard, she started caressing you, and then she did everything to you. Lisa, yeah. Robin, did you do anything to her? Oh man. I was about to come but I held back. I was late for work but I didn't give a shit. I cranked the volume up and closed my eyes. Lisa, she instructed me for about an hour. Howard, oh, I can picture that. Oh, 
man. My head's exploding. Lisa, then she leaned over and kissed my mouth while she gently cupped my breasts. My penis exploded like a volcano and my hot molten liquid poured into my leather glove, just as Howard said, oh, man. My head's exploding, I threw the glove out the window to destroy the evidence and sped off to work. Fucking Howard, radio god. Can you believe this? My producer, Gary Delabate, alias Barbabooey, actually knows this guy. And he knows five other guys who beat off to my show. It's a fucking epidemic. Now, when I think of my radio audience, I envision guys driving to work on the expressway, guys who need an opportunity to hear about lesbians. Lesbianism, let's face it, is a godsend. Every man in the world is totally fascinated by those sisters of Sappho. I know I am. To have two girls doing wild things to each other with me in the sack would be unbelievable. And since I never got to experience any of that because I got happily married so fucking young, I have to do it vicariously. The lesbian dating game from my TV show. Lesbians bring home the ratings. Lesbian Hollywood squares, left, and, below. Kirk, me, and Spock, Gary, visit the planet Lesbos. A planet of wild lesbians. Everyone loves good lesbian stories. I had a caller named Jean tell us about her initiation, courtesy of her counselor at Girl Scout Camp. Jean was a right 14 at the time and her counselor was 17. They started by hanging out on rocks and having long talks. You mean you'd start talking about, gee, what if other girls liked other girls question, I asked. No, this was in the days of Donna Red. We didn't even talk about sexuality per se. I didn't even have the word lesbian in my vocabulary, Jean said. I'm getting nervous with this story, I said, I'm not hearing enough sex stuff. You're not giving me a chance, Jean protested. It's a Friday. My audience isn't looking for Oprah, I prodded her, what did your counselor look like? Was she cute? Stunning, Jean said. I only went for the good looking ones. Absolutely gorgeous. She was 5'10, athletic. So she just all of a sudden starts kissing you? I asked. I think I started kissing her first. Then we'd find opportunities to get in bed together. We slept in a tent and I had my bunk carefully positioned at the back of the tent, with the flap that faced the woods. She'd sneak out at night, slip up through the back flap, and climb into my bunk, Jean said. Were the other campers there? I wondered. Yeah. The other five Girl Scouts were sleeping. Jean said. Wow, I marveled. Yeah, and we'd fondle and pattened. I'm never sending my kids to camp, I said. Years later, my mom said if she'd known that that's what I was going to camp for, she never would have sent me, Jean laughed. Hey Allison, if you're listening, chain the kids to the bed, I warned my wife. It was like Club Med, Jean went on, I had two counselors at one time the following year. I did it in a church with a counselor. There was a chapel out in the woods and we did it in the church on an overnight. Lesbians, oh, I love lesbians. I love lesbians, I ranted. We've got the kinkiest lesbo stories, too. One woman called in who said she looked just like Cindy Crawford. She was 5'9", weighed 130, with a 38 26 38 double D body. She told me that when I have lesbian calls, she lies in bed and, takes care, of herself. But her best story was the story of her lesbo induction. I have a really, really best friend in the whole world, even hotter than me. She looks like the redhead on China Beach. There was always an element of sexual tension between us. She was also very promiscuous in the days when promiscuity was safe. From time to time, before we'd go out, she'd get dressed and I'd see her breasts and everything and I'd just try to hold it in. I would be dying, you know. She knew about my lifestyle, that I was into girls, and she used to tease me without trying. I think she wanted it, but she didn't know how to go about it either. She was always kinda hot for my brother. We lived on an island and our parents went away for the summer. So one night, I went down to the nightclub at Ocean Beach and I met a friend. We were just going to have some drinks. What were you wearing that night? I interrupted her monologue. I had on a dense skin that was like a tank top. No bra, hard nipples. 
many shorts. So me and my friend walked back to my parents' boat and the boat was moving. I said, HMM, somebody must be down there. It was my brother and my girlfriend. And they were very nude. They were doing it. And I almost died. I wanted her. I turned around to the person I was with and said, Oh, you gotta go, my parents are on the boat. He gave me a hard time but he left. So I went down in and I saw them and she was facing away from him, looking right at me. I just took the straps down off my dan skin and I pulled it down around my waist, and I was just standing there, topless, and she stuck her hand out like to come here. Ooh, and your brother's there, I screamed. My brother didn't know what was going on. And I walked over and I started to kiss her. Touch her. I gasped. Kiss things, she laughed. Oh, man, my sister never got it on with anyone in front of me. Howard, you've got to stop, I'm getting so horny, she said. You are? You're a minx. And you grabbed her? I guessed. I was very gentle. We got it on, but I didn't do anything with my brother. While she was doing stuff, I was doing her. This is the sickest, sick. I feigned disgust. Oh, it is not. I wanted to make sure that she reached, because in that position you really can't. She talked a bit more and then she hung up. Horny girl. In front of her brother. That's the sickest thing, sick animal. Perverts. I was delirious, this country is doomed. Where am I? I'm not doing anything. I haven't gotten it in three months. One of the hottest lesbian stories I ever heard came from the lips of a 26-year-old listener who had just had her first experience the night before she called in. She was a successful businesswoman who was in sales. She said she had always thought about trying lesbianism but had never really done it. She claimed to be a very good-looking woman so I asked her if a lot of women came onto her. No, I've never had another woman come onto me, she said. Do you dress provocatively at work? I asked her. No. I wear very nice business suits. Underneath your business suit, do you sometimes wear a camisole, she said, very lacy, silky, satin. And do you wear panties with those garters? I asked. No, but I wear the thigh-high pantyhose with just elastic and lace on the top. Very, very sexy. She reported that she was 5 at and weighed 120 pounds and that her measurements were 34 d 26 36. I started getting really horny. Then she said she looked like Phoebe Katz. No, Kman, be serious, I moaned. No, it's true. I have long dark hair and full lips, like the kind that people are collagening. All right. So what happened to you yesterday that caused you to enter the world of lesbianism? I couldn't wait to hear this. Well, I was going to meet a friend to grab a bite to eat and have a drink. I got to her neighborhood early, and I had a few hours to kill, so I thought I'd go into a club that I thought looked nice. I walked in, and there weren't that many people there. But it was early. So I sat down at the bar. The girl behind the bar was dressed outrageously, and was very sexy, and she was just really pleasant. Then somebody sat down next to me and she was really attractive. She had on a mini skirt and a shirt that tied. She didn't have a bra on. She kind of looked like Cindy Crawford. I mean, this is stretching it, but she was very, very pretty. And very buxom. Hey, how many guys are aroused so far? Jackie, you got one? I asked. Flying, reported Jackie, the joke man. Me, too, I'm flying, I said, Fred. Cindy Crawford did it for me, said Fred Norris, the man from Mars and one of my writers. I've been flying since she told me that she wears those camisoles. Robin, anything flying on you? I asked. I don't even know what the story's about, Robin said. So you're at the bar, and she sits down next to you, and you go, hey, she's a pretty girl, I said. Yeah, we just started talking, and we were very comfortable together. The conversation just kept flowing. And then my drink got low and she said, can I buy you another drink? At first I didn't even think anything of it. But were you thinking to yourself, hey, this is a pretty sexy woman, I asked. Yeah, I actually was thinking that, as I started getting a little, you know, 
It took a couple of drinks to start really. And were you touching each other when you were talking? Did she put her hand on your back? I asked. No, she didn't do anything yet. Then I kinda looked around and was wondering why there were no men in here. I said, isn't this bizarre that there's like no guys in here? And she said, do you know where you are? I said, no. And she said, this is a gay bar. And I said, it is? And she said, wow, I'm sorry. I was really coming on to you. It was really bizarre but I just looked at her and I said, oh, I don't know that I would have minded that. I don't know why that came out, but I guess it's because I was feeling it. You were feeling sexy with her, I said, nothing wrong with that, don't feel bad about that. Well, it was really strange. And, as it turned out. Wait, wait. Slow this down, I said, so this happens, now where did you to go? Well, what happened was I went into the bathroom and I looked around the place, there were things going on, she said. Like there were people making out and stuff, girls? I asked. Right. And when I went into the bathroom I didn't realize, cause I've never been in one of these places, but there were regular stalls to go to the bathroom, and then there were longer stalls, and they have those lounges in them. And they're not the kind that fold down, they're just straight, like beds, and they're curved a little. You mean you can lay down with another girl? I was beside myself. Isn't that incredible? She laughed. And when you walked in, you saw two girls getting it on in the bathroom. Well, they're behind the stalls, but three are big gaps, so you could definitely see in. They were going wild, and I could not believe how turned on I got, she said. It's like individual hump parlors, I marveled, and you got really hot. Well, I'm sure the alcohol had a little to do with it. Right, and you were getting turned on. You said to yourself, I want this, I said. And all of a sudden she came in behind me, and cupped me from behind. Do you know what I mean? And I just turned around, and at that point she kissed me. She started to kiss you with her tongue? I asked. Oh, MMMHMM, she moaned. Fred, come over here and cup me. Kman, man. Kman, give me a break, pal. You know this is a great story, Jackie said because Fred stopped eating. So she cupped you and you turned around and you started kissing. Then what happened? She started to disrobe you in the bathroom? I prodded. MMMHMM. Did you go to one of those little parlors? Yeah. And she started to remove all your clothing? Yeah. And then did you undress her? Yeah. And then you had full lesbian passion? We did everything. We did it all, she said. It was really wonderful, I must say. I don't know that I ever thought that this would have ever happened to me. But, and she had a hot body? I asked. Yeah, she was really, really gorgeous. What happened to the meeting with her friend, though? Robin asked. Screw the friend, she's in the bathroom. Imagine the stink in there, too. Oh, man, what's going on? Like... Aren't girls going in there and talking dumps and stuff? I asked. Well, you know something? I don't know. I didn't pay attention to anything else that was going on. What did you do first? Well, I didn't know what to do, so she had to teach me. She started tugging at my shirt but it wouldn't come down because my breasts are so big. How big? My breasts are so full. They even look bigger because my stomach is so fiat and hard. And your hips are really narrow, too, right? I said. Yes. She started ripping at my shirt, kissing me on my cleavage. I was getting really excited. You were turned on? Yeah, my nipples were so hard and I got this really a feeling all over my body. Where? In your most private of places? Yes, I could barely stand up. She pushed me back on the couch. I was on the couch and I pulled my shirt off exposing my breasts. Did your breasts fall to the sides? No, they're really firm and full. They stood straight up. So they're not sloppy. Hey guys, they're not sloppy, Fred lay unconscious in the corner. Jackie's big toe, I know, was up his arsehole. He was a gymnast in high school, then what happened? She played with me and caressed me and I was getting more and more excited. 
What about your thigh-high pantyhose? I have really long, thin legs and I was wearing long, spiky high heels. She took off my shoes and she stripped me of my pantyhose and before I knew it, she was sucking. On my feet. Did that turn you on? I loved it. No guy had ever done that to me. So did you do anything to her? At first, no. What was she wearing? She had no bra on. She just untied her top and her breasts just fell out. They were incredible. She rubbed them against my legs as she sucked my toes. She kept her miniskirt on, but she wasn't wearing any underwear. Was she shaved? Completely. He's completely anarchic, outside the establishment. He's bawdy, lewd, lustful. Constantly attacking sacred cows. He's also genuinely funny. Dash Camille Paglia. Whore. Slut. Bitch. Lesbo. Radio sucks. We had to cut off her story. It was getting too graphic. I was going crazy. I tried to persuade her to come down to the studio and pose nude so we could paint her. I was going through my Van Gogh stage. But she was resistant. She claimed she was too busy at work. Oh, come on, you do sales. You can screw off a little bit. You've had time to be in bathrooms with women, I protested. She still claimed she was too busy to come in. I used a harmonizer to make my voice sound deep, like Satan's. Abandon everything. Now that you've had lesbianism, come to our studio and let us paint you. Let us paint you, my dear. You want to be naked in the room with me, Jackie, and Fred. Don't you want to be painted and immortalized? I must say that this is like the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to me, she said. I kept trying, in my normal voice, hey, why don't you ask your lesbian to come on down with you? You guys can be in bathing suits, and we'll paint you while you guys get to know each other better. Cause I need nude models, I suggested. I know you do, I know you do. I'm not sure that I'd be into that, she said. All right. I gave up, but I got clapped and tickets for you. That was a good story. Now I'm even more sexed up than I was 15 minutes ago. Hey, do me a favor, go meet another girl tonight and call us back tomorrow. She hung up. I felt drained. Then Gary came into the studio. Can I tell you what a twisted world we live in? He said, we got a ton of phone calls from women, begging me for the name of the place, which we're not giving out. And I also got a call from a private investigator who wanted to know if we wanted to hire him to go in and videotape what's going on in there. The differences between the 80s and the 90s. Congresswoman Fellner, are you willing to admit your role in the S&L fiasco? In the 80s radio personality Larry King made it big in television. Congresswoman Fellner, are you willing to admit that, despite being a lesbian, you find me attractive? In the 90s radio personality Howard Stern is making it big in television. Hate mail. Dear Mr. Stern I am writing in response to the insulting remarks you made about the Blessed Virgin Mary, lately. I am having a mass said for you, and Robin, for God to have mercy on you for the remarks you made about his mother. I will keep you in my prayers, and ask you to cease offending people and the Mother of God, who is by extension, Mother of us all. This is a very old prayer card. But it's so lovely, I wanted you to have it. I'm sorry it's torn. Our Lady of Fatima 1917 Dear Mr. Stern Recently, you stated on the air that Chris Burke, the young man who plays Corky on, Life Goes On, is not an actor. You explained that he is not really acting because he has Down syndrome, as does his character. In other words, because he is a retarded man and as such is limited to playing the roles of retarded young men. Therefore, he is not a true actor. To this argument, I can only say, what an ignorant, moronic, asinine, infantile and, yes, retarded thing to say. So lay off Chris Burke and his acting. And good luck with your acting career. I advise you, though, to change your character's name from Fartman to Fartbrain, although in either case you might be accused of not being a real actor, because rude, flatulent behavior seems to follow you everywhere. Dear Howard, the honky cracker kike, Stern you ought to be ashamed of yourself for criticizing a great black man like Spike Lee. You seem to have a problem with black people who are doing well in this country. People like Bill Cosby, Arsenio Hall, 
and David Dinkins. You're just pissed off because the brothers used to kick your ass when you lived in Roosevelt. Couldn't your kike further teach you how to fight you honky faggot? I'm sorry I forgot, kikes can't fight. I hope Lenrig Nelson Jr. comes down to your studio and carves you up like a Thanksgiving turkey. Sincerely angry black woman. It was the worst of times, it was the worst of times. The Star and Family Chapter 2 My family story is actually pretty tragic. It's story of how two children of immigrants united to give birth to an innocent son and then, through an assortment of ingenious tortures, both consciously and unconsciously motivated, managed to turn that son's life into an emotional shipwreck. Then, as if that wasn't enough, this poor man-child found a woman to share his life and she came complete with an additional set of parents and siblings to torment him. Yes, this is my story, a tale of two dysfunctional families. It was the worst of times, it was the worst of times. Raised like a veal. Mrs. Stern, you have a really happy baby, the doctor said at my birth, Howard's very smiley. He's as happy as a mongoloid idiot. Who knew I'd grow up to be so miserable? Basically, my mother, Ray, raised me like a veal. It was like growing up in a box with no lights on. Sure I was tender, because my mother would never allow me to do anything. She was constantly attentive totally overbearing, and would always put fear in me. If I played sports, I'd get hurt. If, God forbid, I left the house without a coat on, I'd catch cold. I always had have rest periods to collect my energy. She had these cookie rules for everything. But it worked. To this day, I can't go out of the house for more than five minutes without worrying that something bad is going to happen to me. I live in fear of everything. I can't enjoy life so I sit in my house and vegetate. Under dim lights, of course. I confess. I'm an obsessive compulsive, anal retentive, miserable neurotic because I was raised by a woman who ran her household with the intensity of Hitler. Now, let me clarify things. I love my mother. She had the best intentions. She's a very moral, upright person. In fact, my mother broke the world down into a battle between good and evil and anything that didn't conform to her worldview was definitely evil. Man, did she put me on a permanent guilt trip. One time I was walking down the street with my wife, Alison, and I saw a wad of bills on the ground. I picked it up, started to walk away, and all of a sudden I heard my mother's annoying voice, Don't pick it up. Don't pick it up. That belongs to someone else, idiot that I am. I felt bad for the poor slob who dropped it and had this lunatic idea that he was going to come back to look for it. So I ran back and put the money down exactly where I found it. And boy, did this woman have wacky ideas and bizarre practices. First of all, I couldn't have any pets growing up. My mother was convinced that pets actually drain energy out of the humans who own them. To this day, I swear, if I'm feeling a little run down, I walk around my house thinking that our cat is like Hugo or something. At six months, drooling like a mongoloid. But some of the strangest of her practices centered around my underpants. My mother was obsessed with them. First of all, the minute she bought me underpants, she would have to sew big name tags into them. She was always concerned about me losing things. This I never understood. If I lost them, and someone else found them, what were they going to do? drop them into the nearest mailbox. Who would even want to touch these dirty things? Plus, my mother kept this up all through college. Can you imagine my embarrassment when I was in bed with some lady and she's taking off my underpants and she slips her hand beneath the elastic waistband and says, what's this tag on the back? My mother never stopped. She went on archaeological digs in the dirty clothes hamper. She was like a research scientist and my underpants were her petri dish. She could even tell what I'd eaten for lunch. And God forbid she should find a little stain on a bear. She'd run upstairs to her only bathroom, run hot water in the sink, and rub soap into my underwear. The whole family would parade in and out to use the sink only to be stopped by the soaking underpants. You might as well have had a neon sign flashing, stay away from the sink. Howard had another accident. Was this total emasculation or what? My mother had me so crazy that, in kindergarten, when I pooped in my pants, I was always afraid to come home. I would come home with a full metal jacket in my underpants, 
run up to my room, take off my underpants, and sneak out in the backyard to bury them. Somewhere in Roosevelt, Long Island, there's a BVD tree with some pretty fertile soil around it. One time I ran out of underpants. So my mother told me to wear her panties to school. I actually put them on. They were huge and very soft, and as soon as she left the room I took them off, fished out the least crusty pair from the hamper, and wore them to school. Can you imagine the humiliation I would have faced changing for gym class? I might as well have moved out of state. The funny thing is, sloppy underpants weren't even my fault. My mother never toilet drained me right. She never taught. Uh-oh. I think I had an accident, me at seven years old. Me the proper method of wiping. When I was four, I developed a bad case of rectal worms. I had to take a dump in a cardboard box and my mother and father drove me and my turd to the doctor's office, where he made the diagnosis. The worms cleared up but a much more chronic condition ensued, anal fissures. I itched like crazy. I would bury my fingers so far up into my underpants that I would poke holes in them. I had no idea how bad it was until a doctor fresh out of medical school took one look at my sphincter and told me I had a hole the size of a garage door down there. It was like a blowhole. And all because I never learned how to wipe properly. Now don't laugh at me, because judging from the amount of hemorrhoid creams and ointments being sold, a lot of you don't know how to properly care for your sphincters, either. How it's a lols for a healthier rectum. So, as a public service to my readers, I will now impart to you the wiping wisdom I've learned from sources other than my mother. Pay attention because you will never have another hemorrhoid or problem back there again. I used to overwipe. I would scrape and strain. But you must only take three swipes and that's it. Oh, and stay away from dyed toilet paper. Use white and you'll be all right. If you feel dirty down there, jump in the shower and scrub down. But stick to the three wipe maximum. Also never push. Wait until that bowel movement is sliding out of your ass before you go to the bowl. If you're pushing a lot. You probably need oat bran cereal for breakfast plus three tablets of evening primrose oil, one with each meal. That should grease it all up. My mother also had this cookie compulsion to constantly monitor my temperature. And, of course, she used a rectal thermometer every day of my life until I was 18 years old. It's amazing I didn't become a mass murderer like John Wayne Gacy. When my mother dies I'm going to have her mummified. I'll prop her up in my attic and tie her to a chair. I'm going to save all her clothes and I'll wear a bad wig and parade around the house in her house coat and panties. Mom, I love you. And thank you for putting me in touch with my feminine side. Ray, Howard, I can't believe these stories you're making up. You exaggerate everything. Howard, don't say you didn't make me put on your panties. Ray, I never did. Howard, well... What about taking my rectal temperature until I was 18 years old? You humiliated me by raping me with that piece of plastic. Ray, don't make a big deal out of everything. You grew up to be a very well-adjusted individual. Howard, it's a miracle I'm not a homo. Ray, that's what a homo comes from? Howard, you better believe it. Before you know it, you're putting ashtrays up there. It's a miracle I'm normal. Although I did pay a woman $150 the other night to take my temperature with a drumstick. Thermometers just don't satisfy me anymore. Shut up. Sit down, you moron. My father, Ben, is a no-nonsense guy who has guided me in my career and stood by me no matter what. He loves me, but he was tough on me. It was understandable, though, because his dad had been real hard on him, too. My father was a radio engineer who eventually bought his own recording studio with five other guys. He never made big money, though. We were living in Roosevelt in a house that cost my old man $14,000. A good house would have cost about double that back then, but my father didn't mind driving an extra 50 miles to save money. Every day he'd drive to Queens, Park, and take the subway to work. Then he'd come home and sit down at the dinner table and expect to be served like a king. Even today, he just sits there with a miserable expression on his face until his wife serves him. As a kid I was disturbed that my mom had to serve my father like that, but then I started to analyze it and I realized he was right. In fact, 
I try to do the same thing with Alison. I just sit there while Alison sits down with her plate all full and eventually she'll look over at me and go, oh, Howard, you don't have anything. Then I get up and get it myself. King Ben would come home and sit on his throne and everything had to be just right. One of the nightly rituals was serving him a Rob Roy, his favorite drink. I swear they tasted like paint thinner. But my mother didn't mind making him docks of drinks because she figured they'd tranquilize him. She'd spend half the day preparing the Rob Roy for his dinner. And he would give her explicit directions on how to do this. First, she had to chill the glass. Then she took a lemon rind and ran it around the rim of the glass. Then she mixed the alcohol, one part vermouth and one part whiskey, and chilled it. Finally, my mom would put a piece of saran wrap over the top of the glass in the refrigerator so everything would be perfect when he got home. My old man could be a bastard sometimes. She would kill herself for half the day preparing this stupid drink and he'd sip it and go, HMMM. Not as good as the one you made last night, honey. Meanwhile, we were living in Roosevelt, an almost all black community, a place worse than South Central L. A. There wasn't a white neighbor in sight, and my father was in his little bungalow, making believe he was in some fancy country club, sipping away at his Rob Roy. My mother let me make my dad his Rob Roy one night, which was a big mistake. I sure as hell wasn't going to go through that torture. I'd piss in that damn glass before I spent half my day making a stupid drink. If I got it Jay used slightly off, my father would scream his head off at me. Those drinks didn't tranquilize him at all. He would just get all lit and red-faced and then scream even louder. No matter what I did or said, he'd just yell at me. Hey, Dad, how was your day? Are you putting me on? Shut up. Dad, I'm just asking. You don't care about my day. Shut up, you moron. You'd be bitching to my mum about work and how his partners were screwing the business up and I would try to empathize with him and ask him questions. What? He'd yell at me, what did you say? I'm talking to your mother, you dummy. You don't know what it is to have a partner. You never even worked. Get out of here. Shut up. I remember one time I told him that I wanted to be a millionaire and he chased me up the stairs. He was going to beat the fucking shit out of me. You dope, you don't even know what it's like to make money, he screamed, you say you want to make money? Let me see your work. You won't even lift your ass to mow the lawn. Shut up. Meanwhile, if I even tried to mow the lawn, he would grab the lawn mower from me and complain about how he was the only one in the family that had the brains to know how to mow the lawn right. My dad and I never did things that most dads and their sons do. I think he was a pretty good athlete but he never suggested we play sports together. Once I played catch with my father. I threw him the ball and he missed it and it hit him in the nuts and that was the end of that. My father's favorite sport was yelling. And he was pretty scary. I'm surprised that he didn't just wake up one night and wipe us all out like a disgruntled postal worker. Maybe he got all his frustrations out by yelling at us. Actually, it was mostly yelling at me. My father would never yell at my sister, because she was his favorite, his little jewel. And my mother actually dug it when my father yelled at me because that would take the heat off her. I was the designated yelly. He'd do it everywhere and under any conditions. We'd go out to a restaurant to eat and we all had to know what we wanted to order before we even got there. He'd get all embarrassed in front of the waiter for some stupid reason. My mother would fumble around with the menu, indecisive about what to eat. I know what I want to eat before we get here. You shouldn't need a menu. Then you'd get bent out of shape if we ordered out of order. Howard. You order your appetizer, then your salad dressing, then your entree, you moron. Here we are in some Schiffel Greek diner and my father's worrying about following the rules of Amy Vanderbilt and Emily Post. I once asked for Russian dressing after my entree and all hell broke loose. What do you care what the waiter thinks? I'd ask. There's a proper way to order, you idiot. He's that way to this day. I should take Stuttering John out to dinner with him. He put him right through a wall. When we go out with my parents to dinner, I always order the same thing just to please my father. Meanwhile my wife's like a retard. She starts nudging me with her elbow, I don't know what to order. Help me. 
My wife goes into a panic because if she doesn't order properly my father starts to get all agitated. When I graduated college, my father came to the commencement ceremonies and then he yelled at me all the way home. What are you going to do now, you idiot? But dad, I graduated magna cum laude. Shut up. I paid 20 grand for that degree. I never went to college. People always thought I was kidding or exaggerating when I talked about the way my father yelled. But then we found some evidence. I unearthed some old tapes that my father neglected to throw out and I brought them into Scott the engineer. The next day he came into my office. You don't know what's on these tapes, he marveled. Apparently they were tapes made of the Stern family at my father's recording studio when I was seven years old. Once a year, my parents would march me and my sister and my cousins to the studio and he would record us singing and fooling around. Except he didn't like it when we fooled around. In two seconds, my father would lose his patience and start screaming like a banshee. And now I had the tapes to prove it. These sessions were supposed to be fun, but I dreaded them. Who wanted to be humiliated in front of his sister and cousins? My father would interview us and ask us questions about current events and stuff and I would sweat bullets because if I said one wrong word, that was it. My sister would just breeze through the questions, because he'd never yell at her. But just listen to this sample exchange. Ben Stern, do you feel the United States should remain as a member of the United Nations? Howard, yes, I really do. Ben Stern, are there any special reasons why you feel they should? Howard, there should be peace in all the countries and we wouldn't have any war because we don't want the Japs anymore ha 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 ha, I imitated the sound of machine gun. Ben Stern, I told you not to be stupid, you moron. See? See? Right away with the moron stuff. I was just doing some shtick, some humor, and my old man freaks. And being called a moron to me was real. I thought I was a moron. At seven years of age, you'd think he'd cut me some slack. But no, it was, shut up. Sit down. We played these tapes on the air and my father called in and said he felt like Nixon. We get along great now as adults. But believe me, at the time, he turned me into a basket case with all the yelling. The day after we played the tapes on the air, a neighbor of my father's came over to him and said, Hey, Ben, how do I get my kids into that Ben's turn daycare center? They're out of line. One of our classic bits was about to be born. The Ben's turn daycare center. A child's world is a fragile one. And that's why you need the Ben's turn daycare center. If you want to turn your child into an overachieving, self-hating megalomaniac who spends his days hiding from his family and his nights masturbating, then the Ben's turn daycare center will work for you. Our motto. Shut up. Sit down. Shut up. Sit down. Shut up. Sit down. Our founder Ben Stern. My father was definitely the disciplinarian, but during the day, when he was at work, my mother was in charge of giving me a smack. If I got out of line. So one day she complained to him that her hand was hurting from smacking me. He told her to get a stick and hit me. So she got one of those half wooden, half wire coat hangers from the dry cleaners and she detached the wire part. My father came home from work and my mother told him that this wasn't good either because I held her arm so she couldn't hit me. So my father called me over for a little talk. Howard, your mother tells me you're not letting her discipline you, he said. Who in their right mind is gonna just stand there and let someone whack him with a stick? I asked. Look, your mother has to express herself in some way, he told me, let her give you a couple of little bangs and we'll get it over with. Why are you making such a big thing out of it? But I always resisted being disciplined, no, I don't want to go up to my room, I'd say, trying to brown nose her, I want to be by your side. One time she forced me to go up to my room, so I started chewing up my furniture. I don't even think it was a protest or anything, it was just a fun thing to do. I was gnawing at my wooden dresser drawer, scraping my teeth against it, and by the time my mother came up to get me, there were big chunks ripped out of it. Actually, that was probably a very rational thing to do given my circumstances. Can you imagine being trapped in that madhouse for 18 years with no way out? I didn't have the balls to run away from home and live on the streets. 
all I had to do was go to Times Square and have sex with a few old men like John Voight did in Midnight Cowboy and I could have had my own pad. Speaking of sex, I'm sure that's why my father used to scream so much. I know he wasn't getting any from my mother. I figured that out when he took me to see Barbarella, starring Jane Fonda. I was about 15 and my mother was visiting her father in Florida. So my father said, let's go to the movies. This was great, because I really didn't get a lot of chances to pal around with him alone. Now, my dad's pretty knowledgeable, but I don't think he knew it was going to be a dirty movie. Imagine you're 15 and your hormones are going crazy and Jane Fonda comes on a big screen with those two plastic see-through things over her breasts. And right next to you is your dad. We were both pretty embarrassed. We left the theater and never spoke about it. I just knew he wasn't getting it at home. So, over the years, whenever my mother called up on my show, I made it a point to ask her about their sexual practices. One time she was acting so grabby that I told her she needed to get laid. After we hung up, Gary stormed into the studio. I can't believe you told your mother she needed to get laid, Barbara Bowie marveled. She does, I affirmed, but she wants to be celibate. I called my mother back. You want to say you're sorry? My mother asked. Admit you want to be celibate, I said. How can I be celibate? I'm a married woman, she said. So you're saying you're not celibate? You have a love life? I asked. Yes, my mother said. Oh, I'm going to throw up, I said. I hate to tell you this, Howard, it's a shock a -roo, right? She laughed. You mean you like the pants monster of love? I just can't accept that. You and my dad doing it. If you do do it, it's got to be once a month, tops. Just tell me how often you do it, I pleaded. It's none of your business, my mother maintained. Please, Ma, I got to know. You let that animal touch you? He bangs you? I can't believe it. That's your father you're talking about, she reminded me. Oh, man, I'm in shock. He touches your cans? Hey, did you know Robin likes anal sex? She's a three-input woman. Would you ever do that, Ma? Do what? What's this three inputs? she asked. Either you have two places to put it or three, Mum. Are you a three-input woman with Dad? How many geese have the balls to ask their mom if she takes it out the ass? Please, Howard, she said. What about that stuff Chip did to Madonna? When he guzzled water and relieved himself. I was referring to the exclusive story that Chip from Enough Snuff told us about urinating during a sex session with Madonna. Does that excite you? Can you fathom that? Imagine if Dad did that to you. Dad, do me a favor, do that and videotape it. That'll be the greatest videotape that ever was. Does that excite you in some bizarre way, Ma? I'm not talking, my mother said. I've seen Dad naked. Is the reason you don't like to have sex with him much because it hurts you? I asked. My father, unlike me, is hung like a moose. I'm sure my mother was frightened by his huge hose. Hurts what? She said. Does it hurt? It was wonderful talking to you. My mother was ready to bail. I love you, mommy, I said dutifully. I love you, too, she said. You don't get up on all fours, do you? Goodbye, my mom said and hung up. My sister. Ellen, daddy's favorite. My sister, Ellen is the complete opposite of me. She's four years older but she's very quiet. We had a perfect relationship. I would beg for and suck in all the attention in the house and she could live her life unnoticed. She was the type who could just curl up with a book and be in heaven. I remember once, right after she got her license, she and I drove out to the beach. She lay down on the blanket, cracked open her book, and didn't move for hours. Me. I was going out of my friggin' mind. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't move. But we used to get along. Except when it came to watching TV. Another one of my mother's idiotic theories was that her two children should watch television together. As I said, my sister is four years older than me, and at ten years of age, she wanted to watch love movies. At six years of age, all I wanted to watch was Yogi Bear cartoons. 
to me that it was the ultimate in entertainment. So my mother devised a plan that every other day the other person got to pick out what we'd watch. But my sister was shrewd. One day when it was her turn to pick, there was a Yogi Bear cartoon I was dying to watch. So she said that she'd let me watch it that day if I let her watch what she wanted for a year. So I said, okay. I'm a little kid, I have no idea what a year is. A couple of days went by and she was watching everything she wanted to watch and, finally, I said, when's my turn to pick the show? My sister then told me I couldn't pick for a year. So we went to my mother to arbitrate. What was the deal you made? She asked me. Ellen can pick the shows for a year, I said. That's it, my mother said, a deal's a deal. I learned pretty early that life sucked. The best time I ever had with Ellen, though, was when I saw her dancing naked in her room when she was nine. She was developing those trademarks turn woman breasts. But other than that, I didn't catch many glimpses of her. Our household wasn't exactly a nudist colony. Although my father once said, there's too much modesty in this house, and he walked out of the bathroom stark naked. My mother said, Ben. Ben, and my sister covered her eyes. And when I was about nine, I saw my mother naked. That was pretty frightening. Back then, women didn't know about the grooming thing. At first, I thought she was wearing panties. Mohair panties. Visiting my sister, Santa in college while wearing my serial killer glasses. I was thirteen. Little big man. All right, so I've got a small penis. It's so embarrassing. I would give anything for even another inch. I don't get it either, because my father is so well hung. He might be four inches, just hanging around. The trouble is, he never gets to do anything with it. My mother knew I had a small penis, but she ignored it whenever she'd take my rectal temperature. But one of the most humiliating memories of my childhood was when my father had to check me for a hernia and he actually touched me down there. I threw him out of the room, I was so embarrassed. Having a small penis has haunted me throughout my life. Whenever I'm with a bunch of guys, like going to Atlantic City to gamble or stuff, and we have to make a stop on the way to urinate, I always make a beeline for the stalls. I can't do it at a urinal. God forbid someone should see my puny pecker. I barely clear the zipper. If all the stalls are filled and I have to use a urinal, I press up so close to it that it's like I'm humping the porcelain. My biggest fear about the draft and going into the army was that my dad told me when you go to the bathroom in the army there are no walls or anything between urinals and toilets. So everybody sees everything. I was going to run off to Canada just for that reason. My strange childhood. Is it any wonder that I had a strange childhood living in this nuclear family? Let me give you a few examples. My mother thought that playing with dolls was an excellent outlet for creativity. But even she didn't want me to be ostracized by all my friends, so she decided to get me marionettes. By the time I was seven years old, I had become an accomplished puppeteer. My father built me a little stage and I would regularly put on shows for my friends and neighbors. In fact, I got so good at it that an old aide home asked me to do a production of Fiddler on the Roof using my marionettes. The old people loved it and wouldn't stop complimenting me after the show. They just loved the singing. They were so out of it they didn't realize the voices weren't mine, it was an actual recording from the Broadway show. At the end of the night, I was handed an envelope with ten bucks inside. What a windfall. Getting paid good money for something you enjoyed was definitely a trip. So I started entertaining my friends with puppet shows in the basement. One thing led to another and before I knew it, I was doing dirty marionette shows. I had a nice girl puppet and a sailor marionette and I would have the sailor fuck the shit out of the girl. Then the pirate puppet would come in, knock the sailor out, and grab his girl and bang her all over the place. My friends went wild. The shows got more and more perverse when I got a horse puppet. I had the horse fucking all the other puppets and it got pretty out of control. Plus, I kept a running commentary the entire time. My friends loved it. Once I started doing the dirty puppet shows, I really lost interest in regular puppeteering, and pretty soon, all the puppets were wrapped up and put in storage. I had ruined a beautiful, innocent part of my life. Demonstrating my technique to my cousin Paul.
the X-rated ventriloquist preparing for his next pornographic puppet show. Then my mother tried to get me interested in piano lessons, but that also ended on a sour note. I took a few lessons from a local piano teacher who begged my mother to make me quit, I'm just taking money from you. I feel guilty, he said. A few weeks later, this nice man went home and killed himself. My mother didn't give up. She decided I should volunteer at the local cerebral palsy center in my spare time. This lasted for hours. It was an experience that separated the men from the boys. I was definitely a boy. A boy veal. Thanks to my overprotective mother, I was the target of every bully in the neighborhood. A fat neighborhood kid named Johnny, who used to blow his nose into his Italian ices, then eat them with a wooden spoon used to beat me up so regularly that my parents made me go to judo school to learn to defend myself. On the day of my first lesson I took a brush and scrubbed my feet down before I went. I knew in judo you had to take your socks and shoes off. I always hated to take baths or showers. I would go for days without washing until my mother would smell me and go, you stink, and march me in for a bath. So I went to judo with my scrubbed feet, I took off my shoes and socks and the Korean instructor looked down at my toenails and he freaked out. These are weapons, he screamed, you've got to cut these, you're going to kill somebody. Then, I looked around the room and saw all these young, athletic, Nordic Nazi types jumping over garbage pails and doing somersaults. There was no way I could do that. It was easier letting Johnny beat me up. Is it any wonder that I wound up doing drugs? I smoked a lot of pot when I was in high school. But it wasn't fun because it made me so friggin' paranoid. All my friends would come over and we'd go out to my garage and smoke grass. I used to get Mexican. I'd go over to my friend's house and cop from his older brother. His older brother was in college and he was a big, fat, white Jewish guy who'd be lying naked on his bed like a beached whale wearing a sombrero while reading Penthouse and playing with himself. This guy had the smallest penis I'd ever seen, even smaller than mine. We had to buy our marijuana from this fat naked guy. It was a disgusting experience. I would smoke dope and cigarettes up in my bedroom, blowing smoke out the window, while my parents were downstairs thinking I was doing my homework. One time, my mother staged a sneak attack. She crashed through the door as I was flinging a cigarette out the window. Howard. I smell smoke in here. What? I don't smell anything. No. I see smoke. I see clouds of smoke in this room, she insisted. I don't see any clouds of smoke, I lied through my teeth, there's no smoke in here. The room was filled with smoke. My mother stormed out. I was victorious. She never brought it up again and to this day she denies that I ever did drugs. Being in the middle of this dysfunctional family I was able to come up with a great strategy for coping. Basically. I whined and whined and wore everybody down until I got what I wanted. My sister would always be amazed at my ability to do this. We'd be upstairs and we'd be talking about something that our parents wouldn't give us and I'd turn to her and say, watch me. I'm going down to tears and I'm getting it. I would march down to tears and ask for whatever it was they didn't want me to have and then I'd start whining and I'd wear and wear on them and then I'd start crying and I wouldn't give it up. I'd keep going and going and going and finally they'd cave in. My father always told my mother that I would have been one of the greatest trial lawyers who ever lived, the way I just wear people down. It was like Chinese water torture and great practice for the interviewing technique I use today. My second dysfunctional family. There is nothing bad that I can say about my wife, Alison, except for the stupid little arguments that we have. She'll argue with me about really stupid stuff. I'm always on a diet, so I eat like a total of five things, tuna fish, baked potatoes, fruits, bananas and apples, Paul Newman salad dressing, and oat bran cereal. We are always out of this shit, and I go crazy. How fucking hard is it to keep a few baking potatoes in the house? I know what you're saying, hey, Howard, why the fuck don't you go to your own food shopping? But that's just it. Alison doesn't have to food shop, either. We send out for food. They ship it out to the house. All she has to do is make a phone call and remember that her man likes baked potatoes. Hold it, Alison says, I do remember. But you have to tell me when you're running out of something. 
How fucking difficult is it to take a look in the fridge and see I need an apple? I tell her to order apples, anything, order a crate of oat bran cereal, but no, at least once a week we need to have this fight. And what a great husband I am. I pay the extra $3 a box for cereal just so my wife doesn't have to go food shopping. Also, twice a year one play in a card game with a bunch of guys. I have a few male friends and once in a rare while I need to get out and bond with the guys. My wife says, you're playing cards again? I have to spend Friday night alone? You don't want to be with me? I explain I need to do this once in a while the way Spock needed to mate on Vulcan once every seven years. We begin to yell and scream and the ridiculousness hits me. Here's a woman who spends every day with her clique of girlfriends gabbing it up, playing tennis, and going for lunches, and I can't have a card game twice a year without some shit being thrown my way? I just threaten to go over to Jessica Hahn's house, if she has a house, and that quiets Allison down. But I know how lucky I am to have found a woman like Allison who met me when I was a total loser in college with nothing but some big dreams. She's learned to suffer the bizarre personality that was a byproduct of being raised like a veal in my parents' household. That's why I tolerate her PMS and her yen to friends and her snoring and her lunches at the country club. And that's why I haven't cheated on her for 19 years. But my in-laws. Don't get me wrong, I love my in-laws. First of all, they're cool enough to let me call them Bob and Norma. I don't have to be a phony and call them mom and dad. And they're really nice liberal people. They even smoked pot once with Allison because they wanted to experience what their children were going through. But two minutes with these people is enough to send you to Crudmo Psychiatric Center for observation. Take my father-in-law. Please. He's almost perfect, but I have just a few criticisms. First of all, he talks in a monotone like Hal from 2001. Then he's got these annoying habits like lying on my brand new god knows how many thousand dollar couch with his bare feet that he walked through the grass on. Plus, he reads all these newspapers and leaves them lying all over the white couch. Then, as if that's not enough, he does the crossword puzzles in ink and leaves the pen on the couch. And he loves to watch movies on video. He's in the house less than ten minutes and he's reprogrammed my VCR and my entire video collection is in disarray. He's got the videos out of the boxes, scattered all around the room. Between the tapes and the newspapers, it looks as if a windstorm hit my house. Then he starts going around trying to make home improvements. The next thing I know he's gluing tennis ball halves on the garage back wall so we know how far to back the cars into the garage. But what totally irritates me is the way he leaves the doors in the house open. We have an indoor cat. We found it abandoned and we nursed it back to health. Because we declawed it, we can't let it go outside since there are a lot of raccoons in the neighborhood and they're all rabid. Even my seven-year-old understands that the cat has to stay inside, and we have to make sure all the doors are closed. We have a sliding door, you close it. Simple enough. Every time Bob comes over, he leaves the doors open. He refuses to acknowledge that I have my own way of life. He always says, why don't you let the animal be an animal and go outside? So I explain to him once again, it's an indoor cat. And, of course, he leaves there. My future in-laws were great to me even though I had no radio show. Door open, the cat gets out, and he tries to blame the kids. Once when he did this I had to spend an entire day of my vacation looking for the cat. I went to the neighbors and asked them if they had seen it. They're from another country. They didn't know what was going on, so they called the cops. They thought I looked kind of seedy. Then the cops caught me on my neighbor's property and I had to go through a whole explanation with them. Finally, I called Jackie, one of the writers on my show, and his wife, Nancy, had a good idea. She told me to go outside with a can opener because that's the sound the cat always hears when it's about to be fed. So I took the can opener and plugged it into a 30-foot extension cord and I was spending my vacation walking around outside with the can opener going. I felt like a moron, but it worked. The cat started meowing. We were a family again. My mother-in-law? You can take her, too. I love her a lot but there are one or two things about her that bother me. The minute she gets in the house all she wants to do is monopolize my children, which is fine with me. 
But she reverts to this baby talk not only with my newborn but with my two other kids, who are ten and seven. Then she starts talking to me in this baby talk with her thick Boston accent. My name instantly goes from Daddy to Doddy. Hi, Doddy, she says when I come in the room. Hi, what? I say. Hi, Doddy. Say hi to Doddy. First of all, my name is Daddy, not Doddy. And she acts like I don't know my own kids. Then she's got to examine everything I eat. Now I admit that this is a little more civilized than examining my underpants, but it's still irritating as hell. I don't like people watching me eat. One of the most annoying things in the world that anybody can do is to put his face in my food. Let's see what we're eating today, she'll say. What do you mean we? She actually picks at my salad bowl with a fork, stirring everything around. I go out of my mind. You've got hot with cold, Howard. Hot rice with cold tuna? Norma says, I'm fascinated by the combinations of food that you put in one bowl. Great. What that really means is I am disgusted by what you eat you big, ugly, six foot five dork. And the fact that my daughter fucks you repulses me. Now I feel as if I'm a fucking zoo animal on exhibit. I felt like pushing her head into the damn food, she was so fascinated by it. But the worst thing about my in-laws is the incessant questions they ask me. The second they walk into the room they start asking Howard's turn questions. This is my home. I want to relax. I don't want to think about being Howard's turn. But my in-laws don't let me forget it for a second. It's as if I've got two stuttering Johns there, asking one stupid question after another. I made the mistake of showing them some of the tapes of my television show and that set them off. Howie. My father-in-law calls me Howie. God, how I hate that, when did Kitty Carlyle Hart add the heart to her name? How would I know, Bob? I said. I had her on the show as a guest and maybe I said two words to her off camera. Boom, next question. Just like a press conference. How much is a person like Kitty Carlisle Hart or Arlene Francis or Dr. Ruth paid when they come on your show? I didn't want to talk about my TV and radio career. I would have talked about their life or my kids or tennis or anything else. And quite frankly, who gives a rat's ass when Kitty Carlisle changed her name to Kitty Carlisle Hart? My in-laws are just like my audience when they call up with these stupid questions. But at least I can hang up on my audience. Here, I was a captive. I couldn't leave. So I started making believe I didn't hear them and I made them repeat the questions two or three times, hoping they'd get annoyed. Like Muhammad Ali doing rope dope, I hoped maybe they'd punch themselves out. But it didn't work. When Bob rested, Norma piped in with more questions. How will they promote your radio show when you go into new markets? She asked. I actually started to answer her, but she was already asking the kids what they wanted for breakfast. It was as if she didn't even want to know the answer. How do you get guests for the TV show? She started in again. Booker, I granted. At this point, I was down to one word answers. What do you mean Booker, Bob asked. Booker, we have a Booker. Frank Smiley, I said. And how does he know who to call? Does, say, a Kitty Carlisle Hart call you to be on the show? Bob asked. I was so woozy by this time that I was ready to pass out. But I couldn't even find a couch, because everyone was taken. Bob was on one with his crosswords and pens and dirty newspapers all over the place. And one of Alison's brothers was on the other, watching sports on TV. Alison's brothers aren't as bad as her parents with the questions. But they can eat a person out of house and home in a shorter time than it takes Bob to leave the freaking door open so the cat can escape. I've never seen anything eat so much. Uh-oh, Entertainment Tonight, was coming on TV. My father-in-law was armed with more questions. Howie, Mary Hart, she's very perky. A very up personality. What kind of gal is she? Don't know. I grunted, hoping to put an end to this nonsense. He had fifty more Mary Hart questions, do you think they show her legs on purpose on the show? What else does she do all day aside from entertainment tonight? How the fuck was I supposed to know? I've never met the woman in my life. 
he kept asking nonsense questions that maybe only her mother would know the answers to. My father-in-law assumes I know everyone in show business, and when I don't, he's very disappointed. But I have one surefire way of getting back at all of them, my parents, Alison, her parents, whoever. Whenever I'm with my family and I find myself getting irritated by something, which can usually be measured in nanoseconds, I run into the next room and I write down whatever they said on a little pad I keep there. And the next day, it becomes radio material. I write it in shorthand, too, so they can't understand what I've written if they find it. And after I talk about it on the radio I come home and Alison is all over my case. Can't we have a personal life? Does everything we do have to be grist for your stupid radio show? I don't want you to talk about our personal life on the air, she yells at me. Honey, if you'd let me out of the house once in a while maybe I'd have something to talk about. Maybe I'd experience other things besides your parents. Maybe at a card game I could have some funny things happen. But I'm locked up like a veal. Welcome to hell. Hey, I have an idea. Let me go over to Jessica Hahn's house. Then I'll have something else to talk about, I say. That shuts her up but good. Stern, the next generation. I'm the only male in a household of five. And I love having three daughters. They're great kids and that's all because of Alison. I've told her that the kids are her responsibility. Believe me, it's better that Alison should raise them. If it was up to me, the kids wouldn't know that people have private parts. I teach them that the human body is filthy, and that all men are evil. You can be sure of that. And just wait until they get old enough to date. Do you think there's a man on this planet good enough for my daughters? I look around at the creeps and mutants out there, the men who jerk off to my show in their cars, and the idea that these idiots are going to invade my life and marry my daughters at some point really frightens me. Among the things I'm lacking as a parent are those really good hardship stories to tell my kids. Whenever I complained as a kid to my father, he would lay out his heavy depression era stories. He'd tell me how he didn't have a pot to piss in and couldn't afford a pair of shoes to go to school in. My grandfather would buy two left shoes from a push cart vendor, the only pair of shoes that my father would have for years. My father would also tell me that he didn't have a desk to put his stuff in until he was 35. And my mother. Her mother died when she was nine, so she had to go live on a farm with relatives for a year. She had only one pair of underpants, which she had to wash every night by hand. Now these are good deprivation stories. With my kids, I have no good tales of woe. What can I say about my childhood that was adverse? When daddy was young he had to buy pot from a big, fat, smelly Rush Limbaugh look-alike. Emily, when I was your age, daddy had to break into grandpa's liquor cabinet to steal his apricot brandy so he could get girls drunk enough to fuck them. Daddy couldn't score acid in college without writing home for money. Daddy had to roll his own joints before he went to see the math tutor. I have nothing to tell them. When I was growing up, I had to share a bathroom with my sister. And I had to walk 15 feet down the hall to get to it. Horrors. The only thing I can tell them is that when I was their age we didn't have a housekeeper to clean my room, so they should clean their own rooms. But I love my family. Alison's a great wife and I have three lovely daughters. A lot of people ask me whether I wish I had a son, but I tell them I don't really care. But they say, aren't you concerned that the stern name won't be continued? What, my family tree is so important. What are we, the Rockefellers, the Kennedys, the Munsters? I come from a long line of garbage men, pants pressers, and butchers. What a loss. The stern family crest will have to be taken down. So what? Howard Stern's deformed psychomongoloid baby. Baby without brain survives. Has the IQ of radio talk show host. Real father is black. Stern is pissed. Are you the Stern baby's real father? Baby born without ears or tongue. Stern kid glows in the dark. S. Crew magazine honors the birth of my third child with the front page headline. A new Stern is cause for celebration. My radio crew. Back, left to right, Jackie, the joke man, Martling, Scott the engineer, Howard, Billy West, Fred Norris, Robin Quivers, Gary Delabate. Front, stuttering John Melendez.
Gange, in my back office, keeping the log for my show. Boy Gary, pretending to work. Scott the engineer, on the phone complaining about his hair. Stuttering John, pretending to read. Gorilla, another intern, learning all about radio as he demonstrates microwaving Howard's infamous baked potatoes. Howard, sex symbol, at the console. Jackie, the joke man, killing time between weekends. Fred Norris, king of Mars, with stacks of cartridge tapes for playing sound effects and commercials. Robin, following the top stories, in the world's largest litter box. A fan's eye view. This cartoonist's impression of the show was faxed to me on July 1, 1993. Black and blue like me. Howard in the hood. Remember the book Black Like Me? It was about a reporter who dyed his skin black and traveled throughout the South to experience what it's like to be black. I could have written that book, only I would have called it, Black and Blue Like Me. I grew up the only white man in a black neighborhood in Roosevelt, Long Island, a pawn in my mother's little social experiment in integration. My mother is a wonderful, well-intentioned woman and I love her dearly, but one thing she was always rotten at was picking neighborhoods to live in. When my father started making a decent living with his recording studio, we could have lived almost anywhere on Long Island. But she had to pick Roosevelt, a little one square mile town that anybody with any sense would know was ripe for the realtors to start planting black people in. Overnight, there was an exodus of whites from Roosevelt. The Irish, the Poles, the Jews, the Italians, they all left. But my mother, the martyr, had to stay. It was amazing. One day I go over to a friend's house to play, and the next day I go knock on the door and a big black guy would answer. Hey man, who you looking for? We be in this house now. Every day another one of my friends would be gone. Can you imagine how traumatic that is to a kid? But did my mother care? Damn right she didn't. She had her nice middle class black friends. Meanwhile, I was beginning to get the shit beat out of me every day by the welfare recipients who were moving into my neighborhood. My mother didn't care, she wanted to build my character. Every part of life was about lesson builders, even the carpool. We used to have a carpool every day to get to school. My mother, always a conscientious neighbor, would drive my classmates a few days a week. Except for me. She thought I needed air. Air and exercise. So I had to walk to school. And this was some walk, it wasn't just around the block. Every day I'd be walking to school with a heavy book bag and I would hear a car horn toot and there was my mother driving my friends, waving at me as she cruised by. One day, I was walking to school and a bee stung me in the ankle and my foot began to swell. I was limping like a cripple. All of a sudden, my mother drove by. I saw her and I yelled, Ma, V-O-O-M. She went right by. That afternoon, I hobbled home and complained to her and she told me I didn't need a ride. It was good for me to stagger home. This was what made the fiber of a person. Her and her fiber. Anyway, one day there must have been a typhoon or a blizzard because she gave me a ride to school. I was sitting in the front seat of the car and my three remaining school friends were in the back seat and these guys started making fun of blacks. You know, stupid kid stuff. All of a sudden my mother turned to them and said, Listen, boys, don't make fun of blacks. I'm part black, you know. There was a stone. Hobble along Howie, age seven. Is this woman black? Silence. I was sinking into my seat in the front of the car thinking, I can't believe my mother just told my only friends she's part black. Ma, that's not true, I said. Oh, yes, it most certainly is. Howard, and you shouldn't be ashamed of it either, she insisted. My mother had to pick this forum to make her social statement about racism. The carpool? By the time I hit seventh grade there were only a handful of white kids left in my school. That's when the beatings began to get regular. And lunchtime was the worst. I think I was providing lunch money for half the school. I'd hide my 40 cents of lunch money in my sock, and black guys would come, choke me rip my shoes off my feet, and take my money. One time I was able to sneak onto the line and actually buy lunch, but this guy Ronald came up to me and said, I didn't get your lunch money. Think you tricked me? Then he stuck his big black hand into my salad, 
scooped the whole thing up into his mouth, and swallowed it. It was like Lord of the Flies. The lunch money thing got so bad that none of the white kids could bring money to school. One of my friends started bringing a bag lunch. The only problem was there was this black kid who would grab my friend's bag, and whatever chocolate snacks he had, like chocolate ring dings or devil dogs, the black kid would always steal. So my friend had a great idea. He took x lax, a large chunk, scraped off the word x lax on it, and wrapped it in tin foil. The next day the kid came along and swiped the chocolate. About two periods later we saw this kid running out of his next class. He was shitting his fucking brains out, yeah, revenge, my friend said. There was no way to fight these guys. First of all, they traveled in six packs. They all looked about 25 years old in the ninth grade. I don't even know if I had sprouted my first pubic hair, but these guys, who'd been left back at least 15 times, were almost 19 years old, with full mustaches and goatees. I would go home and say, Ma, we love black people but I don't think it's possible to live with them. They hate us. I'm not blaming them for hating us, but why do I have to be the one white person who lives with blacks? But my pleas fell on deaf ears. My parents were oblivious to my situation. I wish Charles Manson were my mother. At least he protected his family. Half of the kids in my school were in a gang called the Five Percenters, kids from Brooklyn who had moved in. They had dietary laws like Muslims, never read pork, and hated the white man with a vengeance. These guys would choke me and say, you'll never live to see your 15th birthday, dash nice stuff like that. I was dealing with mutants who would take their penises out in class. Seriously. And what penises they were. These guys had rhinoceros penises. They would pull them out in shop and play with them. Remember when Clarence Thomas was being confirmed for the Supreme Court and he gave that speech about the hearings being a high-tech lynching because they were bringing up old stereotypes about the size of black men's penises? What is it with him? That's the one good stereotype blacks have. They get trapped on every stereotype, big lips, talk funny, nappy hair. The stereotype that God gave the black man a big penis is the greatest stereo. My trusted makeup man Ralph working on my transformation. Me as Clarence Thomas with a wild afro. And today. Type in the world. I'd like to walk down the street and have every person in the world think I have a big penis. I tried to assimilate, but it was impossible. I was too tall to hide. I talk black talk but that didn't work. They even started up a black studies program. The only kids who signed up for black studies were the few white kids left in Roosevelt. We all signed up thinking the blacks would like us better. But it didn't matter. We still got the shit beaten out of us. But I loved that black studies class. Today, I could tell you 9,000 uses for the peanut, all invented by George Washington Carver. Aside from my black history education, there were some rewards for being in a school like that. I was one of the brightest kids in the school. I could have been valedictorian of my class. And I'm a dummy. They shipped all the bright black kids to a fancy school in East Meadow, so all the retards were left. In the ninth grade I was mistakenly thrown into a class for kids who came out of Brooklyn and Harlem who didn't know how to read. I got in this class and we were reading a book called Itsy Bitsy. Itsy Bitsy has got to be on a first grade level. I was in ninth grade. The teacher would say, Howard, now you read out loud. You had to read out loud. Itsy Bitsy was a very little boy, and he. I was reading, right? The other kids were like, Itsy Bitsy. All of a sudden, I was like the genius in the class. I had to put up with a lot of shit in this class, because every dredge was in it. Guys would shake you down. They'd go, I like your pants, and they'd start to pull your pants off. They'd take your fucking pants. I'd be out of my mind. The teachers were oblivious, they didn't want to know about it. I asked this class, as you could imagine. But, of course, every good thing is ruined. I was about three months into it and I was the teacher's pet. I was a. At my sixth grade graduation with my sister, left, and mother. Genius. I could do no wrong. I could read Ixie Bitsy backward, forward, whatever. I had the friggin' thing memorized. My mother's good friend Estelle was a substitute teacher at Roosevelt. 
she called my mother up and said, Do you know that your son is in a class reading Itsy Bitsy? So now my mother got hold of me. Are you reading Itsy Bitsy? Yeah. Let me see this book, Itsy Bitsy. I gave her the book. What the hell is this? She started screaming, Itsy Bitsy. You're reading this in the ninth grad? She called up the school. Next thing I knew I was in the hardest English class, a new house of horrors. It had the three white Polish kids who were the only other whites left by then in the school. They were sitting right in front of me. I was kind of feeling as if I was in a white school. The first day in this new class, I was sitting behind these three big Polacks, having a good time reading and everything, and one guy turned around to me, and he said, Hey, Jew. Pow. Smash. Full fist right into my face. Hard as he could. I couldn't believe it. I finally got away from the blacks and the fucking blacks were beating me up. Today you're always reading about kids in the New York City public schools who get caught carrying guns to school. They should have issued me a gun to go to that school. My parents finally realized it was time to move on when Alan, my one black friend, started getting hassled. Alan was a great kid. He would come over to my house and have milk and cookies and we'd play chess. One day, Alan and I were walking home and a bunch of black kids surrounded us. They beat the shit out of Alan for hanging out with a honky. That was the final straw. My parents put the house up for sale. They decided to move to Rockville Center. I'll never forget the day we moved. Everyone was crying. It was a real emotional experience. My mother was crying because our next door neighbor, a really nice old black man, came over and was trying to convince us to stay, that Roosevelt needed white settlers like us. My father was crying because he was giving up a 3% of our mortgage on this house. And I was crying because I was afraid that my mother would listen to that old black fool and stay. It turns out that it wasn't any better in Rockhill Center. I couldn't adjust at all. I was totally lost in a white community. I felt like Darzan when they got him out of Africa and brought him back to England. I didn't know how to act around white people. I don't think I talked to anybody for three years. But I was thrilled to be out of Roosevelt. I promised myself that I would never, ever go back. Just thinking about it gives me the shakes. I remember before I married Alison, she would come to visit me in New York and she'd stay at my parents' home in Rockhill Center. I really want to go to Roosevelt and see where you lived, Alison decided. No, absolutely not. I was insistent, I will not go to Roosevelt again. Why can't we go to Roosevelt? She pleaded. Things could happen. Something could go wrong. Besides, I'm not even sure I know how to get to Roosevelt, I have such a bad sense of direction. She wasn't buying it. Please, she started in with the wine. I want to see how you grew up. I'm marrying you. I'm in love with you. I'll tell you the truth, I said, I don't care where you grew up. Why do you care where I grew up? I finally relented. By now it was dark out. Okay, I'll take you to Roosevelt. We got in the car. I drove a few blocks from my parents' house and made a few turns and then drove around that block about seventeen times. Finally, I pulled up to a house. We were maybe two seconds away from where we started. Roll down the window. I instructed Alison, that's my old house. She had no idea we were still in Rockhill Center. She peered out the window. She got all misty-eyed. That's my neighbor's house. That's my other neighbor's. I'm bullshitting like crazy. This is a beautiful community, Alison said. How does it make you feel to be back here? I don't know. I shrugged. I just feel funny. But I'm glad you got a chance to see it. Roll the window back up. Then I drove around the block about 17 times again and bingo. We were back home in Rockhill Center. To this day, Alison thinks she's been to Roosevelt. My get up for my black men who look while sketch, hair inspired by kid and play. Malcolm ZZZS. Spike Lee reminds me of every lame-o I ever met in Roosevelt. He's a troublemaker who complains and bitches about the white man. He's totally unprofessional. You never see Steven Spielberg use race to raise money for pictures. The white man don't give me an Oscar nomination, he whines. Why should they? 
They gave him 28 million to make that shitty Malcolm X movie and he flew all over Africa and went to the pyramids and went way over budget and then he resorted to a standard in the Lee arsenal. He bitched that the white man be racists for not giving him more money. I feel sorry for those poor jerks at Warner Brothers. He should have kissed their asses for giving him that money. Instead, he had the balls to go to his brothers and sisters in the black community with his little ex cap out. He brought in Bill Cosby, Janet Jackson, Michael Jordan, Prince, Magic Johnson, Oprah Winfrey, and all they ponied in was $70,000 combined. What philanthropy! Warners chipped in 28 mil but they were the white devil. Spike Lee's movies are like amateur productions, worse than Naiu student movies. His movies have ridiculous premises. The scenes are lousy because he's a bad director. The photography is bad. There's a loose, disjointed storyline in most of his movies that makes no sense. Every Jew is a moneylender. Every Italian is a dumb guinea on the corner who owns a pizza store and is out to get the black man. Lee doesn't do anything nice for the Koreans despite the fact that they're the only idiots who would open up a 24-hour deli in a black neighborhood. And the nerve of this schmuck to tell black kids to cut school and black adults to take off from work to go to the opening of that boring film Malcolm X. It's hard to keep black kids in school to begin with, and here he was inciting them to cut classes for his three-hour snooze of fist. I know a lot of black men who called me up and said, Howard, we've skipped work since 1978 to wait for the opening day of Malcolm X. That's been a big problem in the black community, why should we even take a job, when we'd only have to leave it to go see Malcolm X, they told me. I finally rented that film. I got news for you. It put me to sleep. They should have named it, Malcolm ZZZS. I guess that wouldn't fit on the hat. Plus, that little dickhead is a coward, too. After I was talking on the show about how blacks don't go to see his films, he called Robin in the studio. In fact, let Robin tell the story. Robin, what happened was Howard had been talking about Spike Lee on a Friday. He went through his usual litany of offenses, Spike's an amateur filmmaker. His films are worse than college student films, they're not funny, black people don't go to them, the whole thing. I didn't say anything. I've said I like Spike Lee films, but I don't have to defend Spike every time, I just let it go. So, apparently, someone called Spike after that show and told him that Howard said no black people go to see his films. Well, Spike must have thought about this all weekend. Howard, good, I hope I ruined his weekend. Dummy little peanut head. Go ahead, Robin. Robin, when he hit his office Monday morning, the first thing Spike did was call me. Now, I had no relationship with him, but I called him back out of respect. Spike immediately picked up and said, Robin. Yes, I said. I heard that Howard's turn got on the air the other day and said no black people like to see my films, he said. Yes, that's his opinion, I said. Well. That's bullshit, because lots of black people go to see my films. And that's your opinion, I said. And you sit there and let him say anything he wants, he said. Now I was pissed off. I said, excuse me, do you know what I do for a living? No, I've never heard the show, Spike said. Then what the hell are you doing on the phone telling me what I do, I screamed, I've been defending your stupid films for years. I say I like your films. Everybody knows I'm black. I've been promoting your career for years. And yet the first time you call me to say anything is when Howard says he doesn't like your movies? Are you out of your 1000 and first? Spike was speechless now. He didn't say, you're a sister, or anything like that. What he said was, I sure hope they pay you a lot of money. Oh. Am I supposed to quit my job now? I shouted. No. I'm not telling you to quit, Spike said. Just who the fuck do you think you are? You fucking asshole, I was really screaming, cursing him out. And in the middle of this, I was thinking, I'm yelling at one of the premier directors of film in America today. It was hysterical. Thank you for returning my call, Spike said. And that was the end of our conversation. That was a great story except for the part about him being one of the premier directors. He's a knucklehead. How dare he talk to Robin about his problem with me? 
Her job on the show is not to sit and correct me every five seconds and defend the world. He's some black leader. Hey, black people, if you're following Spike Lee, you're in big trouble. Nigger of the 90s. You know what the sweetest fruit of the civil rights movement was? The ultimate prize? We all know what the prize was. Porking white babes. And you know who enjoyed this benefit the most? Superstar black athletes. One of the brothers who has attained the prize is the great basketball player Charles, in the nigger of the 90s, Barkley. Charles is so awesome, he once called us up and told me that he had just shared a hot tub with Donald Trump and some hot babes. I said that after that the water must have looked like egg drop soup. And this was when the Donald was still married to Ivana. I remember the time he called to tell us that he had just gotten married. So you're married now, what fun is that? Why'd you do that? I opened. I got a two and a half year old daughter, Charles said. Gary told me you married a hot white blonde. You got the prize my man. She must go wild when you take your pants down. You're like an Adonis, big shoulders, strong muscles, tight ass, I said. That's from working hard, Howard. One day you'll get a job and have to work hard. Does your wife wear hot outfits when you go out? Mini skirts. She has to dress her role, he said. How tall is she? Five foot eleven. How much does she weigh? One thirty. What cup size, C or D? I was relentless. Probably a C. Jesus Christ, let me see. She was right there in bed with him. This was great, what's she wearing? I asked. Nothing. She sleeps nude. Totally nude. And you can easily palm her breast. Like a basketball? This was too much. Let me talk to her, I begged. He put her on. Hey, honey, how you doing? I purred. Fine, how are you? I'm damn good, I said in my best Barry White. What are you calling her? Honey? Robin butted in. She's naked. Be quiet, Robin, I got back on the phone. You got yourself a good man, don't you? I butted her up. Yeah, thank you. What are you doing naked in that room? You know Charles is a wild animal. He'll jump on top of you. Is Charles an animal in bed? I guess he could be some kind of animal. Like an ant or a fly, something little. Is it true, once you go black you never go back? I think so, she said. Is Charles the best lover you ever had? He's the only one I ever had. This was too much. You ever go to the gym and wear those aerobic tights with thong underpants? Oh, yeah. All the time. Really? Phew. Would you send me your sweaty shorts when you're done working out? I'd love to smell them. Let me tell you something, honey, I bet you if I got you alone, you'd mess around. I'd teach you a few things. I don't know how Charles is but I do things that black guys won't do. I go the extra mile to please women. That's not true with Charles, she said, he's white in that respect. Your parents give you any flack for being married to a black guy? They don't care. He makes three million a year. You're set for life, I said. You're right about that, she agreed. I got Charles back on the line. Your wife will walk right out the door if you don't protect your money. You know these white women, I said. She ain't leaving with no money, Charles said. Damn right. You get her to sign a prenup? No, he said. What? Are you kidding me? How will you stop her? I'll have to call a couple of my boys to rough her up a little, he said. That's the type of prenup you need. It's a prenuptial agreement, I said. She got back on the line. If I do leave him... He says he's gonna dish out the bucks big time, she laughed. Smart woman. You sound like my wife, I said. It was sad to read recently that Charles and his wife were separated. From that conversation they seemed like a great couple. Rodney King. The world's most dangerous millionaire. They didn't beat this idiot enough. He should be beaten every time he reaches for his car keys. Here you got a guy driving drunk going 100 miles per hour leading the cops on a wild goose chase. What if your kid was crossing the freeway then and got hit by him? I say beat him more. And beat your kid, too.
because he's not supposed to cross a freeway. I would have run him over and then backed the squad car up and run him over again. Jerk. The fact that he lived after a high-speed chase like that means he didn't get beat enough. They should have tied his testicles to the bumper and then done 115 miles per hour, see how much he would have liked that. Those L.A. Cops should have done what our New York cops have been doing for years, be real nice to Rodney, gently assist him into the squad car, give him a cup of coffee so he can sober up, take him into the basement of the station house, and beat the living shit out of him. No cameras. No riots. No nothing. Case closed. Justice is served. I love cops. Every time they're on a high-speed chase like that, they're taking their lives in their hands. Who knows what those cretins are packing when they get out of the cars. Cops, you deserve all the donuts you can eat. I just can't figure out why I still get traffic tickets. Actually, Rodney should get down on his knees and kiss the feet of those officers that wailed on him. Have you seen the before and after pictures of this dude? It was the Rodney King makeover. He went in looking like Skid Raucho, and after twenty whacks to the head he came out looking like Billy D. Williams. Nice new do. Stylish pencil thin moustache. He looks like a movie star. They beat all the ugly out of him. Now he's a superstar. He threw out the ball at the first Dodgers home game. Maybe Mikeovitz will represent him for movie of the week deals. He just turned down a two million dollars settlement. This guy is going to be the world's most dangerous millionaire. Can you imagine what happens when he gets his Lamborghini? Ah, uh, Mr. King. Please pull over. You're doing 375 miles per hour in a 55 zone. Please, Mr. King. Sheet, this be fun. What sucker gonna stop me, Rodney King? I got my own video camera now. Sheet, I can drive a damn helicopter through the Lincoln Tunnel, nobody stop me. The L.A. Rats shopping spree. One thing's for certain. Those black folks in South Central L.A. Sure know how to make good TV. I couldn't stop watching the live coverage of the riots after the first Rodney King decision. Didn't you love that on the spot coverage? Where here live is this supermarket is being looted. In the background, guys were carrying garbage pails full of chickens. Orchestrating a wild African jungle scene for the Miss Howard's Turn Show contest. Cheetah is played by stuttering John, far right. Women were running around filling up their carts as if they were on supermarket sweep. Let me see if I can get a word in here with one of the participants. Participants? Looters? Animals? Ah, uh, miss, do you think this has anything to do with the Rodney King decision? This woman looked at him and said, Wah, uh, I'm busy shopping. In the background, a woman was screaming, It's free. It's free. Payback and they were all proud of what they were doing. I remember the good old days of the Watts riots when the rioters covered their heads like mafiosi going into the federal building. Now it was a friggin' photo opportunity. Hi, I'm looting. There was no political agenda behind that rioting. This is what happens when we raise generations of kids who have never been told to do their homework, never been told to wipe their ass, never been told anything by their parents. In fact, it's more than likely that their parents aren't even around. They've got a senile grandparent raising them. Hey, they saw an opportunity and they went for it. And they blamed everybody else, it's the cops. It's the Koreans. It's the... Howard Stern is a cultural mirror of what is good and bad in American media. If Howard Stern didn't exist, white trash would not have a superstar. Dash Reverend Al Sharpton. If you want your radio to burn, Stay tuned to Howard's turn. Dash James Brown. Above, here I am, shooting the shit with the Godfather of Soul, James Brown, and the Reverend Al Sharpton, and, left, using a metal detector on rap star Flavor Flav on the set of my E. Entertainment television show. Government. It's white people. It's 400 years of oppression. Hey, if things are going wrong for you, maybe it's you who's causing the problem. That's a hard concept to come to grips with when you're used to blaming everybody else. Hey man, the summer's coming and there's no jobs. Who's going to hire you? You've got 37 earrings in your ear, you look as if you stepped off the set of a rap video, your hat is on backwards, 
and you've got your girlfriend's initials carved into your hair. Hey, if I walked in like that, no one would hire me, either. And if you want to look like that, start your own business. This is America. Get off your ass. You don't have to answer to the white man. Start your own business right in the black community. Forget about 400 years of oppression. If you wait for the white man to solve your problems, you're finished. You've got to be like those Koreans you're shooting. They bust their ass 24 hours in those delis. The whole family is working seven days a week. But the Koreans don't understand. They're rude to us. If I steal a fruit they yell at me, and they don't even yell in English. Hey, they're rude to you? Don't go in the store. Open your own store. Everyone hated the Jews when they came over and lived in the ghettos. You think the ruling class wasps were so anxious to help the Jews develop businesses in this country? They couldn't care less if every Jew in America starved. They wouldn't let the Jews in their law firms so the Jews created their own law firms. They said, screw you, wasps. You can do it, too. My secret of life. Why doesn't everyone behave? Life is really so simple. Let me tell you the secret of life. You learn it at young. The problem is after I give people the secret of life, they say, Howard, that's not such a big secret. I know how they feel. It's like the end of an Ingmar Bergman movie. He takes you through hell and then at the end, all of a sudden, he says, the secret of life is strawberries and cream. What the hell is he talking about? I just sat through three hours of boredom to find out that life is strawberries and cream? That rat bastard, I'd like to take his Swedish ass and throw it out the window. I went through a chess game with death to find out that life is strawberries and cream. You want the secret of life? Here it is, you wake up in the morning. You eat a little breakfast, maybe read the newspaper. You attempt to go to school if you're that age. If your teacher tells you to sit in the chair, you sit in the chair. If you don't feel like it, you force yourself, anyway. You get older, the routine doesn't change. You eat breakfast, you go to work, you come home. If you're lucky enough, you're married. If you're not, then maybe you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. You yell at your wife, you make up with your wife. If your testicles feel all right, you bang your wife. You watch a video you rented or maybe you go out to the movies. Then you go home to your bedroom, you mellow out a little bit. If you're the late Sam Kinison you take a schnapps. Then maybe you get a snack, have some strawberries and cream, and wash it down with a snap. Then you snore away for eight hours, you wake up, and you do it all over again. You wait for the weekend, that's your party, the weekend. The secret of life is so simple. That's life. If you have kids, you live with the kids. You don't move out on your wife. You stay with her even if you've banged her 9,000 times and you're sick of it. You stay with her anyway. Nobody follows that. They don't realize that's the secret to life. When you've got kids, you raise them. The secret of life, in one clique, if I may sum it up for you, is, enjoy, even if you're not enjoying. Stop looking for a big bang, stop looking for some kind of excitement. And if you can't go along with these rules, you're a misfit. Expect to be beaten by the police. It's like going on a diet. The secret to losing weight is to keep your big fat trap shut. But I got to have butter on my potato or I can't eat it. I'll put you in a concentration camp for one week, and you'll eat a potato without butter. It'll taste like ice cream to you. The secret to life is so simple, I declared on my show, the reason I am announcing this secret is that perhaps one of the maniacs who is stealing a radio right now might accidentally tune to me and say, uh-oh. I'm about to get the secret of life. To him it would be profound. Then Robin complained that my secret to life was too honest. I didn't make it appetizing enough for the listeners. Okay. Let me make it appetizing. If you follow the secret of life as Howard Stern expresses it, guess what will happen to you? You won't be beaten by the police. You won't be in jail. And you won't have to riot. You'll be perfectly happy. That still wasn't good enough for Robin. You got to say life will be sweet and all the rewards of the world will be yours, she said, lie, Howard. I thought about it for a second. You're right, Robin, I should lie. I should tell all the rioters this secret of life. 
I hope they're tuned in. Here's the secret of life, jump into a tub, get yourself wet. Put your finger in an electrical socket. That's the secret of life, you retards. Hollywood in the hood. MTV got me really pissed off during their coverage of the LA. Rats. What the hell was MTV doing covering the rats anyway? They flew in that baldy Montel Williams and imported a bunch of 15-year-old black kids who were sitting there looking angry and pissed off. MTV video jock John Norris got his combat boots on and they got a pretty young white girl host in a short skirt wearing a, no justice, t-shirt. Who got no justice? The girl in the miniskirt? Montel Williams? I was furious at this knee-jerk superficial attempt to my MTV to solve social problems. Then they had Cosby on, making a, statement. Cosby says, let's all pray that everyone, from the top of the government down to the people in the street, that we all have good sense. What the hell was he talking about? Why do the people in the government have to pray? What are they praying for, the idiots in the streets? Nobody wanted to say that those dickfaces in the streets had absolutely no agenda, no reason to do any of what they were doing, and they all should have been mowed down right there and then. Then they got that jerk ass near Hall. It's pretty sad when they have to go to a failed stand-up comedian to calm people down. Arsenio tried to deliver a message but nobody paid any attention to him. I did hear, though, that he was of invaluable assistance to the National Guard because they used the top of his head as a landing strip for pissing everyone off, I played David Duke on my TV show. I pulled off my hood and shared the family photo album. Their supply runs. Listen to this pretentious idiot. I'm a graduate of Kent State. I know that story about the National Guard, man. When they come tonight, it's gonna be insane. I don't want nobody getting killed. Imagine what they'll do to my young black brothers and sisters tonight if they're out in the streets. Please know where your children are because if you don't know where they are tonight, you might have to bury them tomorrow. I'm telling you, they killed white kids in Kent State. They will wear us out tonight. Listen to that fuck face. What is he, a general? He's finer than a Chinese redhead. What a stupid argument, too. At Kent State, kids were tragically killed when they were taking a moral stance in opposing a stupid war. He's comparing the lowlifes come looting and beating innocent truck drivers to non-violent anti-war protesters? Woo-oo. Woo-oo-oo. Woo-oo-oo. What a moron. This politically correct Hollywood crowd should have gotten together to sing the peace song we wrote for L.A. It went to the tune of that old Billy Joel hit, Just the Way You Are. Don't go rioting. Don't go rioting, you African Americans. Don't yank us whites out of our cars. Rodney is guilty, there is no question. The bastard should be behind bars. We need to know that you will all stay calm. And stay as gentle as Sinbad. Ah, give us a break from all this violence. It's so inconvenient when you get mad. What will it take for us to wake you up? We want to have the city calm. Put down the guns and drugs and lose the hate. It isn't friggin' Vietnam. Don't go hitting TV reporters don't break the windows in the stores, MMMM collect your welfare and watch Montel Williams. Instead of starting racial wars. Don't burn your houses, don't smack Koreans. That ain't no way to fix LA. Be calm and gentle, be kind to tourists. Or the cops'll blow you all away. A special message. What we try to do with humor is show the absurdity of the differences between people, as Lenny Bruce did when he used words like nigger and kike and wop in an attempt to demystify them and rob them of any power they may have. Underneath all the differences, we're all in this together. So it's a drag to get a letter like the one I got from a listener of my show who's in prison. I'm in prison, been here a few years. I was in a different prison a few years ago and I was working in the machine shop and we had a locked till gauge. Only one inmate was allowed in there and he was locked inside to pass out the tools. This cage is where the radio was, and the tool clerk and myself were the only white guys in the shop. He'd put on Howard in the morning and the black people would complain. A big argument broke out and some black guys threatened him. After work they jumped him with a steel pipe and he was beaten so bad that he died two days later. He got killed for the Howard's Tem show. Prison murders are rarely publicized and his wasn't, nor was the circumstance.
Just thought I'd share this with you. P.S. You guys helped me laugh through hard jail time. This is a distressing letter. If I can teach people anything, it's if you're surrounded by black guys who hate me, change the frigging station. Let them listen to whatever they want. This stupid show isn't worth dying for. My Sex Life Chapter 4 Short on sex, long on love. That's the story of my sex life. I've been married to the same woman for over 15 years. We've been faithful to each other for over 20 years. So, right off the bat, we're not talking about massive numbers here. Plus, I have to admit, I'm not exactly a sexual dynamo. I'm pretty typical. Dr. Kinsey reported that two minutes was the average duration for a man to achieve orgasm while lovemaking, and that's about how long it takes me. Of course, I'm including the time it takes for Allison and me to walk up the stairs and get to the bedroom. My sexual guru, Grandpa. I might be a better lover if I could only understand what is going on. Casanova Stern I'm not, but it's not my fault. I never had any sex education growing up. My parents wouldn't even say the word sex. I never even heard a peep coming out of their bedroom. When I was 13, my father called me into his bedroom and said, Do you have any questions about sex? I got really embarrassed and turned it red in the face. I looked at him and suddenly said, I know more about sex than you do, and I ran out of the room. I think we were both pretty relieved that we didn't have to go any further in the discussion. My entire sexual education came from my maternal grandfather, who was a fucking wild man. I never knew this growing up, because he was already old and he was presented as the loving grandpa, rather sedate and dignified. My mother, of course, would never say a bad word about her father, and as a result I was very close to him. We looked alike, and I loved this man very much. But my mother's mother died when she was nine and my grandfather raised her like a dog. She only had one pair of underpants. Plus, he had a really nasty temper. He would take my mother and her sister to the movies once a week and would yell and get into knife fights in the middle of the movie. And from Grandpa, via my cousin Jack, I got this worldly sexual advice. I'm gonna give you some advice, my grandfather said, when a woman locks up on you, punch her in the face as hard as you can and she'll unlock. No wonder I was such a misfit. I obviously came from a long line of them. I was sort of a late bloomer, too. I was the last kid on the block to masturbate. One of my friends hinted about it to me, so I decided that I'd try it. I was about eleven when I first tried. My parents had left me alone in the house, so I went up to their bedroom and took off my clothes. I lay down on their bed spread eagled and started playing with myself while watching Gilligan's Island. When Bob Denver came on the show, I played Ginger to his Gilligan. I really had the hots for Ginger and I was waiting for her to appear on the screen, but they kept showing Mrs. Howie, that old bag. Finally, Ginger came on, and I really started pulling my pud. Mind you, I had no idea what happened during masturbation. After a few minutes, I started feeling warm all over and then I felt something building. Oh, man, this is it, I thought to myself. All of a sudden, warm liquid poured out of my penis, all over my legs and my parents' bed. I had urinated all over myself. I tried masturbating again over Anne Francis, who played Honey West on TV. I thought she was the hottest thing. They had adapted a book from the TV series, and there was one scene where Honey West got captured and tied up against her will. I got so excited reading it that I reenacted that scene in my bed with my legs spread and my arms out as if I was honey. I started flailing away at my cock and, before I knew it, I had my first orgasm. Then, I was over at my friend's house and his older brother came home fresh from fingering a girl, he told us. Some fat cow named Susan. We begged him to let us smell his fingers. We snorted that loving scent for a good half hour. Man, were we idiots. But my flaming heterosexuality could not be denied. I sought refuge in that Honey West book. I'd bring it with me into the bathroom and jerk off to the same passage over and over and over again. Aside from seeing my mother naked once when she stepped out of the shower, uck, what a nightmare, I had never seen a naked woman until I was twelve years old. I was walking home from my friend's house in Roosevelt and I passed a corner where I would always find the weirdest things, like used rubbers and cotex, just lying there in the hedges. 
One day I was walking past the bushes and I found an old, soiled, disgusting, ripped up nudist magazine. It was filled with pictures of naked women playing volleyball, naked women taking hikes, naked women cooking with their big fucking hairy crotches, with the fucking hairs running up to their belly buttons. No airbrushing as in Playboy. Real women. Real dis. Gusting women. Playing volleyball with their big, fat, dimpled, cellulite ridden asses hanging out. It was so disgusting. I loved it. I wanted to fuck everybody at the volleyball match. Even the ball. I ran right home with that filthy magazine. But then I had a problem. Where was I going to keep it? I couldn't keep it in my room. Then I had a brilliant idea. I always stole my father's cigars. I used to smoke them down in the basement. Then I'd hide them in my sister's doll case, which was also in the basement. She had stopped playing with her dolls, so I thought it was safe. Thank God my sister never got the urge to play with her dolls again. They really reeked from cigars. I got totally into masturbation. But when you're living in a tiny, cramped house and your parents' bedroom is a foot and a half away, it becomes mission impossible to jerk off without your parents finding out. So when I wanted to jerk off I had to walk into the bathroom, grab a couple of tissues, and hide them in my underwear. Then I'd flush the toilet for effect and nonchalantly walk back to my room. I'd say goodnight but I couldn't close the door because then they'd get suspicious. I'd lie there totally quiet and jerk off like a jackrabbit. I trained myself to come so fast it's no wonder that I couldn't last more than a few seconds when I finally began to make it with real live girls. A few strokes and boom I exploded into one of the tissues, honey. Honey West, I love you, then, my penis would drip, like a leaky faucet, so I would wrap it in another tissue. God forbid I should get semen stains on my underpants with my mother perusing each pair with a microscope. The whole process of jerking off was so complicated. It had to be so well thought out. I used to fantasize having my own apartment so I could jerk off in peace. My nightmare continued because the next trick was to get to the bathroom with that dangerous cargo. I had to flush that squishy low down the toilet without attracting my parents' attention. One time I was on my way to the bathroom holding this cum-soaked tissue in my hand when, all of a sudden, my mother walked by me in the hall. I was cool under pressure. I immediately blew my nose into the soiled tissue. It was disgusting, the semen smearing all over my face, but it worked. My mother never caught me. Then, at this tender age, I had my first homosexual experience. We were never privy to Howard's masturbation. Never saw him do it. Dash Ben's turn. Now, I'm all man, I don't want to mislead you. And I can't stand the thought of a man's ass as a sexual object. Have you ever smelled a man's ass with the hairs and pimples? I'm going to throw up. But one day at my house one of my stupid friends suggested that we masturbate. Each other. I wasn't interested in him seeing my little dick, so I reluctantly agreed to help him out. He pulled his pants down around his ankles. I started to rub his dick up and down when he told me I was doing it all wrong. He took his penis between his two hands and started rubbing his hands together like he was starting a fire. This shit was all too weird for me, so I got the fuck out of the room. And I never again thought about guys. Except for Fabio, my dream man. Ah, those luscious lips. Just kidding, you pricks. I first discovered real live girls when I went to sleep awake camp. I was 13 and I didn't look too bad. I didn't have my big nose yet and I had short hair. I always wore sunglasses to look cool, so my friends called me Shades of Blue. That summer I met my first girlfriend. Her name was Judith and she was a piece of ass. She was much more mature than any of the other 13-year-old girls. She looked like a real woman, huge tits, curvy body, the works. I finally got up enough nerve to ask her out and she actually became my girlfriend. That meant we kissed on the lips maybe once and she wore my ID. Bracelet. Hey, we were going steady. After we came home from camp, I wrote her from time to time. She lived in a place that was alien to me, Far Rockaway. Meanwhile, I was such a moron because Far Rockaway was about a half hour's drive from where I lived. But you have to remember. Living at my parents' house was like living in a prison. It never even dawned on me to ask my father if I could call her. Finally, 
that New Year's Eve, I got up the courage and asked my father if I could make a long-distance call to Far Rockaway. He said okay and I called Judith and invited her to come visit me and she said yes. I was jazzed. Better yet, she was coming over on a day that my parents were going away, which meant I had the whole house to myself with her. The only problem was I had no fucking idea what to do with her. There weren't any porno films back then for me to learn from. Then I remembered a book my parents had sort of hidden with their other books in the living room. They probably thought it was safe to keep it there because they knew I never read any books. It was a sex manual called Your Wedding Night. I opened the book. It had pictures of breasts and vaginas and penises and it showed intercourse. I concentrated on the part about French kissing and petting. So Judith came over and we spent the whole day talking. I was nervous as shit. Finally, I got her up to my bedroom and I leaned over and kissed her and that was it. I didn't even have the balls to put my hands on her tits. But I had my first girlfriend. Until we went back to camp the next summer. When I got there, my good friend Louis Weinstein, who later became a doctor, came up to me and said, What do you have a girlfriend for? Are you crazy? Play the field. Break up with Judith. I had no idea what, playing the field, was, but Lou seemed to know what he was talking about. I was a flaming arsehole. I had the best looking girl in the camp and I broke up with her. He told me all the girls would be lining up for me. Easy for him to say. He always had a remarkable ability to attract women. So, like an imbecile, I listened to Lou and I broke up with Judith. Lou had a great summer. I, on the other hand, was miserable for the rest of the summer. No one would even look at me. Judith, naturally, found new boyfriend in two seconds. In fact, I didn't get another girlfriend until I was 16. Back home, no one would talk to me. I was a real misfit in high school. But, that summer I went to camp all met again. Right away, I met a really cute girl named Nancy. We hit it right off. So one night, she and I sneaked off to the waterfront and started making out. We were buck naked and I was fingering her and I figured, this is it. I'm getting laid. There was no way that I was going to go home from camp and hit 17 and still be a virgin. So we were going at it by the water, and suddenly she said, Let's go in the water and skinny dip. Eighteen years old and a fucking mess. Now I was really confused. I didn't know what I was doing, yet now I had to figure out how to do it in the water. We were standing in the water French kissing and I was trying to decide what to do. So I squatted while she stood. My balls and my ass were in this freezing cold water and she was looking at me as if I was crazy. Was I supposed to lay her down in the water and fuck her? Were we supposed to squat and fuck? Between my nerves and my dropping body temperature, I was shivering violently. Like an epileptic. She was disgusted. So back we went onto the beach, and by now I was freezing even more. I fingered her some more but she was really drying up on me. And my breath stunk because I had nervous stomach. I was this skinny, shaking, smelly thing. It was amazing she didn't throw up on me. Here was my big opportunity to lose my virginity but I was also really paranoid that I would get her pregnant, because I certainly didn't have any rubbers. I was also nervous that we'd get caught and get thrown out of camp, so we got dressed really quickly. I threw my pants on and stuffed my underwear in my back pocket. I went to see my friends, who were hanging out in the main lodge, and they saw the underwear sticking out of my pocket and they went wild. Way to go, they screamed. They figured I got laid. I didn't have the heart to tell them I didn't. But the next day I told Lou. We decided to drive into Monticello to get rubbers. Lou was, by far, the more sophisticated of the two of us. He had a full beard when he was 13, and he was really self-confident, so we decided that he'd do the talking to the pharmacist. We went into the drugstore and I was nervous as hell. Lou was like a pro. Could I have some lubricated Trojans, please? Do you have the ribbed ones? He had this down cold. Meanwhile, I was standing next to him, screaming, me, too. Me, too, like a demented little child. Lou was poking me in the ribs to shut me up. The druggist gave us each a three-pack and we were set. The next night, Lou grabbed a girl, and bang, he used one of his rubbers right off the bat. Meanwhile, 
I was with Nancy, but after that fiasco, she wouldn't fuck me. She realized I was a virgin. That three-pack stayed unopened the whole summer. After camp I called her and pleaded with her to come over to my house. She came over one weekend when my parents were gone and as soon as she was in the door, I was begging her to have sex. No. I gave her alcohol. No. I broke out my pitifully small stash of pot. No. But I really love you, Nancy. No. She was coming up with every excuse in the book, but I wasn't buying it. I've got my period. I don't give a shit, let's fuck. No. Finally, after three hours of begging, I wore her down. We went upstairs and she got naked and she looked great. We started to fuck and I lasted all of three seconds. But I wasn't a virgin anymore. I was elated. Let me get some wine. Let's make a toast. I was carrying on like a maniac. Meanwhile, she found some blood on the sheets and she was disgusted by the whole thing. A couple of months later, I was at a party. I was no longer a virgin but I might as well have been for all I did with Nancy. I met a girl there named Janice. This girl was drop dead gorgeous. A true blonde, with huge tits. She even had an older boyfriend who was away at college. Normally, I'd have no chance with a girl like that who knew me from school because I was such a geek in high school. But Janice went to a different high school, so she was looking at me and all she saw was some guy with long hair. I offered to turn her on, again breaking into my pitiful nickel bag stash, and she must have figured I was a major pot dealer. To her, I was a happening druggie. I had a license. I was driving my dad's Mercury Montego. I was cool. She fell head over heels for me. She was propositioning me all night. I didn't know what to do, so I got her number and said, I'll call you. Finally, I called her. I took her back to my house because at this point, my mother was working, mom got a job as an inhalation therapist at Mercy Hospital, and her day consisted of extracting globs of disgusting looking mucus out of diseased lungs. This was the perfect opportunity to score. I called upon all my seduction skills. First, I broke out the pot, but I made her go out to the garage too. The Toastmaster General at my sister's wedding, during my senior year in high school. Smoke it, so my parents wouldn't smell it later. That really must have made her feel as if she was with a grown man. Janice, do you mind going out to the garage to smoke this pot? How dub an air? How long island? Then I broke into my father's liquor cabinet to make her an apricot sour. While she was drinking alone, I immediately had to run into the kitchen to wash out the blender so my mother wouldn't see a dirty blender and put two and two together. This had to be a dream date for her. Sitting alone on my parents' stupid couch while her hot man was in the kitchen tidying up. How romantic. How seductive. How fucking lame can you get? Finally. I took her upstairs to my room, where I was going to put the final touches on the seduction by playing some music on my little stereo. So what does the ultimate Casanova choose for lovemaking music? Neil Young's, Down by the River, I Shot My Baby. This had to be the most depressing music on the planet. Even I was ready to slit my wrists. While this music was on she started getting all weepy about her boyfriend in Albany, but I just kept plowing on. I didn't want to hear about her stupid fucking boyfriend. I started to try to take her shirt off. No, don't take off my shirt, she said, my boyfriend always keeps my shirt on when we have sex. I started thinking that maybe she was missing a breast. I asked her if I could feel her up under her shirt, oh, sure, she said, just don't take off my shirt. I started to pull her hip huggers off and she was wearing tiny little panties. I slowly pulled her panties down and saw the most magnificent thatch of billy goat light blonde hair. Oh, man. I started fingering her and she was hot and wet and turned on. She pulled down my pants. And she grabbed my cock as if she was uprooting a carrot in the garden. She was saying, oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's it. Come in already, do it to me. I had done this once before, for about three seconds, so I was fumbling with the rubber. When I got it on I said, guide me in. What? She moaned. Guide me in. What do you mean? Put me in you. 
I sure as shit wasn't having any luck getting in there by myself. You never did this before? Comma she started screaming at me. So we started arguing back and forth. I did, I swear I did. I just prefer women to guide me in, I was screaming. So she took my cock, she was totally disgusted with me by now, and she started to put me in her. The second I felt her wetness, boom, I shot my load. She had no idea that I was done. I wasn't even all the way in yet. Meanwhile, she was crying hysterically. What's wrong? I asked. I can't take this, she sobbed, I'm not doing this because you don't know what you're doing. Perfect, I said, cause I don't want to do this either. Meanwhile, if I hadn't finished, I wouldn't have given up so easily. I have to call my boyfriend in Albany, she suddenly decided. What? I screamed like a maniac, my father'll kill me. You can't call Albany from my house. You're a mental patient. Forget it. She was still hysterical, so I drove her home. You're not going to call me again? Absolutely not, I said. I was a real moron. I should have called her again and kept banging her. So what if she was a mental patient? I didn't get laid again until that summer when I went to camp to work in the kitchen. For some unfathomable reason, I was really in demand that summer. I began banging several different girls on a regular basis. But I didn't know how to handle it. I was so emotionally stunted. If I had been a smart guy, I would have made friends with the girls and been able to fuck them all simultaneously. As it was, I was like a black widow spider, I'd devour each girl after I fucked her. I wasn't in love with any of them and I didn't particularly want to hang out with them, so I wouldn't speak to them again after I nailed them. I was really mature. But I was on a roll. I was sharing a tent with a guy named Danny, and one time he came into the tent while I was about to fuck a girl, and he wouldn't leave. But that didn't stop me. While he was talking I slipped my penis inside of her. It was actually kind of exciting. And of course I came in like two seconds. It was too fucking exciting for an asshole like me. One of the girls I fucked that summer was named Patty. She was a counselor and we were flirting with each other, so one night she came to my tent. I was lying there sleeping and she came in with her flashlight and she kissed me awake. She was unbelievably sensuous. We went back to her cabin and she was great. We ripped off our clothes, I got on top of her, and I blew my load in three seconds. I was so sexually immature. Patty tried to widen my horizons but I was such a loser. I had no idea how to enjoy sex. One time we were about to fuck and just as I was about to enter her she tried to stick her finger up my ass. I pulled my cheeks together like rocks, I thought that was so wrong. I was so flipped out that I stopped talking to her. But I had my eyes on a friend of hers, Leslie. Leslie was a latecomer to camp. She was filling in the last two weeks for a counselor who left early. She was a cookie actress type but she had an unbelievable body, great tits, brown hair, sensuous mouth. I fell head over heels in lust with her. I kept trying to get her to go out with me, but she refused. She told me that I was a jerk because I dumped her friend Patty. But I worked on her and worked on her and finally I overcame her loyalty for her friend and she caved in. I was in heaven. It was great sex. Uninhibited, wild animal sex. She blew me like crazy, I'd eat her for hours at a time. We did 69 all over the place. I wanted to propose to her right then and there, even though I was 18 and she was an aspiring actress, very affected. So when camp was over, I kept in touch with her. She lived in Princeton in a kind of communal arrangement with a children's theater group. A few weeks after camp, we got together at a camp reunion and it was magic all over again. We were making out like dogs on the steps, out in front of the whole camp, we didn't care. When the reunion was over, we took a bus together back to Princeton. When we got to her house, we were fucking five times a night. She jerked me off in the bathtub. I would take her back to her room and eat her out for an hour. I would do anything to please her. I was head over heels in love with her. It was unbelievable. 1. Morning when she got up, she was nude and she grabbed my hand and said, come with me. I stumbled out of bed and I got my underwear on because I was totally self-conscious about anyone else in that house seeing my little mushroom. 
She led me down the hall and then she opened a door and we were in the bedroom of two gay guys who were in the acting troupe with her. Leslie hopped into bed with them and she started to get physical and then she turned to me and said, climb into bed with us. I was so provincial that if she had been in that bed with two other girls and she had made the same offer, I would still have panicked. But there was no way in the world that I was going to get into bed with two other guys. I ran out of the room, called her out into the hall, and started yelling at her. But a few days later, I had a much better opportunity with Leslie and I really blew it. Patty came over to visit us and she brought her new boyfriend. Right off the bat, Patty's stock dropped in my eyes because here she was with this little douchey guy. We were all sitting in the living room and Leslie and I started making out. So Patty and her boyfriend started making out, too. Then Leslie started taking her clothes off and it dawned on me that we could have a group scene going down here. But I was so embarrassed to show my cock in public that I grabbed Leslie and took her upstairs. I blew what would be my one opportunity in life to do something kinky. That fall I started college at Boston University. Anytime Leslie called me, I run right down to Princeton. But then one night I got a disturbing call from her. I'm breaking up with you, she said. What? Why? I was stunned. I met this guy, she said. He's a redhead and I like him a lot. He's got a really big penis. I was freaking out. Now my penis was really an issue. She didn't say I had a small penis. But she was leaving me for a guy with a really big penis. Why was she saying this to me? Was I really that small? I was devastated. Once again, I was a failure with women. So there I was, a freshman at Boston University and horny as hell. Be you was supposed to be a big party school, but I couldn't get arrested. Every girl on campus was ignoring me big time. One day I was sitting in the cafeteria with Lou, yes, the same Lou who was my friend at summer camp ended up being my roommate in college, and my other friend Elliot and some other guys and an incredible looking girl walked in. She was like a goddess. She was built like a supermodel, long, long legs, perfectly flat stomach. She was about 5'9 and she was wearing a miniskirt, cut-off shirt, no bra, and platform shoes. And she was with an incredibly ugly girlfriend of hers. Beauty and the Beast. They sat down and this gorgeous woman started looking over at us. I had such a horrendous self-image by this time that I agreed when Lou said, Look at her, she's checking me out. Fuck you, she's checking me out, Elliot said. Of course. The furthest thing from my mind was that she was checking me out. That night I went to a party at our huge storm, called the zoo. There were literally thousands of students there. Back then, I used to chain smoke, so I took out a cigarette, got ready to light it, and this goddess walked by me and said hello and kept walking. Oh, man. I figured she wanted it. Why else would she say hello to a jerk like me? So I walked over to her and she was with Quasimodo again and I asked her for a light. Great opening line, huh? You girls looking for a party? I asked, after a few drags. As if I, with no life, would ever have known where a party was. Sure, we love to party, the goddess said. So we went upstairs. Finally, I had a social life. I had two girls with me, even if one looked like a troll. We were going from floor to floor, no parties. When we got to my floor I said, I have some outrageous bot. You want to get high? They said sure. So we went into my room and I sat on my bed and the two girls sat opposite me on my roommate's bed. Once again, I broke into my pitiful stash, my father was sending me only a hundred bucks a month for spending money, so I was always low on funds to resupply my stash. There was less than a nickel bag of pot in there and two queer lutes. I took out a small hash pipe and we started smoking grass. That is, they started smoking grass. I was faking smoking it because grass made me totally paranoid and I wanted to be on top of things if I was going to put any moves on this babe. After a few rounds of hits, I looked at the pretty one and said, Come, sit next to me. Now she was sitting next to me on the bed, but Quasimodo was staring at us from her perch. I was doing a fake inhale on the harsh pipe every time it came around to me, but these girls were getting whacked. Then I grabbed Beauty's hand and held it. Meanwhile, 
Her blimp friend didn't get the hint, she was still sitting there staring into space. I started making out with the gorgeous one and still her friend wouldn't leave. By now, I figured she was getting paid to be a chaperone. Finally, we dumped the friend and went back to Beauty's room. We lay down on the bed, but she wouldn't take her clothes off. She just wanted to make out. We were making out for a while and then she suggested that I sleep with her that night. But she meant it literally, just sleep with her. I was so intent on having sex with this beautiful woman that I would do anything by this point. Two seconds later, she was out like a light and I was lying there the whole night, nursing a hard-on and blue balls. The next day I was talking to some of my friends and I found out more about her. Her name was Beth and I knew at least three guys she'd already slept with. Now I really felt great. So that night, I went back to see her, I don't understand, I said to her, right off. Apparently we lived together for a few weeks. My diary said he was sweet, shy, sensitive, one of the nicest guys I've known. Dash Beth, former girlfriend the bat, don't you fuck other guys? Why don't you want to have sex with me? Some diplomat, huh? Why don't you try me? Beth said, tonight, I'm ready. So we went to fuck and she pulled her knees up behind her ears and she was wide open. I went in there and, boom. I lasted one second. But at least I got laid and Beth seemed to be really into me. The problem was she was pretty mindless. We had nothing in common. I had nothing to say to her. But she was gorgeous. So I fucked her again. The next day I was talking to my friends again and I told them I scored. One guy said, Did you notice when you fucked her? Wasn't there some white shit on your dick? He got me totally paranoid for a few minutes. But then I realized he was just jealous because he wanted to fuck her again. Beth and I had intense sex for about a week. I mean this girl was totally into me. One time she was giving me a blowjob and I was about to come so I pulled her head away from my cock and I shot all over her hair. She gave me this dirty look as if to say, what the fuck? Are you doing? I had no idea she was so into me that she wanted to swallow my cum. I was such a moron. But after a week of this I was going crazy. She was so boring. I couldn't tolerate being around her anymore, so I dumped her. I realized, then, that I was totally insane. I had nothing else going and nobody would even look at me. I got laid maybe twice more the whole year. Once was with a mutant who made Beth's troll friend look like Cindy Crawford and the other time was with an Armenian chick who wouldn't take her shirt off when we did it. And I soon found out why. While we were making out, I put my hand on her back and her back started to move. She had such a bad acne condition that my hand was literally sinking into a zit swamp. So I decided I was playing it wrong. I was a long-haired freak, which put me in the minority because Boston University was filled with Japs and beautiful people. The beautiful people all went to a nearby disco called Zelda's, where everyone but a leper could get laid. So Lou and I decided we'd do a makeover and go to Zelda's. I cut my hair, got a, beautiful people, quaff, and went to the beach to get a tan. Then I bought a Hakapu shirt, the silky kind that you open at the collar to display your gold chains, and black velvet pants. I looked just like an Israeli pimp. That night we went to Zelda's. You have to realize that I was a total social misfit. Not only was I totally inept with women. I didn't even have a sense of direction of how to get home from Zelda's, so I was following Lou around like a baby duck. We stayed there for a while but it wasn't happening. I couldn't even strike up a conversation with a girl. I was the one guy who couldn't get laid at Zelda's. Then Lou got a brilliant idea. Nearby was an all-girls college. So, trying to fit in. With my new quaff, I was ready for action. Lou and I and our friend Rich decided to drive over there. Rich, it seemed, knew some girls there, so we were able to get past security and get on campus. We walked into this huge dorm and there was this big open room and there were a million girls sitting around in pajamas, watching TV. So we sat down among all these girls. Rich knew some of them, so right away he disappeared into a room. So it was Lou and I now. We were sitting there and a tall blonde walked in. She had blue eyes and huge tits and she took one look at Lou and he disappeared with her. Now I was in my worst nightmare. I was sitting there alone with these girls watching TV. An hour passed, no one talked to me. 
Two hours. Three hours. Five fucking hours later, not one girl had talked to me. Lou came down all disheveled. He had had a wild time. Then Rich came down. He'd scored. Meanwhile, they were both looking at me as if I was Mr. Loser. Sophomore year was no beater. I think I fucked one girl. So now I was a junior and I was studying hard. My father was paying good bucks for me to go here so I figured I had to apply myself. But I was still looking for a real girlfriend. I was a year and a half away from graduating college and I had never had a normal relationship with a girl. My sexual history was a nightmare. When a woman dug me she was either a psychopath or a misfit or her back moved by itself. So you could imagine that meeting a beautiful, normal girl like Allison was the most incredible highlight of my miserable life. I met her through my friend Lees, who transferred to Boston University from Ohio Wesleyan University. I knew Lees from camp and from Rokel Center. But I never even went to visit her because, frankly, I wasn't interested in women as friends. So my meeting with Allison was totally accidental. Lou and Elliot and I were on our way to a party and it started to rain. We were still masquerading as, beautiful people, then and we were dressed in those ridiculous clothes. We were getting soaked and I was worrying about my coif being messed up when Lou remembered that Lee's lived right near where we were. I decided I needed a blow dryer to dry my hair, so we went to see Lee's. On my way to the bathroom, I walked by the kitchen and I saw Allison talking to another girl. I looked in and I thought Allison looked great. She was just my type, real cute, great thin body. Of course, I figured I'd never be able to get her because it was only freaky fucked up bitches who were into me, but I stuck my head in anyway. And said hello. She totally blew me off and went back to talking to her friend. I really wanted her to like me. Alison, when I first met her. I blew my hair dry and went back to the living room, where we were all hanging out. Lou and I started goofing on Alison's friend. We were asking her questions and then making fun of her answers. I was vicious and funny. I was doing a great radio performance, only I was Howard Stern without a show. I was doing this whole bit to show off my rapier wit for Alison's benefit but she was sitting there and she wouldn't open her mouth. Later I found out that she was afraid to say anything because we were doing such a number on her friend that she thought we'd do the same to her. After a while, we left to go to the party and I told Lou that I really liked Alison but I didn't think she was into me. Lou, like a good friend, agreed with me. A couple of days later I ran into Allison at the student union and she was really friendly, she actually talked to me. I still figured she wasn't really into me but this chance encounter gave me courage. So I came up with an elaborate scam. I had to do a junior film project for one of my courses. I decided to do an 8mm documentary on transcendental meditation. I had to cast the film, so naturally, I would call Allison and ask her to star in it. This had to work. Everyone wants to be in a movie, right? I called Alison and I said, you've got a perfect face. You're my dream girl. You have to star in this movie I'm doing. I was babbling like a maniac to a girl I hardly knew. She said she was too busy to do it. I couldn't believe I was being rejected again, so I started begging her. She went into a long rap about a youth group she was working with as part of her social work program. She had to take some kids to a funeral, fuck the funeral, this is a chance to star in a film that might get shown on a large screen in the student theater. I was cajoling her. I couldn't believe there was someone on the planet who didn't want to be in a film. Finally, to shut me up, she said that if I was really desperate and I couldn't get anybody else, she'd do it. So I hung up, and two seconds later I called Alison back, I can't find anybody to do it. You've got to do it, I begged her. Your face is the right face for this movie, so she said she'd do it. We went out in the middle of the winter and I had her meditating on a rock and running around in a long, flowing dress, barefoot. Meanwhile, she was freezing to death but I was like a young scavolo. I was telling her she was beautiful. The oldest trick in the world, but it was working. I was so punch drunk from getting knocked around by women that I couldn't imagine someone this dynamite would be into me. But I was turning on all the charm and she seemed to enjoy my company. The professors voted my film the best film of the year. I saw myself as the next Ingmar Bergman. Alison was definitely the girl for me, I told her.
and we decided to go on a real date. Alison's roommate Lise decided to dress Alison for this date, and she put together a nightmare outfit. Alison showed up wearing baggy green corduroy pants, tan work boots, a brown sweater, a tan overcoat, and white gloves. But who cared? I wasn't going to let clothes ruin the night. She had her own car, so I figured she was rich. We went to dinner and then we went to see a movie, Lenny, the story of Lenny Bruce, starring Dustin Hoffman, which was a pretty good indication of our life to come. After the movie, I took her back to my place and I broke out the special wine stash, a $5 bottle of Blue Nun. I was living in a room the size of a closet, and I had a queen-size bed that took up almost the whole room. My room was set at home in my bachelor lair in Boston. The bed Alison and I partied on during our first date. Up for seduction. We were forced to sit on the bed. We watched TV and sipped the wine and I made my move. We started making out. This was great. I couldn't believe she was into me. We got all the way to third base. I got four fingers buried in her, so I figured this was it and I withdrew my fingers and went to get the rubbers. No, I never have sex on the first date, she said. That's absurd, I said, tell you what. I'll drive you home and pick you up two minutes later so it'll be our second date. I had to have sex with her and close the deal, but she wouldn't bite. So she went home and I thought she was a little disappointed because she didn't want to piss me off. We both knew this was going to be a deep relationship. Sure enough, second date, we did it. I had my first normal girlfriend. I couldn't believe I was in a real boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. I was so into this that even when a gorgeous girl named Andrea invited me to a party, I didn't go because I didn't want to blow it with Alison. We had been going out a month or so when Alison decided to bring me home to her parents. We drove to Newton, Massachusetts, and we pulled up to a huge house. I hit the jackpot. I had a great girl, she dug me, and her father was rich to boot. Alison told me that her father owned the Pullman Vacuum Cleaner Company. Her father even had a meeting with President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Incredible. So we went inside and I couldn't believe how nice these people were to me. I had such a shitty self-image that I would have thrown myself out and puked if I were a parent whose daughter brought me home. But they were really nice to me, and her mother cooked a huge roast beef dinner and we sat down to the table to eat. My father-in-law, Bob, with LBJ. I figured I'd hit the jackpot. At the table, Alison's younger brother Louis started getting into an argument with her father. In the course of the fight, he called his father an arsehole. Now I was prepared for the worst. I was there, shut. Up, sit down, you moron, son. If I even called my father a schmo, he'd run after me and beat the shit out of me. But Alison's father, Bob, calmly turned to Louis and said, did you call me an asshole? Remember one thing. If I'm an asshole, then you're son of asshole. And they all cracked up. I couldn't believe the looseness of this household. What a difference from my prison camp upbringing. After dinner Bob and I went into the den and I felt he was checking me out. Then he started talking to me about a book about cancer that he was reading and he seemed really depressed. I thought he had cancer but I found out that he was depressed because he had sold his company to a big corporation and his two-year contract was expiring and they weren't going to renew it. So all of a sudden, they were leaving the house and the moving to Florida and Allison's car was being repoed because it was a company car. And, of course, I thought, there go my rich in-laws. But I didn't care. I was totally into Allison. Within a week after our relationship began, I knew I was going to marry her. We had long discussions sitting in front of the library, where we would see a lot of old couples, we're gonna be like those old people, growing old together, we would tell each other. And it was true. Every time I reject another penthouse pet, that vision gets sharper and truer. It's funny, but all the time that I've been with Alice and we've never done it more than once a night. When we first started seeing each other, we'd have sex every night. The next few years, we'd average three to four times a week. After we got married and started having kids, it went down to twice a week. Now, after 15 years of marriage, I'm lucky if I get laid twice a year. College graduates. I learned a lot but not about facial hair.
but it's not just Alison's fault, I have to admit. Part of the time she was pregnant and I'm just not into having sex with a mum, okay? I find nothing attractive about the pregnant form. I'm like Elvis. If a girl got pregnant, he couldn't go near her. There's something weird about a woman's belly moving during sex. Then, after she gives birth, you've got to give it plenty of time to get back to normal. Don't volcanoes take hundreds of years to cool down? I mean, it's not even a vagina at that point, it's more like a garage door. We tried to do it once right after Alison had given birth to one of our daughters, but it was a disaster. We started to make love and I tried to touch her engorged breasts, but she wigged out. Don't go near those, they hurt, she screamed, why don't you touch my arm instead? Yeah, right. But I was getting aroused anyway and she got on top of me and she said, I'm going to take my nursing bra off. I wanted to see her breasts because they turned me on. So she took off the nursing bra and she started spraying milk. Oh, I'm spraying all over you, Alison said. I don't care, let it spray, I yelled. Two seconds later, I was soaked. You know what? I said, I do care. So she had to climb off me and get the big slingshot bra, and by the time she got that on, I had lost interest. Then she was hurt that I'd lost interest. It was a nightmare. Alison and I have done only a few kinky things. One time I said, let's take a shower together, I'd really like to shave you. And she was bitching, no, I don't want to. It gets all itchy and I get razor bumps and I'm uncomfortable. But then she said, only if I shave you. And I said, fine. Anything. As long as you touch me. I started shaving her. She started shaving me. Within a few seconds we were totally bored. She hated it. I hated it. We ended up just shaving ourselves. It was a nightmare. Alison's favorite position is the missionary position. She'll never get up on all fours because she claims she has Chandra Malaysia of the knee, some kind of rare problem that makes her joints swell and ache. Meanwhile, she's out every day with her Yenta friends playing tennis, bouncing around like a circus clown on her allegedly weak knees. It doesn't take a Sherlock Holmes to figure out that she's horseshitting me. And we're definitely into only one entrance, too. Occasionally, Alison will favor me with some oral sex, but in all the time we've been together, she's never swallowed my male issue. She was a trooper and tried to on our 10-year anniversary but she almost gagged. It was the most unattractive thing. She was retching for five minutes. Still, I don't blame her. I can't understand girls who swallow semen, anyway. I feel bad for them. I could never swallow it. And forget about ever seeing her third input. It's funny because, when we first got married, I never even thought about anal sex. Who knew you could even do it there? But with the advent of porno tapes, I started thinking about a little ass play and I went back in my mind to Patty and how exciting it was back there in that tent when she tried a digital insertion, even if I was too uptight to realize it at the time. So one night I approached Alison. We were in the middle of sex and I asked her if I could do the deed in her butt. I don't think I want that, not tonight, she said, some other time, I promise. Every night I asked and I kept getting the same answer. Finally, after a couple of years, I asked her if she had ever done that there. I don't remember, she said. What do you mean, you don't remember? I exploded, I remember every time my mother stuck a goddamn thermometer up my ass. Really? I don't remember. How can you not remember getting fucked in the ass? I don't know, I think someone tried once, she finally admitted. What I figure is someone did fuck her in the ass and it was a disaster. All I know is that there's no drug or liquor strong enough on the planet Earth to get her to do that. I even tried to ease her into it by sticking a finger or two up there but she freaked out and said she was uncomfortable. Finally, I asked her if she would do that to me. I even went on my TV show and during a takeoff on, the newlywed game, that we called the Stern Lions game, I said that the one thing I'd like to do sexually that my wife won't do is her fingers up the butt. Still nothing. So far. She's gotten as far as spreading my cheeks apart. It got so bad that I tried to do it myself one night when I was in the shower. I lathered up my butt and put my finger up there, but I didn't get turned on. 
We even tried bondage to add a little spice to our sex life, but that was a disaster, too. One night I tied Alison's ankles and wrists with my neckties. She was afraid that the kids would come up and disturb us. Alison wasn't a good subject for bondage. This is uncomfortable, she started whining, my circulation's getting cut off. And that voice you put on when you tied me up was weird. How could she not like it? That was my love voice. It sounds like a cross between Dracula and Barry White. I tried to spank her, but that was even worse. Get out of here, she screamed. I felt so stupid, I had to untie her. She was pissed off that I was doing stuff to her that she didn't want me to do. I had to explain to her that the whole point of tying someone up was so that you could do stuff that you don't normally do. The whole fun of it was being at someone's mercy. She didn't give a shit. We ended up doing the same old things we always did. The greatest aid to salvaging what was left of our sexual life was the vibrator. The vibrator came into our lives a few years ago when Robin gave us one as a gift. And we needed it. When we first met, Alison would get wet instantly. After a few years of sex it took like an hour rubbing Alison's clitoris before she would get hot for me. I just like to fuck. At my age, I don't really have the time for foreplay. Why can't she be instantly wet and ready to go? When we got the power tool, it was like magic. I could just lie there and not do anything to her and she'd have an orgasm instantly. And what a vibrator. You strap it onto your hand. It's called the Swedish Massager. I put it on and I looked like Robo's turn. I'd lie on my side, kiss Alison a few times, touch her with the vibrator, fuck her, and five minutes later I'd be asleep. Perfect. Life was good. But as the years rolled by, I found that the amount of time that I had to use the vibrator to get Alison ready was longer and longer. She must have built up quite a callus down there, because it was taking 20 minutes for her to get wet even with the vibrator. She's so desensitized from using it that I'm going to have to go to the next step. I already told Robin. I want a jackhammer for Christmas next year. But thankfully, I found something that really solves all these sexual problems. Actually, Ra found something. Masturbation came back into my life a few years after Alison and I were married, and right now it's the greatest single source of sexual satisfaction I have. I jerk off at least five times a week. I actually use masturbation as a medicinal tool because I have to get up at five every morning and I've found that the only way to get to sleep early is to whack off. So I've become quite adept. I always use my right hand. I don't need Vaseline or lubrication. I don't use magazines or porno tapes. I just lie in bed and fantasize. I can get myself off in three seconds. I used to have to replay my sexual escapades with my old girlfriends. But now I've got it to the point where I can just fantasize about the latest girl I've had in the studio. I whack off to Jessica Hahn a lot because I know that she's someone who would open every hole. Jessica told me she's only interested in pleasuring a man when she has sex. She even said that she likes to blow a guy and then fall asleep for the entire night with his penis in her mouth, like a pacifier. God, did that story turn me on. I've come full circle, I'm back to hiding my tissues this time from Alison. But the amazing thing about me is that even in my sex dreams I can't cheat on Alison. I sometimes dream about strippers I've had on the show, and when they're ready to have sex with me, I run out of the room. Somehow, Alison works her way into the dream and I feel guilty and I never get to fuck the girl. I can't even have fun in my dreams. That's how sick I am. Speaking of Alison, you know. I really don't know what her take is on our sex life. And she won't tell me. I've been trying to get her to answer the anal sex question for years now. So I asked Larry Ratso Sloman to interview Alison and find out about her sex life. Here's what she told him. Ratso, we've all heard Howard's version of your sex life. What's your side of it? Alison, my sex life is great. Well, let me put it this way. When we do it. My sex life is great. Three times it's more frequent than others but basically we have a very good sex life. Ratso, Howard says that he has a very unusual penis. Flaxid, it's like an acorn, but then it grows to incredible lengths. Alison, his penis size is fine. Ratso, 
Tell me about the time he tried to tie you up and have a little S&M session. Alison, Howard exaggerates. Not all of what he says fits reality. In real life, I don't deal with a sex maniac. People are always saying to me, oh, my God, you're married to Howard Stern, it's not like he has me parading around the room discussing my cup size. Ratso, what about anal sex? Did you or didn't you way back when? Alison, I don't know. I really don't remember. Let's forget it. Ratso, how can you not know if you did it or not? Alison, it's the kind of thing where I think I was attempting it once and I wasn't interested. I've never really done it but then he asked me about it. It's not like I did it with everybody but him. Let's just say I think it was attempted and that was it. Ratso, would you have anal sex with Howard? Alison, I said to him, Howard, if you're really interested, fine with me. Then he says he's not interested. Ratso, what about his masturbation habit? Alison, look, he tells me he doesn't masturbate and he tells the audience he does, so I don't know. People have sat with us at the dinner table and said, I masturbate as much as you, and I'm sitting the dying and Howard's going, yeah, yeah, and I'm going, oh, my God, I do walk in the room after I've kissed him goodnight and he's not masturbating. I don't know when he does it because I've never caught him. Ratso, how can you catch him if he can do if so quick? He says three seconds and he's done. Alison, I've never caught him, but then again, who knows? I don't walk back into the bedroom trying to catch him. I assume he's sleeping. But there's nothing on the sheets either. Ratso, what about the vibrator stories? Alison, no comment. Mein Kampf. MY Struggle, How I Became the King of Radio. Chapter 5 It's weird, but I always wanted to be in radio. That was all I could think about from the time I was five years old. I used to do these shows up in my room and record them on a beautiful Wozniak tape recorder that my father gave me. In fact, by the time I was nine, I had actually begun to create the format that years later would send me to the top of the world of radio. I'd get together with a few of my friends, much as I do now, start the tape rolling, and I'd dial. While dialing, I'd break into dirty little stories about my friends and I'd do monologues. The idea was to make the best phony phone call. One guy would call a Chinese restaurant and ask for itchy balls. The next guy would call the liquor store and ask for white horse in a bottle. Mine were always a little more inventive. Either I was a game show host, usually Jean Ray Byrne, and I would award old ladies thousands of dollars in prizes or I would call drug stores using a female voice and try to make dates. Hello, you got LSD? I asked in my best nine-year-old female impersonator's voice. LSD, yeah, sure we do, the pharmacist said, knowing full well that he was on the phone with an arsehole kid. And a box of Trojans, I added. Oh, sure we do, honey. What size? Size? HMMM. He stumped me because I had no idea what he was talking about. I had never seen a condom. I didn't get it. What does he mean, size? 34, I I lived. I was nine. 34 sounded right. What else you want? You want Prince Albert in a can? Yeah, I said. How big? The pharmacist wondered. A 12-foot stick, I said. What else do you want in your mouth? He said. Will you give me a lay? I asked, I need you. I know you do, he said. I want to meet you in a dark alley, I added. I know you do, he said. I hung up, triumphant. I think the fact that my father exposed me to the world of radio must have had a big subconscious effect on me. Ironically, my father worked as an engineer at Whom, which later became to and then K-Rock, the same station I work at today. He always used to tell me stories about working with this legendary disc jockey Symphony Sid, whom my father described as a man who would become very agitated at times. Sid was this crazy guy who played a lot of jazz and rhythm and blues, and had been busted several times for drugs. His show was a madhouse, not on the air, but off the air. One time, my father told me, he thought Sid was coming off a high and he started to get violent. He went to smash the control room window when they were about to go back on the air. 
So my father jumped up, banged on the glass in his control booth, and screamed, Symphony Sid. By the powers vested in me by the FCC, I command you to get on the microphone in a serious manner and continue the broadcast, it worked. He settled down and did the rest of the show. Sid did all kinds of wild things. He'd have a lobby full of street people and black gospel singers during his show and he'd be running back and forth during his radio program trying to keep order in the studio and in the lobby. He just should have put those people on the air. I always used to love to go to work with my father when I was young. By that time, he was part owner of a recording studio where they used to tape cartoons and commercials. I'd go visit my dad and get to meet Wally Cox, Don Adams, Larry Storch, all the great voices of my favorite cartoon characters. Plus they'd have these great lunches, big cold cut buffets. Man, I was in heaven. Even then, I realized that I wanted to entertain people on the radio. My father would drive into Queens and we'd take the subway from there into the city. The driving part of the commute was horrible. We'd always listen to the radio on the way in, and if anything good came. My dad at his recording studio in the 50s. On, my father would get totally into it. It dawned on me that if you were half a mutant you could probably get on the radio to entertain people and to make them forget about the drudgery of that shitty commute. I never wanted to be on the radio to be a disc jockey. I never wanted to play records. I just wanted to talk. It's funny because nobody was doing wild talk shows on the radio then. If you were on the radio, you were a disc jockey like Cousin Brucey. But I ignored those guys. They sounded so canned and phony. It was weird for me to think I was going to be on the radio someday, because I was so shy growing up. It drove my father nuts that I never took an acting course in high school. I never did summer stock. I was too inhibited. I knew I wouldn't wind up on stage somewhere. I always pictured myself in a dark room, talking into a microphone. But no one else could believe that. My father kept telling me, Howard, you got to talk. You're not gonna be on the radio if you're quiet. You gotta have diarrhea of the mouth. What a way with words. That's turn charm. My high school yearbook photo. I hardly talked at all my whole senior year in high school. I was in a psychology course and the teacher told me she was going to flunk me because I never once opened my mouth the whole term. She warned me that I had better do well on my final or that was it. I had a cousin who'd been under psychiatric care forever. So I sat him down with a microphone and I interviewed him. I asked him one question, so, you've been seeing a lot of psychiatrists? He talked non-stop for two hours. I brought my father the tapes, he transferred them to two discs. The teacher listened to them, flipped out, and said it was a classic. She wanted the records and I got an A. Drama class, same thing. I wouldn't open my mouth. The first day, the teacher said, each of you will get up and sing row, row, row your boat. He called on me first. I nearly shit in my pants. I couldn't do it. I whispered it. He was furious. Yet whenever the people at the counseling center asked me, I would say I wanted to be a disc jockey. Even they said, no way. He doesn't speak. He doesn't have a professional voice. So to make my parents happy, the counselors came up with an occupation I should train for in college. They decided I should be a speech therapist. To be a speech therapist you have to be good at science. I have no fucking ability in science. Meanwhile, I'm flunking all my classes. So they told my parents there was one school that might take me with my moron grades. Elmira was an all-girls school, but they were taking boys for the first time ever. I heard this, I said, unbelievable. Five boys and two thousand girls, or, they told my parents, if he ever wants a shot at radio, he could go to Boston University. They had a retard program called Basic Studies, where you took moron classes for two years, and if you proved yourself you could go into the School of Communications. That sounded pretty good to me. I knew I could apply myself. I wound up studying hard. I had nothing else to do because no woman would come near me. I graduated magna cum laude with a 3.8 average. And I got my start in radio. I didn't get up the courage to go down to the college radio station until my sophomore year. The first time I went over there, they immediately gave me an air shift. 
I tried to cue up the Santana record and I was so nervous my hand was shaking. Finally, I got it playing, I was on the radio, and I was thinking, this is going out to millions of people, dash but probably three people in the dorms were listening. So the record was playing and I reached up for a pencil, knocked all of them over, bumped the rack that the station kept their carts in, and the car track came crashing down onto the turntable, in the middle of the fucking show. It was a disaster. I was a horrible disc jockey. I hated the fact that you had to be organized. I used to have nightmares about the record running out and not being able to change it in time. I did everything at the station. I did news, I did interviews. But I really wanted to do comedy. I wanted to put on a crazy, off-the-wall show. I hooked up with three seniors and we put together a comedy show called The King Schmaltz Bagel Hour. We were totally outrageous especially for 1973. We used to talk about girls' asses, BBs, and blacks. One of the guys did a game show hosted by Father McCann called Name That Sin. The object of the game was to confess a sin that was so bad it would make the bishop blush. If you can make the bishop blush, you win a free trip to the Vatican, the announcer said, if you say the secret sin, you win $100. And now for our first contestant. Father, I had sex with my girlfriend. Nope, he's not blushing. I had sex with my girlfriend's dog. The bishop does that all the time, that won't make him blush, the announcer said. This was outrageous then. We broke all format, we had long bits. Most of the other guys were these way too cool soft voiced progressive sounding disc jockeys, now here's Pink Floyd on a trip to the dark side of the moon. We were crazy. On that first show, we also played a bit called Godzilla Goes to Harlem. That would be the last bit we'd play on college radio. It started out like a typical AM broadcast, playing a grand funk railroad song. Then the broadcast was interrupted. We bring you a special report from New York City. A strange being has been sighted in the East River. It was Godzilla. After the police put out an all-points bulletin, Godzilla was seen again at 125th Street in Harlem. We went on the spot to Harlem. Hey, brothers, look at that big green dude, one of the King Schmaltz brothers said in his best black impression. Hey, what's your name, Turkey? Godzilla, the monster roared. Godzilla? What you Italians doing in this neighborhood? Hey, you're not Italian. I'm the monster Godzilla. Hey, brother, take out your wallet. Hear what I'm saying. Up against the wall. Godzilla roared. You gonna give me trouble, I'll have to fight it out with you, dude. There was screaming and roaring and confusion. Finally, Godzilla moaned. Man, all he had was a dime. What a waste of time. Seconds later, the phone rang in the studio. One of the other guys picked it up. King Schmaltz, what can we do for you? Three guesses, the first two don't count. I immediately recognized the voice. It was Hank Sennett the guy who ran the station. He was home with his family but he had a special line that fed the station right into his house. Is it Mary? One of the other guys said. No. Is it a sturgeon? Someone else guessed. Let me give you a hint, Hank said ominously. I bet it's Hank, I said. You're fired, Hank said. Fired during our first show. Hey, even I was impressed. That was a record I was never able to surpass. But I had the tape of that first show and I had the direction I wanted to go in. I sent a copy of the show to my father and he sent me back a nine-page letter that basically called me a moron. You stupid idiot, this is terrible, he wrote. He was always blunt and to the point with me, what are these sketches? I hear you go, uh, which is annoying. Who takes phone calls on the air? They don't talk like that on real radio stations. If you want to be different, don't go into radio. You don't sound like a real disc jockey. You gotta take this seriously. You gotta announce the record and give the temperature and the time. Here I thought I was doing great innovative stuff and I sat there reading this and thought, geez, maybe my father's right. I'm a fucking arsehole. What am I doing? I was really hurt. I think my whole motivation in life has been to prove to my father that I'm not a douchebag. Meanwhile, 
My parents kept busting my chops for me to get formal training. You want to be a disc jockey, you have to have training. They both repeat like a mantra. But I told them I had it under control. I was totally focused on making it in radio. I used to write letters to Nancy, the first girl I ever dated, and I told her that someday I would be the greatest disc jockey in the world. And lo and behold, as soon as I graduated, I got a job at WNTN, doing daytimes at this progressive Amroke station in Newton. This was an unbelievable coup. No one got this. So I was doing the job and three days later I went in for my paycheck. No pay. I guess the station was having financial difficulties. In fact, the station was being run by some guy who just got out of Boston University and was a really strange guy. One morning he was making a public affairs tape and he accidentally said, or, oh, fuck. He figured that he had erased it but when the show played, the, or, oh, fuck, went out over the air. Big fucking deal, probably three people listened to that show. Nobody called, nobody complained, but this guy went into a panic. Oh, my career's over, he moaned, help me compose a letter to the FCC begging their forgiveness. Why? Maybe nobody heard it, I said. It's better to turn yourself in, this moron said. So he wrote this letter. Dear FCC I have made a terrible error. As you know, I'm a broadcaster, in charge of this station, and I was making a tape. He went into this whole story and he sent the letter and he was shitting in his pants, waiting for the FCC to show up. I can't imagine that anyone in the history of radio had ever reported himself to the FCC except this dude. I didn't last long at that station. I wanted to be in radio, but not for free. But at least I had a tape I could send around. Soon enough, I got called in for an interview at this station in Westchester County, New York. This was great. I wanted to stay in New York because Alison and I were quasi living together at this time and she was getting her master's in social work at Columbia. So this program director wanted to hire me as the evening guy at $96 a week. I freaked out. I got real nervous that I wasn't good enough, and I turned him down. I rationalized it by saying the money was shit. I wanted to get married and all my friends were getting out of school and making 12 grand a year. I turned down my first legitimate job and went to work for Benton and Bowles, an advertising agency. I lied and told them I loved math to get this bullshit, pencil-pushing marketing job. It was terrible. I had to wear a suit every day, and my boss said, Don't worry. I want you to come in on Sunday, but you don't have to wear your tie. I was miserable. And I've got to hand it to my mother. She really helped me here. She said, This job is not for you you're a wreck. I quit without giving notice. I had already applied to their creative department, to run the Avenue Equipment, some entry-level job. The day after I quit I got a call and they hired me in creative. I wasn't there for more than three hours when I got fired again, because their personnel department realized that I was the guy who just quit the other department. Then I went to work for this place in Queens that I had read about in the paper. It was a bar to house and I was going to sell radio time. You go to a company and you trade advertising time on stations. For an equivalent value of what they produce. And they paid me for this. So I went into two Chinese restaurants, and I made two deals. They didn't even know what they were doing, you mean I get radio at? Yeah, yeah. As I was closing the deal, I realized that the guys I was working for were crooked. The IRS was after them, their funds were frozen by the bank and the guy who owned the place would take off his shirt in the middle of the office and spray himself with fucking deodorant. It was crazy. So I went back to the restaurants and said, I think I'm working for crooks. Don't even get involved with them. They said, no, no, how about if we pay cash money for the advertising time? I was a great salesman. I couldn't get rid of them. All of a sudden I realized I had turned down a job in radio, and I could have killed myself. What were the odds that I could get a job in radio again? And here, I really owe all this to Alison. She turned to me and said, Why don't you pick up the phone, call that guy in Westchester, and say that you're really sorry that you turned the job down. Tell him to keep you in mind if anything comes up in the future. I have one of these minds that says you don't call someone back if you turned down a job. That I could do this was a mind-blowing revelation to me.
so I picked up the phone and called the guy. It was right before New Year's and he was working at K2, doing overnights, in addition to being the program director of this dumpy radio station WRNW. Bingo, he had an opening, some fill-in work, middays, 10 to 2. The reason the guy offered it to me was that he couldn't get anybody for New Year's Des, and I would be his fill-in guy. I said okay, nothing permanent, but at least I'd get a shot. He wanted me to work because he had to do this overnight shift at 2 and he didn't want to be woken up the next day. So I went up there and the radio station was in an old house in the middle of a residential area of Briarcliff Manor. One of the bedrooms was the radio station studio, the other was a production studio. I was doing this show and I was fucking nervous and my voice was hoarse and I was croaking WRNW and talking soft like an FM disc jockey. I was no more than 10 minutes into the show, playing a crossbeat, stills and Nash song, when I hit the microphone and there were two little stop slash start buttons. The buttons got jammed. That meant the microphone was permanently on. I couldn't turn it down. When you have the microphone switch depressed. You can't even hear to cue up the record. You're fucked. Now this was a music station. You were just supposed to say, WRNW, and go on to another song. So as I was saying, WRNW, I was trying to think fast. I took the record, and I got the needle on the outside of the record, and I was playing the first track and panicking. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to wake this guy up, he was going to fire me. Finally, I called him up at his house. He had obviously just gotten to sleep after doing his shift, and he said, What the fuck are you doing? Why are you calling me? Call the engineer, I told him I didn't even know how to call the engineer, I didn't know his number, and he screamed, Oh, I'll do it, and hung up the phone. Meanwhile, I couldn't change records, so I opened up the mic between cuts, saying, We're tracking a whole album here at WRNW. I was doing anything to kill time until the next song. You weren't supposed to play a whole album side. So I was trying to make it sound natural, you weren't even supposed to talk between the cuts. This was a disaster, and I knew all the other jocks were listening to me. I was so fucking embarrassed. An hour into this, another jock showed up, and I didn't know what to do. I was almost in fucking tears, because I knew I blew it. The guy was going to hate me, and he was going to fire me. So the engineer eventually showed up, and he started blaming me because I didn't know what I was doing, and I was not supposed to hit both buttons at the same time, and I was a schmuck. The next day I went out to the station to see the program director, and I groveled, please forgive me, I didn't know what happened. I really apologized and he didn't fire me. The guy has since told me that he wanted to fire me after that first show. In fact, the only reason he hired me was because I had a first-class radio license and I had short hair. That was ironic because I had just cut my hair for the interview. I had a broadcasting teacher who told me, always go in a nice outfit and cut your hair. Even though you're interviewing at these hippie stations, you should really dress nice. So I had gone up there real professional looking, and the guy told me he hired me because he was so sick of these long-haired motherfuckers coming and giving him shit and never showing up for work on time. Hey, I showed up on time, I just couldn't work the friggin' microphone. Anyway, he didn't fire me and I hung around and eventually. My radio school diploma. I had to take physics, which was a nightmare. Miraculously, I passed. Became the regular midday guy. Meanwhile, the other jocks started talking about getting raises and forming a union. Again, my father gave me good advice. He said, it's great you're making $96 a week. That station's a training ground. Those announcers are nuts trying to get a union and benefits. The station is charging $6 a minute for advertising, the place'll go out of business with a union. So I was doing middays and soon they made me production director, too, because I became really good at cutting tape and coming up with creative commercials. I did some spots for a local guy called The Cheese Wheel. Now this doesn't sound like much, but you have to understand that this was FM and everyone was too cool for the room and here I was doing commercials for the cheese wheel and I was calling the owner on the air and putting him in the spots. This was mind blowing to everyone there. Plus I put sound effects and all kinds of wacky stuff into the spots. This was the only way I could be creative.
Meanwhile, the station was sold and new owners came in and they made this Israeli guy the general manager. This guy was a little bit cocky, a little overconfident, the kind of guy who would come up to me and say, you know, my sign is Capricorn. Busy the best astrological sign, and I would say, hey. What do you mean the best astrological sign? One day he came to me and he said, I listen to your radio show. You are terrible. You will never be a great disc jockey. You're okay with the commercials, you do nice job. So why don't you become my program director? This guy was so insulting, I swear. The day he said that to me, I told myself I was going to be the fucking greatest morning man this country ever had because I had to prove this prick wrong. At the same time, he was offering me $12,000 a year, instead of my measly $96 a week, $12,000 a year. This was unbelievable. So I went to my father and he told me to take the job as program director but stay on the air as a disc jockey because program directing is a shit job and on air is where the action is. Good advice. So now I was running the radio station. And the Israeli said, look, I can't make any money with this progressive format. Why don't you just get rid of all the records and play 50 of the same songs over and over again, like Top 40 does. Hey, I just wanted the 250 a week. I couldn't give a shit about the music. I said to someone, you're the music director, you pick the 50 fucking records. I couldn't believe I was getting a paycheck. A couple of days went by and the Israeli said to me, you're in charge of public affairs now, too, because you're the program director. What do I have to do? I asked. See those records over there? He pointed, religious broadcasters pay us to run those shows. And every week they come in and you open them up. I realized I had seen the old program director doing all this shit, and it was a whole involved library system, and I'm totally disorganized. Plus, I didn't give a rat's ass about the religious programming. So I figured I was going to get these religious programs and I was going to throw them in the garbage because nobody could possibly be listening to the Mary Mill Theater with all the nuns on Sunday morning. I took one show and told the Sunday engineer, here's your tape. Just play the same fucking show over and over. I was right. We didn't get one complaint. I soon started to realize that this was ridiculous. I was the program director, but I wasn't into it. Yet they loved me, they thought I was a great program director. I didn't give them any shit. If I lost a disc jockey, I'd take a college kid and throw him on the air. In fact, Bree Walker once asked me for a job there. She was on Winnie, a big station in New York and she left the station. I met her at a party my resume and business card. I was so proud of my meaningless job and my meaningless accomplishments. I went to shake her hand, and she didn't have a fucking hand. Then she asked me for a job. Bree, we pay four dollars an hour. It's beneath you. You worked at Winnie, I said. I wouldn't hire her, because I felt that she would intimidate all of us. She was a professional. We were not professionals we were idiots, we were assholes. We were the worst assemblage of disc jockeys on the planet, and I put together the worst of them, because if I heard a tape and the guy didn't stutter I hauled him in and put him on the air. So here I was, the new program director, and one of the jocks told me someone in the station was stealing from her pocketbook. What am I supposed to do? I asked. Now that I was making that big twelve grand a year, I married Allison. Hey baby, spend the rest of your life with a guy with a bad mustache. My father and I share a slow dance. Do something, she said. We'll set a trap for them, I said, we'll put out your pocketbook, and I'll stand in the other room, and we'll see who's stealing from your pocketbook. Sure enough, we found one of the jocks stealing from her pocketbook. He took twenty bucks. He was making ninety-six dollars a week, he had to pay rent and help out with his family's bills. He was taking twenty from her pocketbook because he was desperate. So I went to the Israeli and told him what went down. If you want to truly be management, be a man, and fire him yourself, he told me, you go fire him. Be a man. I got it in my mind that, holy shit, if I was really going to be the manager, I really do have to fire this guy. And I was like puking over this, I was sick to my stomach. Even though he was stealing from the pocketbook, I felt really bad for the guy, but I had to go fire him. That's when I made the decision, I wasn't going to be in management.
I probably could have done that whole trip and been a program director, but it was bullshit. I knew I had to get back to what I had wanted to do since I was five. I had to become a wacky morning man. Here's the leather weather lady. I picked up radio and records, which is a trade publication in radio, and I saw that WCCC, a station in Hartford, Connecticut, was looking for a wild, fun morning guy. I had fantasized about working for this station many times because it was right between Boston and New York, and every time I drove back to college I had picked it up in the car. This was a 50,000 watt FM station and it had a sister AM station that simulcast in the morning. So I put together a tape. I knew that deep inside I wanted to do wild stuff, but you can't do wild stuff sitting by yourself in a room. The craziest thing I did on that audition tape was say, okay. Let's listen to some Robert Klein, and boom, I played something off a Robert Klein album. Then I played some Ch and Chong. Those were the only two comedy albums we had at the station. And I mixed in a couple of one-liners that I'd written. Other than that, it was mostly Robert Klein being funny. When I finally met Robert Klein, I told him I owed my career to him. So I sent this tape off to CCC and they called me for an audition. I went up there. I was shitting in my pants. The guy said, go in that room, put on the mic, here's five records. Go do a radio show. I went into the other studio, and I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. I just felt weird. But I did it and I gave the guy the tape, and it really pissed me off that I fucked up, so I called him up and said, I haven't heard from you. What did you think of the tape? Your tape is great, he said to me. But that shit that you did for me in my studio was terrible. You didn't do anything. I told him that I had felt very uncomfortable, I wasn't prepared. So I went back up and I did another tape for them, and this time I just let loose, I went wild. I nailed it and the guy hired me. They hired me for 12 grand a year, so I was maintaining my salary, but I needed money to move. I called the owner and I asked him to help me out. I've got to move me and my wife to Hartford. Where am I gonna live till she moves up? I asked, I have no money. Well, all right. I won't pay for your move but I'll give you a hotel allowance of $60, he said. All right, $60 a night. I said. No, $60 for the week. Where am I gonna find a hotel for $60 a week? I complained. Well, it seemed he knew a place right there in Hartford. So I moved up there. First night I was there, there was a shooting at this hotel. They were shooting right through the fucking walls and I was going out of my mind. I was scared shitless. Plus, I was alone. Allison was convinced she should keep her job in New York. She had this good social work job. We were actually going to live in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I tested it out but it took an hour and a half of solid driving. By the time I got to the station, at five in the morning, I was exhausted. And this job was fucking torture. From six to ten I was on the air in the morning. From ten to two, I had to do commercials. Not just voice commercials, I had to produce finished commercials. And if the sales guy didn't like it, I had to go in and produce it all over again. It was like a torture chamber. It was just an unbelievably exhausting job. There was no way to explain how bad it was. I was up there every day. I worked Saturdays from 6 to noon, trying to be funny. Then from noon to 3, I had to be the production guy. Plus, I was the public affairs director. I had to do half-hour interviews on Sunday morning. But I would take those during the week. It was funny because my public affairs show was the most interesting thing about the job because at least I got to talk for a half hour straight with no music. I would interview local people, such as the head of the ASPCA. But I would get into these bizarre lines of questioning. I'd ask them about their dating habits, whatever. I can't tell you how bizarre this was, because nobody was doing anything like this in radio at this point. People have told me that Imus was doing amazing stuff on the radio back then but he wasn't doing shit. He got on the radio, and he used to say, Quack quack, who loves you, baby? I don't know how he got that irreverent reputation. But he had it because nobody was doing anything. Anybody who sounded a little different was irreverent. But there was one good thing about Hartford. I met Fred, 
Earth Dog, Norris there. Fred was going to college and he was the overnight guy. He was a funny guy and a good writer and he had knack for doing impressions. After his shift he hung out with me in the studio while he put away his records. He was half asleep and I'd say, Fred, in 30 seconds, you gotta be Howard Cozell. In Hartford, I began to conceptualize what I could really do with a morning show. I started off by demanding that the governor recognize my birthday as a state holiday. No response. I called aides to the mayor of Hartford. They told me I'd have to be dead. Finally, I got the majority leader of the state senate to send me an official looking document that, for the rest of eternity, January 12 would be commemorated in Connecticut. When Paul McCartney got busted in Japan and imprisoned for possession of grass, I called Tokyo to protest. When Yale and Harvard medical schools announced there was a shortage of dead bodies for research, I ran a cadaverthon on the air. But the one thing that got me the most publicity in Hartford was my, to hell with Shell, boycott. It actually wasn't even my boycott, it was a listener's idea. During the summer of 1979 we experienced some gas shortages. I read a chain letter that was sent out to people in Hartford urging a two-day boycott of Shell products because Shell was foreign-owned and was the first company to ration its supply. We discussed the letter on the air and I suggested that people drive with their lights on to protest the rise in fuel prices, turn the lights on bright until they get the prices right, was the rallying cry. Pretty tame stuff. But you have to remember that this was at a time when disc jockeys kept their mouths shut and never bad rapped anyone. We were the station's goodwill ambassadors, and controversies were to be avoided. Advertisers are gods in radio, and the rule is you never upset them. Two people from Shell even called our station, but we kept up with the campaign. Why not? Shell wasn't advertising with us. I was doing well at the station, I had been there for a year, and I asked for a raise. A lousy, stinking $25 a week raise. The owner, Z. Dressner, told me he had to think about it. That really pissed me off. I got on the next morning, I was doing my show, it was a Saturday, and I put on, Free Bird, and all of a sudden I was overwhelmed, I was on my knees, praying that somebody would hear me from Hartford and get me the fuck out of there. I just couldn't believe I was wasting my time at this annoying job. Plus, I had the worst living conditions. I was living in this connected townhouse with neighbors who became obsessed with my show. At four in the morning they would play their stereo super loud and if I banged on the wall they'd go even louder. And then they started a campaign against me. They started hanging all these signs on my front door. They said it was freedom of speech, you can say what you want on the radio, we can say what we want on your front door. They were like mental cases. We were living in an apartment where you flushed your toilet and the next morning you woke up and there was shit all over the floors and water was everywhere. It was just unfucking believable. I was living the nightmare of being a famous person who was poor. I couldn't afford to live in an unattached house. People always think that you're rich if you're famous. So I was praying to get the hell out. The next day, I got a call from Dwight Douglas, one of the biggest radio consultants. He said, I heard your show. I think you're fucking brilliant. You're kidding. That's fantastic, I said. Then he told me he was going to put me at one of his stations. Now, Dwight's company was so powerful at that point, it was like the touch of God coming to you. We've got a great opening in Columbus, Ohio, he said. Now, to me, Columbus sounded like Hartford. You don't understand. This is the hottest station in Columbus. They have a real ratings book, four times a year, the whole thing. Hartford had a ratings book once a year, Dwight said. So I put together a tape to give to their people in Columbus, and a week or so later he called me and told me the jock had decided to stay in Columbus. But don't worry, I've got you in mind, he said. Meanwhile, I was ready to kill myself. Again. I was looking through radio and records and I saw that a station in Detroit was looking for a morning man. Detroit sounded like a big market. But I'm bad in geography, I had no idea where Detroit was. I didn't know it was north of Canada. I called Douglas and he said the opening wasn't for me. I thought, fuck him. So I called the GM of the station, Wally Clark, 
and sent him a tape by overnight mail. That night I got a call. You're hired. We're flying into Hartford to do the deal. You're kidding, I said. So we arranged to meet at the Marriott, the biggest hotel in Hartford. I couldn't believe this was happening. I said to Allison, whom I had kept in the dark about all this, I'm going to meet with some guys from Detroit. They want to hire me. You applied for a job without telling me? She said, you don't even know where Detroit is. I gave her my whole radio rap about how we had to travel around the country building my career or we were doomed to be stuck in Hartford. My philosophy was that you needed a resume with 900 call letters on it. I was always shocked at the number of disc jockeys who were willing to stay in places like Hartford with owners who wouldn't even give them health benefits. So I went to meet the guys and they told me the station was an incredible rock station called W4. They were in the process of moving the station to the Renaissance Center, which was a brand new series of beautiful high rises with crystal and the works. I'll do it, I said. Clark handed me a piece of paper. This is the salary. I opened it up nonchalantly. $28,000. Holy shit, $28,000. This was it. Finally, I could tell my father I was making 28 grand. So I went home and told Allison, she flipped out. I told the radio station to go fuck themselves. I called Douglas, the consultant. He told me he was hoping for a better station for me, because W4 was having some problems. I didn't want to hear about any problems. I didn't care, I was pulling in 28. Then I called my father. And I was thinking maybe I should go for 30. He told me 28 was great but there was no harm in calling the guy and asking. So I called Wally back and he said, okay, and now I was pulling down an even 30. I was totally jazzed. I packed up all my stuff and drove up to Detroit alone, because Allison had to give months notice on her job. They put me up at the Renaissance Center. It was beautiful. I said, where's the radio station? Oh, they said, we're not in the Renaissance Center yet. But you just drive down the block, into downtown Detroit, and the station is straight down this road. So I got up the next morning at 4 o'clock, I was ready to go to work. Meanwhile, I had talked to the program director and he had given me a whole list of rules. Don't take phone calls from women because you sound wimpy when you talk to women. Only talk to men. Program directors were always burdening me with their lame theories. I figured, if they knew anything they'd be doing the morning show. How the hell am I going to control who's calling? So I left the Renaissance Center and drove to the station. As I was driving, the neighborhood was getting progressively worse. Finally I saw the station. It was a bombed out old house. I swung into the parking lot and parked the car and got out and there were fucking rats nipping at my feet. I was flipping out. The station was a toilet bowl, but who cared? I was the morning man in Detroit. A major market. What I didn't know was that Detroit was going through one of the worst economic crises in its history. The auto industry was in the toilet and everyone was getting laid off. The whole town was depressed. Including the staff of the station, who were all pissed off that I was making at least ten grand more than they were. So I figured to get noticed I'd riff on the hard times. I tried to think up some bits. I decided to call the Kremlin and apply for five billion dollars in foreign aid for Detroit. I called other countries and tried to sell off New Jersey to raise money. We had a big promotion and I let hundreds of people who donated one dollar and six cents, our call numbers, to smash the shit out of a Toyota, then we turned around and donated the money raised to Chrysler. I started to get national coverage on some of these stunts. I did all sorts of crazy things. I had contests where I gave away 16 cents, which was my pocket change. I called dentists' offices on the air and begged them to change their reception room radios to our show. I called the governor and tried to get Ted Nugent's, Wang Dang Sweet Boon Tang, declared the official state song. We had go back to bed day where we got bosses to let the lucky winners go back to bed, with pay. I did a lot of dial A dates, which I started in Hartford, but this time I got penthouse pets as contestants. That presented a problem once when we found out one of the winners was a convicted sex offender who had served time for one offense and was awaiting trial on a similar charge. I began to assemble what would later become our famous whack pack. 
This woman Irene called up one day and I found out she was a real live leather clad, whip carrying dominatrix. So I dubbed her Irene the leather weather lady and every day I'd call her for the weather and she'd say outrageous stuff, like, bitch, this is the weather and if you don't like it I'm going to come over and beat the crap out of you. One time she even recommended that people buy their mothers a red leather enema bag for Mother's Days. I did anything to get noticed. I entered a local Dolly Parton look a like contest. I wrestled women, and lost, on the front lawn of the station at 8 a.m. In front of 200 screaming maniacs. When the Republicans came to town for their convention we organized a protest in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. It was, burn your BRA for the ERA, and again, I humiliated myself in front of hundreds of people, parading around in a bra and then collecting a few dozen others and burning them. But the worst had to be the public appearances outside the station that we had to do. Let me tell you, promotion people at radio stations are usually arseholes. They're always talking as if they have their finger on the pulse of the public, when, in fact, it really makes little difference what you do out on the street. If you put on a good radio show, people are gonna listen. They couldn't give a shit where you're showing up. But the promo people had this idea that you had to do promotions, 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 and they got you so crazy with it that you had to go do them or you're considered, an enemy of the station. Now, to me, promotions reeked of these bad DJs who go out and do bar mitzvahs. I always felt disc jockeys were low lifes. When I worked in Westchester I used to see some of the old Wunker good. Guys, who were now working up in places like Westchester, and it was depressing. They do these appearances in blue blazers with their big dumb voices. They looked about 150 years old and sad. And they had been the biggest radio personalities. They used to be the Wonka good guys. If they were once at the top of the radio profession, and this is what happened to them, what did the future have in store for me? I was really frightened of the whole business. I was in Detroit and I was the morning man for this failing radio station, and I had no listeners to start with, so every weekend I had to go out on a wacky promotion. I was the moron my father always said I was, I agreed to this stuff. So Halloween night they dressed me up as Dracula and I was supposed to appear at three or four different showings of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I had to get on stage and introduce the movie. Well, first of all, nobody knew who I was. Number two, if you've ever seen an audience for the Rocky Horror Picture Show, they don't want anything interfering with the movie. They're all in costume, they got their toast. They know the friggin' movie by heart, they live for this movie. Plus, Detroit's a very angry city to begin with. Everybody's unemployed. So I went to do the introduction and all these lunatics were marching up and down the aisle. I felt as if I was at some kind of tower meeting in hell. I started to speak and all of a sudden toast and garbage started flying, I was booed unmercifully, people were screaming, get the fuck off the stage, you faggot. They were going nuts. This happened four straight times. The next weekend, they sent me to Windsor, across the border in Canada, to a little punk club. I took Allison with me. Again, I was supposed to do the introductions for the bands. So I got up on stage and said, Hi everybody. My name is Howard Stern and I'm from W4 in Detroit. Now, I'd been in Detroit maybe a month, nobody knew who the fuck I was, so again, everybody started booing. Then this one imbecile kid in a mohawk ran up on stage and boom. He smashed me in the face with an egg. Everybody cheered. Boom. Smashed me with another egg. I stood there stunned. Boom, boom, boom. Three more eggs. I was drenched in egg. Allison was sitting there, she couldn't believe it. I just said, hey. Fuck this, I threw the mic down, and we split. I vowed never to do these appearances again. But the following weekend they booked me to race another disc jockey at a race track. And the leather weather lady showed up, too. By now, she really had the hots for me. She frightened me because she was a real dominatrix who really wanted to dominate me sexually. I mean, I had never seen leather people before this. She really came on strong, and quite frankly, it was pretty exciting. But she was really living the lifestyle. Even her little daughter had a whip. This was a sick crowd. So they decided I was going to race another disc jockey. Now, I don't race cars, I can hardly drive a regular car, 
I didn't know what the fuck I'm doing. And they got me in this dragster and I was racing this other guy in front of thousands of people. This was such a dumb promotion that I got really pissed off and I grabbed the loudspeaker and I was yelling, who the fuck cares about these fucking cars, I was out of my mind. I got a ride back to town from another DJ and the leather weather lady was sitting in the back seat next to me. Now she was always attacking me with lots of sexual innuendo, always coming onto me, the whole thing. I was sitting back there and she started going, oh um, I want you, I want you. I had had enough of her bullshit, too. You fucking want me? I said, my cock is right in these pants. If you fucking want me, go in and take my cock out and do something. Now, I never do this kind of shit. All of a sudden she was unbuckling my pants and was starting to move her hand down. The disc jockey who was driving was watching all this from the review mirror and couldn't believe what was happening. She was looking at me and she couldn't believe I was letting her do it. I finally called Irene's bluff, because it was just getting out of hand. I never thought someone could be this fucking annoying, every minute she was coming. On, grabbing my ass, taking the whip hitting me, and I couldn't take it, I was so angry. So as soon as she had an opportunity she goes, oh, I don't believe you're gonna let me do this, and she never laid a hand on me again. After a few months my show in Detroit became really wild. I was taking no prisoners. I had whole biker gangs in the studio. One of the gangs came in one day and whipped out coke and started snorting it, and I said, you can't do coke, and they said, oh, yeah? What are you gonna do about it? I couldn't stop these guys. I was thinking, oh, my god, I'm going to lose the station's license. But I'd rather lose it than my life. And I got wilder with dominatrix dial A dates with the leather weather lady. One time, in the middle of another dial A date, I decided I was gonna drink and I got so loaded I passed out on the air during the show. I woke up an hour later, and these people were still talking. So I was plugging away at this job. The station was going downhill fast, but I was getting some major attention. I won the Billboard Award for Best A or Disc Jockey, I won the Drake or Top 5 Talent Search, and one of my bits went out on a record to everyone in the industry. So I was starting to get well known. I was getting some job offers when, overnight, the station went country. I looked at Allison, told her to start packing and I ran out to get a copy of Radio and Records, an industry trade paper with lots of classifieds. It was time to hit the road again. Somehow, I couldn't see myself as hope along Harry. Next stop, the funny farm. One of the job offers I got was from an album-oriented station in Washington, D.C. Dash D.C. 101. Again, it was Dwight Douglas who wooed me to come to D.C. I was considering offers from Chicago's WXRT and a station in Toronto. I told Douglas I wasn't sure about the DC station because the general manager seemed slow on the phone and not really aware of what I did. He told me not to worry. I should have. Between the time W4 went country and our move to Washington, I was holed up in my office in our second bedroom at home and I plotted out my show. After a few weeks of deep thought, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. First of all, I decided that whoever worked with me on the air must be simpatico. Then I decided that I was going to kill my competition. I was going to say whatever the fuck I wanted to say. I vowed that I wasn't going to blow this chance in Washington because Washington was the Northeast and my eventual goal was to make it in New York. I know it sounds corny, but when I was still in college, I was so totally focused on winning that when I flew over New York, I'd look down at the city and say, one day everyone will know my fucking name in New York City. I wanted to be famous partly because I wanted to get back at all the women who rejected me in high school. In my warped mind I thought they would feel bad that they rejected me. Bad girls. They needed to be punished. So Washington was a step toward New York, and there was no way I was going to lose. I decided that the Washington show was just gonna be off the wall. The first step was to put my team together. It was time to find my newsperson. I realized how important the news segment was to my show. Since so much of great satire is topical, I wanted to find a newscaster with a good sense of humor who could riff with me on the current stories. I wanted to tear down that artificial wall between the show and the newscast. 
I found my ideal partner in Robin Quivers. Robin had been a nurse and had just broken into radio. She was doing consumer reports for a small station in Baltimore. She'd been in radio less than a year, but Denise Oliver, the program director of DC 101, played me a tape of Robin and she sounded great. So I said, go get her. But for some reason, Robin was playing hard to get. Right, Robin? I wasn't playing hard to get, Howard. I was at my third job in less than a year and I didn't want to move again. Baltimore was my home. But Jenny started wooing me, taking me out to lunches and dinners. Finally, she said, let me play you a tape of the morning guy I want you to work with. I was thinking, right, like this'll make a difference. She put this tape in the machine and here came this voice and I thought, oh, my god. Howard was interviewing a prostitute on this tape and I had never heard anything like it in my life. You know how people immediately take on a sort of adversarial position when they're talking to someone like a prostitute? Like, you horrible person, you must have been abused in your life. Howard. Wasn't like that at all. He was asking stuff like, how much do you charge? How many people do you service a day? He was like a giddy kid, just curious about this other person. It wasn't condemnation, it wasn't, we're up here and we look down on you, you poor dear. He was just treating this prostitute like everybody else. I immediately lost all reservations and I just said, where do I sign? He blew me away. I said, I got to meet this guy. So I was taking a job just to meet him. Then she said, wait a minute, I don't know if this will work. So she put me on the phone with Howard to see if we could talk to each other and he started talking to me as if he'd known me all my life. I can't describe what that's like, for a total stranger to be instantly familiar with you. I thought, he's nuts. I just agreed to work with a crazy man. What have I done? I knew Robin was the partner I'd been looking for that first day we went on the air together in March of 1981. I was going to open my show with a bang, as usual. I remember I called the mayor's office and asked them for a police motorcade and a parade for me to honor my first day on the air and I got some mayoral aid on the phone and I started screaming like a lunatic about Washington's mayor, Mr. Marion Barry. What kind of guy calls himself Marion? That's a girl's name, I ranted. Then I pulled out my other standard opening ploy. I would tell my audience how to get women and I'd give them tips from some cheesy paperback book about picking up girls. I got guys on the phone, I'd interview them about women. When was the last time you nailed a girl? Robin came into the studio, it was right before her newscast was about to begin, and I turned to her and said, So Robin, this guy who wrote this book must know what he's talking about. He's slept with a ton of women. And his tip to get women is you have to wear tight pants. Robin gave me this look like it was crazy. No, it's true, I insisted, it's tight pants. Robin looked at me and said, this guy has slept with a ton of women? Yeah, I said. If he slept with a ton of women, when did he have time to put on pants? Robin said. I reeled back in my chair and thanked God. She could talk. We went to commercial and Howard was saying, that's wonderful. That's brilliant. You're great, and I was saying, what did I do? Leave me alone, you're making me crazy. But that was the way he was. If I farted it was, oh, that's wonderful. I just thought thank goodness I was in another studio when I did my broadcasts because he would say, oh, please, do this, say that. He wasn't putting words in my mouth, he just wanted me to react. And then they finished construction on the studio and I was now behind glass in another studio behind Howard. So we couldn't even look at each other unless he swung all the way around. So I'd be in the other studio and Howard was on the air doing his thing. I'd listen to him and laugh out loud, because he was so crazy and outrageous. First of all, he never rehearsed anything. He didn't tape anything. He didn't prepare. He just hit the button and talked to whoever was out there and made something hilarious out of it. It's hard to realize how revolutionary that was because everybody else in radio then was rehearsed and prescribed down to the last letter. And he didn't care at all about format. We were constantly breaking format. And the content was hysterical. Howard wasn't telling jokes, it was life happening in front of your eyes. He was catching people with their pants down. 
people would get up in the morning and call and they would think that they weren't going to be the fools and, invariably, they would be the worst fools. The people who thought, I think just like Howard, or, I know exactly what to say, Howard would drive them nuts. He'd take a wild right turn and do exactly the opposite of what they expected. Then he'd scream at them or he'd hang up on them. Nobody ever did that before on the radio. You can't yell at your callers, you can't treat them bad, you can't hang up on them. You can't take too many women callers because this is a rock station. You can't mention the other station's call letters. Howard would break all the rules and I'd just be in the cracking up saying, Oh, God, here we go again. Then Howard started saying, Robin, you have the greatest laugh. I love it when you laugh on the air. So when you come in the studio, turn on your mic as soon as you get there. Just say whatever comes into your mind. I told him, you're so sweet, but I wouldn't do it. I had control of my mic. But he kept at me and at me and at me and he finally wore me down. He got me to do it. The only thing holding me back was, again, I had to start from square one with management. I had to educate the general manager, educate the program director, talk them into letting me do little things. I kept pushing the envelope just a little further every day, just a little bit, then a little bit more. And what a pair of management types I had at that station. First, there was Denise Oliver, the program director. Denise was a real nice looking woman with huge breasts. Now right off the bat, I have trouble with women as authority figures, especially if they have huge breasts and come in wearing jeans and a tight work shirt. How the hell are you supposed to concentrate in a meeting when she's leaning over, showing you a memo or something, and those melons are staring you in the face? And she was always in the meetings. Right away, she didn't like Robin and me talking to each other. I couldn't believe it. She'd go over to Robin and say, should I stop him from interrupting you? Robin would say, no way. This is great. Robin, I want you to stop him when he does this. You have to take a strong stand. I have always thanked Denise for pairing me with Robin but it upset me that she wanted us to act traditionally. It got so bad that in the beginning, Robin would meet with Denise and me but soon she banned Robin from the meetings because Robin always took my side. I was frustrated because my program was being slowed down. Denise also had to have a strict format. We were doing regular features like Dial A Date and What's Your Problem? Where people would call up and I'd solve their problems. But Denise would say, now you seem to do What's Your Problem? On Mondays, so why don't we make that official so when I wake up on Monday, I know it'll be What's Your Problem? Des. I didn't want a format. I wasn't comfortable with these restrictions. Then she had these elaborate grids. The grids made me feel as if I was back in elementary school. She wanted me to fill in the grids every week in advance with what we were going to do each hour. This woman was a great music program director and really had a great sense of direction for the station. But we were breaking new ground. I think she wanted to take control, and that was her job. But the constant interference was killing me. How was I supposed to know what I'd do on the show next Friday? Didn't she realize I was a spontaneous performer? Then she'd bring up research. I had to play a lot of music. The listeners we surveyed don't want to hear phone calls between records. We asked them, she said. But how did you ask them? They didn't explain in the survey that the disc jockey doing the talking is a fucking mutant and he's going to take these phone calls and talk about women's tits. Of course, the research showed they didn't want talking. She had other theories. She wanted me to memorize the names of the high schools in the area. I had to learn the goddamn street names of every neighborhood. I had to make local appearances. Again with the appearances. Rules, everybody had rules. One time I was on the air and I decided to eat breakfast. So I ordered breakfast on the air, and it went on for 18 minutes. Denise went ballistic. I can't believe you ate breakfast for 18 minutes on the air. This is insubordination, she ranted and the most embarrassing thing about it is that I didn't know you were going to do this. You're supposed to clear things with me ahead of time. The program director from WPGC, Steve Kingston, called me as soon as I got in my office this morning and said, do you know your morning man at breakfast for 18 minutes on the air? What's wrong with you? I turned to her and I said, Denise, a competing program director called you and told you he sat and listened to me eat breakfast for 18 minutes. 
and he timed it. Do you think there were other people in the audience who couldn't believe I was doing this, too? Do you think that it's a possibility that this was compelling radio, that you all thought I had lost my mind, and just had to stay tuned to see what would happen? She just couldn't understand what I was saying to her. Every day it was like this, me trying to educate her, and her wanting me to make a grid. But Denise didn't torture me for long. In a few months, I tripled the station's ratings, and because the station was on such a roll she was able to get a job in New York. It was a great opportunity for her and now I was free from our daily meeting routine. The general manager was another story. This guy, Goff Leber, was the biggest pain in the ass I ever worked for. Well, at least until I got to NBC. Goff would pontificate every day as if he was damn Einstein. He had theories, Cockerman theories about rebuilding the station. He had a five-point plan. Number one was antenna. Strength. If you had good transmission, nothing else could fail. Number two, the sales force. Once you had a good sales effort, you'd have the money forever. Numbers three and four were equally inane and number five, last, was programming. In other words, it didn't matter who was talking into the microphone or what they said, as long as the damn signal was clear. This was what I was up against. But I kept chipping away at management's archaic approach and we began to assemble the program I had envisioned. We did parodies like Hill Street Jews. We did beaver breaks, bits where Wally made love to an inflatable doll or Ward got a sex change. I introduced God and had him do the weather. Who could be better at forecasting? Then I had God reveal that he was gay and living with a guy named Bruce. I savored every letter of hate mail and read the best ones on the air. I even called the haters up and got them on. I formed new work pack. Somehow I got it into my head that we had to have sports coverage on the show, but not just any sports coverage. I started auditioning people who called in. We got this guy who sounded like he was having a nervous breakdown while he was giving scores. I brought him into the studio for his reports and Robin would find him lying in a corner crying, in the fetal position. He's crazy, Robin worried. Yes, but he's great on the air, I said. One day he got really scary and we had to reevaluate our sports team. Our guy had held it together for the first few sports casts, but he was withdrawing more and more as he became popular. Finally, when he was bound up in the fetal position mumbling to himself and sounding suicidal, we could no longer get him to the mic. But I had other nuts I could work with. Allison was working as a psychiatric social worker in Washington so, after work, she was always telling me about her patients. What a fertile source of material. She was working with severe schizophrenics who would burn themselves with cigarettes, bang their heads incessantly, and think that their radios were sending them personal messages. The next day I'd imitate these patients on the air. Boy, did she get pissed. She'd say, they listen to your show and they think you're having the same hallucinations. Once a year they had a family picnic for these cooks. I'd be cooking hamburgers and Allison would tell me to go play frisbee with some of her patients. Have you ever played frisbee with schizophrenics? You throw the frisbee to them and they make no attempt to catch it. It just hits them in the face. They won't pick it up and throw it back. I kept fetching it and throwing it and they just stand there and let it hit them. Finally, I quit playing and I turned away and one guy picks the frisbee up and flings it right into my neck. That was my last picnic. I always resented the label of, shock jock, that the press came up with for me, because I never intentionally set out to shock anybody. What I intentionally set out to do was to talk just as I talk off the air, to talk the way guys talk sitting around a bar. To me, that was always the most fun, when I would get together with guys and we'd all start bullshitting about getting pussy or the girls tits or even political events, but doing it in a goofy way, where nobody's taking anything seriously. If I could eliminate the notion of the microphone, so that people would get loose and be real, that was the ideal. You don't know how many times I have guests on who think we're still in the commercial, and they start talking, and then they say, oh, we're on the air? That's why ultimately radio is better for me than television, because on TV they never forget they're on. When that camera's in the room, everybody's on guard. In Washington I approximated this ideal by creating the think tank. The think tank was a bunch of guys I put together, Harry Cole, a lawyer, 
Steve Chickeners, a salesman, and Steve Greger, who managed the record store. They came up every Tuesday and we went wild. Anything could happen. We were just a bunch of guys goofing on everything. It really was my college radio show all over again. In fact, out of those sessions evolved the rankouts, which were the first things to get me in trouble in Washington. We used to have rankout contests on the air. Listeners would call in and try to beat me in ranking out each other's mothers. I heard your mammy is so fat that her gynecologist has to put up scaffolding to do the job. Your mammy is like a 7-Eleven. Open all night, hot to go, and for 35 cents she'll give you a slurpee. Stupid stuff like that. But immediately we got attacked by all sorts of moronic uptight dar groups. But I was no stranger to controversy. Hey, I was going for ratings. A large percentage of my audience in Washington was black and I used to watch this local militant self-help positive thinking black guy named Petey Green who had a off television show on Sunday mornings. I loved this guy because he was a real showman. He was always talking about the niggers and the crackers and jiving and rhyming and sitting in this big wicker chair in his expensive fine clothes, sort of like Huey Newton meets Superfly. I always talked about this guy on my radio show how all whites should listen to him because he was giving away the militant blacks game plan. So Petey invites me to be a guest on his TV show. This was my first TV appearance in DC. And even then I always felt that whenever you have a chance to be on television, you should do something memorable. So I went out and rented an afro wig and brought some props and went to the taping with Robin and Fred. In the dressing room I put on the afro wig smeared black shoe polish all over my face except for a big circle around my mouth, and went out on the set carrying a big boombox and a huge afro pick. The audience was almost totally black and didn't know how to react until Petey saw me and cracked up. Our interview was great. Petey then paid a poetic tribute to me at the close of the show. His name is Howard. His last name is Stern, but there's a C somewhere and that C stands for concern. I don't think he's hateful, deceitful or mean, and he even gets up in the morning and watches Petey Green. So grab your hand and make a fist, just listen to me and know this. I'll tell it to the high, I'll tell it to the cold, I'll tell it to the young, I'll tell it to the old. I move so fast. That sometimes I burn, but tonight I'm glad to deal with Howard's turn. I kept the pressure on Goff to constantly push the parameters of the show more and more each day. One day I said to him, I want to do a gay dial a date. Immediately, he said no. But I kept pushing. I told him that the gay audience was demanding it. They were jealous of the regular dial a dates. I told him that I would handle it with class and decorum. Sure I tried all sorts of tactics to make it seem legitimate just so I could go on the air and mess with gays. In fact, I even suggested that we do it first with lesbians to ease into the whole gay area. Right. I just wanted to hear those hot lesbo stories. Finally, he relented. The Washington Blade, D.C.'s leading gay paper, wrote about it. DC 101 as gay dial a date. Washington gays may have been done a great service by a radio disc jockey. Howard Stern recently made a gay dial a date game, the focal point of his popular broadcast. Thomas Stern, who is 27 years old and married, has been holding dial a date games on radio for three years, when homosexual listeners wrote him suggesting that it would only be fair to have a gay version of the game, he agreed. Stern often wields his voice on the air to mercilessly puncture the pretensions and underline the stupidity of the people who call his show. Therefore, there was concern that he would use the occasion of the gay dial a date to ridicule homosexuals. Instead, on Friday a.m., the gay community was treated to one of the best most sensitive treatments of gay themes ever to air on the mainstream media. For the first gay dial a date he decided it would be best to feature lesbians because the audience would be more likely to accept them, but he promises in the future there will be a gay male version. Stern gave, Miss X, and her three suitors, Bachelorette's numbers 1 through 3, the opportunity to refute the idea that all lesbians are ugly women with hairy legs and hiking boots, and the misconception that most gays molest children. Listeners who called up to scorn or mock a gay dial a date while it was on the air were made short shrift of by Stern. The American people are smart. 
They hear Howard on the radio and they realize that's the program to tune into. Dash Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was pushing the boundaries all over. I didn't know how far I would go. Anything that happened to me became grist for the mill of my show. I was with Fred doing an appearance on the local Charlie Rose television show when we saw Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was there to tape an earlier show. I loved Arnold and I had just read that he was about to do the Conan film. Now, normally I'm not a starstruck kind of guy. I don't just go up and approach celebrities and say, hey, I'm a big fan. But I figured maybe I could get something for the radio show, so Fred and I started following him. He walks pretty funny because he's so muscle-bound his thighs are like hitting each other. So we were following him and he went into the men's room. Fred and I looked at each other and we followed him in. He was sitting in a stool, with his pants down around his ankles, and he was taking a monster dump. A loud, big, smelly shit. I knew this was the rudest thing to do but I also knew I could talk about this for years on the air, so I said, Arnold. Yes. His booming voice filled up the bathroom. Hey, I'm Howard Stern and this is Fred Norris. We do a radio show in Washington. Yes, boys, Arnold says politely. This was great. You're always vulnerable when you're crapping out, no matter how big a star you are. Hey, I just want you to know I'm a big fan of Conan the Barbarian and I think it's a superior move for you to do it, I said. Thank you, boys, he said. I really appreciate you saying that. We had this whole conversation with him and then we walked out. Later we ran into him on the set and introduced ourselves to him again. I thought it was really nice of him to even answer us. I would have been embarrassed as hell. Years later I had him on my show and I told him I was sure his penis was as long as his last name. It didn't take long for Robin to realize that I would talk about anything on the air. In fact, let her tell this story. I'll never forget the day I realized that nothing was sacred. I had started to gain weight. We had been under attack from management all the time. Goff hated us, and the other DJs hated us because we were getting so popular. It got really depressing even though the show was doing great. We were both drowning our sorrows every day at Roy Rogers with bacon cheeseburgers, fries, and shakes. We both ballooned up. One day I got up in the morning to get ready to go to work and I couldn't get my pants buttoned. I walked into Howard's studio and I said, I can't believe how fat I'm getting. I couldn't get the top button on my pants done today, and I showed him. I went back into my studio, because we were gonna do a break, and he got on the air, and he immediately said, guess what, everybody? Robin has gotten so fat she can't button the top button, I was horrified. This is the worst thing you could do to a woman. He just got on the air and told all of Washington, D.C. That I was so fat I couldn't button my pants. I couldn't believe he had done that. He was so sweet and understanding just seconds before. I looked at him and he gave me one of those little kid shrugs like, I couldn't help it. But that was nothing compared with what I did to Allison. We had been married almost four years and we decided to have a baby. It was February of 1982 and we went to Aruba on a vacation because that's a nice place to bang away and try to make a kid. In Aruba we met these other people from Washington who invited us over when we got back. They had a nice house and a fancy hot tub and Allison went in the hot tub. Meanwhile, I started calling Allison every morning on the air with a pregnancy patrol report. Fred played some ambulance sirens in the background and I'd ask if she got her period yet. She missed her period. So we were telling everyone she's pregnant. We flew up to Boston to visit her parents and grandparents and immediately told them. Allison's grandmother, this great woman who was in her 90s, said, if I were you, I wouldn't broadcast it. I already had. So Allison was about six weeks pregnant and she started cramping and bleeding. I took her to the doctor and he put her down on the table and he said that she was expelling the fetus. It was about the size of an aspirin but we were totally bummed out. We didn't know if Allison could get pregnant again. We felt like total failures. So to keep our sanity, we started kidding about it. I said that we should take some Polaroids of the blood blob and send it to our parents so they'd at least have a picture of their grandchild. After a couple of days, Allison was joking about it, too. So I decided it was okay. 
The next day I got on the air and it was time for God to do the weather. Let's check in with God. Hello, God. Yo, God. Your Holiness, thunder and lightning sound effects. This is God. What's the weather like, man? Hey, Howard, I see your wife had a miscarriage. Hey, you're not supposed to talk about that. You tried to have a baby and you failed. Don't bring that up on the air. I didn't tell anyone. You couldn't even succeed in getting that right. Boy, are you a loser? I don't think this is funny. You're not a real man. Ha, ha, ha. You must be half a man. A real man would have done it right the first time. You're an embarrassing creation. I started crying. Howard, I will make it mostly sunny today. Maybe you should go out and breathe some fresh air and go do it and get it right this time. When Robin came on, we continued the discussion. God let the cat out of the bag. I didn't want other people to know, I cried. I'm sorry, Robin said, pull yourself together. That was my kid, I bawled, and now he's lying on some laboratory floor. My kid's gone. And with him all my dreams and fantasies. My stupid wife had to have a miscarriage. It's all her fault. It's not her fault, Howard, Robin said. You know what it was? All the LSD I took in the 60s. I'll tell you kids out there, don't be like your pal Howard and take LSD. I did it a long time ago and now I'm paying for it. It's my fault my wife. Had a miscarriage. I've got pulverized sperm. Chromosomal damage. Just because I wanted to see rocks move and watch trees melt. I blew it. I'm a wussy. I'm shooting blanks. My wife said it's my fault, I had dud sperm. I sobbed hysterically. Don't tell my wife we talked about it on the air, I said. You should talk about it, get it off your chest, Robin counseled. They made us put the kid in a bottle so they could examine it and see what was wrong. Do you know what that was like? My wife and I wanted to save the bottle. He's our kid. We even named him. Ethan. We got him in formaldehyde. We're going to carry him in the bottle and take him to the zoo next weekend, buy him some popcorn. Every slob on welfare has kids, why can't I? What did I do to deserve this? We're going to have a birthday party for him. We're gonna act like he's alive. Just because he's in a bottle doesn't mean he can't have a life of his own. So I'm gonna be Auntie Robin? Robin asked, should I buy him toys? Don't get him toys, I said, get him fresh formaldehyde every once in a while. Don't laugh at my misery, Robin. I opened up the phone lines and we were flooded with calls. The first call was a woman who had been pregnant nine times and lost seven. If you were my husband, I would divorce you. That was the cruelest thing I ever heard. I care, she yelled. You care about what? I asked. Your wife. I care about my wife, too, lady, I snapped. You made a boo-boo. You're cruel. Talking about the miscarriage and then referring to it as a blob on the floor. My God, man, put yourself in her shoes for just a minute and think how she might feel, the woman said. I let her have it, how do you think I feel? It was my kid. My kid. I lost my kid. I hung up on her, I'm not gonna take that from her. I come on the air and bear my soul to you and this woman has the nerve, the nerve, to make fun of me. I'm really upset. Why do you think I wasn't here last Tuesday? I was in the hospital with my wife when she lay there. I started acting as if I was sobbing, it's my kid, too. Howard Jr. We had to put that kid in a bottle and the doctor still is our kid and I want him back. I composed myself, I even bought my wife roses when she told me the good news. I spent thirty bucks on those roses and then I called up the florist and said, look, the kid didn't make it. Give me at least fifteen back. The guy said, I don't care, pal. I'm never using that florist again. That is man's inhumanity to man. That night I went home and went to sleep early. I should get Alison in here to tell you the rest of this story. Twelve years and three children later, this whole thing is pretty hysterical, but I didn't feel that way then. I got a call from a local reporter who asked me how I felt about Howard talking about the miscarriage on the air. Howard was already asleep. The more this reporter told me, 
the angrier I got. He got me completely crazy and I stayed up all night and yelled at Howard. I was pissed. I felt really violated by him for the first time ever. I was mortified. I was furious. I was up the whole night, I felt so betrayed by him. This reporter Dennis was writing positive articles about me, but this time he acted like all of Alison's gossipy friends who listened to the show and then report back to her on what I said. This guy prodded her, didn't it make you feel bad? Don't you realize it was your baby he was talking about? He got to her and she went ballistic on me, you're an arsehole. You're a moron, she screamed. What was I supposed to do? Once she was joking about it I figured it was okay to talk about it on the air. My personal life has to be my material because I hate to go out anywhere. Hey, I have to fill up five hours a day. I thought this would be strong material for at least a week but I had to nip it in the bud. Bitches interrupt us. The next day I went on the air, all can write. We'll do dial A date tomorrow. I also want to tell you that due to the fact that I told you about my wife's miscarriage yesterday, my wife isn't talking to me now. Just because I wanted to be honest with you people. She said, that isn't the kind of thing you should tell your audience. You can't talk about that on the radio, you just should have said it was a false alarm. I said, no, no, you don't understand. The whole premise of this radio show is that I'm honest with the people. So we're not talking now. We're having a fight. She's not into talking because she's embarrassed. A lot of women have miscarriages. I know why we had it. Because I eat all that artificial sugar with the cyclamates. In my coffee this morning I'm having regular sugar with that fake milk. Come to think of it, there's a lot of chemicals in that non-dairy creamer. Maybe that's what's destroying my children. I started reading the ingredients, corn syrup solids, partly hydrogenized vegetable oil, coconut oil, cottonseed oil, palm oil, then something called sodium casenate, you know that's going to kill my kid. Then God came back on to do the weather. And he apologized to me for talking about my wife's miscarriage. I'm sorry I made fun of you. Just because you're not a real man doesn't mean I have the right to make fun of you, a baby cries in the background, by the way. Do you hear that baby in the background? Yeah. That's yours. He's up here with me now. Oh, man. Not to worry. We're having a good time. I'm going to introduce him to Jim Morrison of the Doors. You better not, that guy's a derelict. I will make it a nice day today. This is God on DC 101. God, I'm sick and tired of you. You're out. I'm gonna get me that guy from Channel 4, what's his name? Allison. I wanted to climb under a rock. I started getting all these letters from people whose children had died. I got a letter from a woman, who had a stillbirth and mine was the size of iron aspirin. I was so embarrassed. When we went out in public, I felt that people could see right through me. But I could never stay mad I at Howard. I understood it wasn't so horrible. Within two seconds, he can talk to me and he has such a sweetness. I know this sounds corny, but he can turn to me and say, I didn't really mean to hurt you, I really love you, and then it's all over with. That was the turning point. I knew that nothing was off bounds. I thought, here we go. He always says that nobody knows if this is true or not because he embellishes stories, but I still get angry when he talks about our personal life, even to this day. It's weird. But if I have a problem with something I have to say to him, I have to talk to you but I don't want it on the radio. Then he'll say, I wasn't even thinking about it for the air, but now that you mentioned it, it would be great radio. But the thing that got me the most notoriety in Washington was the famous 14th Street Bridge incident. This event has been so distorted over the years by the press that I want to set the record straight, once and for all. It started when that Air Florida flight crashed into the bridge in February of 1982. The plane crashed because they didn't de-ice the wings. I was outraged that people lost their lives because of this stupid airline fuck-up. So I made believe I was calling Air Florida and I said, what's the price of a one-way ticket from National to the 14th Street Bridge? Is that going to be a regular stop? I was seriously coming out against this negligence. I didn't make jokes. I didn't actually call and speak to someone from the airline. But that riff became legendary. 
In fact, six months later, when I was leaving Washington to go to WNBC in New York, a reporter from the Washington Post wrote that I had been fired from DC 101 for that call. That bullshit article still haunts me. Everybody says I got fired over this incident. It's not true. In fact, no one ever complained about it. Anyway, after a year on the air, we had quadrupled our audience. It was insane. We were real celebrities in Washington. We'd go out to do public appearances and we'd be mobbed. People would come up and press coke or pot into our hands and we'd politely refuse. We did an appearance at the big department store Woodward and Lothrop and it was out of control. They set us up in a little booth in front of the store window and I was supposed to greet people. Well, it was a rainy day and the mall was packed with people. Thousands and thousands of people showed up and they were lined up outside and when they finally let them in, they almost tore the store down. We had to be escorted out of there because the people just rushed in and trampled over all the merchandise and knocked over the racks and started stealing everything in the fucking store. They had to evacuate the mall. It was unreal. That was the last public appearance I ever did, except for one right before I left Washington, when my album 50 Ways to Rank Your Mother came out. Fred and I went down to a record store to promote it and a young girl came up to get her album autographed. She said, I want your autograph for my mother. Your mother? Where's your mother? I asked. She's out in the car waiting for me, she said. You should bring her in. Is she nice looking? I asked. Don't you talk about my mother like that, she yelled and wham, she kicked me right in the nuts and went running out of the store. But with all that popularity do you think that our general manager Lebo would be happy? No. He was pissed that I had made his station successful. This guy was reaping all the rewards of my success, he was making about half a million a year because of his deal, and I was still pulling in about 40,000. And he was pissed. Meanwhile, Robin and I went to a party at his house one night and he was living in some huge, tacky house with one of those stupid naked kid sculptures that be into a fountain in the middle of his foyer. It was so disgusting it looked as if it should be in a mausoleum. I was sitting there eating my heart out that this character was making a half a mil a year and living in a big house because of my success. Meanwhile, I was driving a 1970 Valiant. Then he pulled me into his office and he said, why don't the newspapers mention me? They only write about you. This guy was giving me shit because I was getting credit for my accomplishments. Why don't they mention me? I was the architect of this station's success. He was one of those guys with dry mouth, and as he was talking, I was watching this little piece of white spit get caught on his lip and go up and down like a cobweb. And I realized that this guy was angry at me for being successful. I asked him for more money and he said, absolutely not. So I knew it was time to move on. I had my sights set on New York. I had gotten a lot of other offers, even an offer from WPLJ in New York to do nights, but I didn't think that was the right move. Meanwhile, Goff got wind of my offers and he tried to nail me down to a contract. All that time he didn't want to give me a contract, now he said if I didn't sign one within a month, I'd be fired. But he didn't want me to be represented by a lawyer. I was whining that I wanted to be represented. He wouldn't let me be represented. While this was dragging on, he got sick. He was home, he was missing work. He was getting sicker. They didn't know what it was, but it looked as if he was going to die. I couldn't believe my good luck. He's going to drop dead. We're going to get our wish, I told Robin. All of a sudden, his wife came in, all smiles. You aren't going to believe how lucky we are. They found a dick in Goff's head. He has Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They took out the dick, he got completely better. He was coming back. So Goff came back and we worked out a one-year contract with a nothing, shitty raise, which I signed. A few months later I signed a contract to go to WNBC in New York after my Washington contract expired. Well, this pissed Goff off and they started to make my life miserable. They took away my office. They harassed me in a million different ways. In August of 1982, with two months to go on my contract, they hired this no-talent jerk called the Grease Man and they gave him all the money I had been asking for. 
another disc jockey getting a boatload of money off my hard work. The day they hired him, they decided to fire me and get me off the air right away. They made up some excuse, saying I had violated station rules by talking about other disc jockeys. That made no sense, because I had always talked about other disc jockeys. They really just wanted not to pay me for the last two months of my contract, but I took them to the union and they were forced to pay anyway. I was thrilled. I was getting away from Leber and I was finally getting my shot at working in New York. I was going to work for the world-famous, first-class national broadcasting company. This was my dream come true, I thought. Little did I realize it was more like, welcome to my worst nightmare. Pig virus. It sucks at NBC Chapter 6. I had done it. This was the culmination of all my dreams. This made all the shit I ate in Westchester and Detroit and Washington worth it. I was on my way to New York the nation's number one market, my hometown. I was the afternoon drive time air personality for WNBC. I thought back to all those commutes I had made with my dad. Now I was going to be the guy who could come out of your car radio and make that drudgery magical. I was jazzed. I wouldn't be for long. There were hints even in the first meeting I had with the NBC people. NBC's management came to Washington to meet with Robin, Fred, and me and at one point in the meeting they asked Robin and Fred what they would do if they weren't hired by NBC. At the time I ignored it and focused on the positive aspects of the meeting, but later I was to find out that the dickheads at NBC had a systematic plan to break up my morning team. Years later, Bob Sherman, the executive vice president of the NBC radio stations, admitted to New York Magazine that they had developed a strategy to tame me before I even came to New York. We wanted Howard without his aides to camp, so he'd be as naked and vulnerable as possible to good management, Sherman said, naked and vulnerable, dash this sounds like he's talking about a bondage video. Little did I know that wasn't far from the truth. For starters, they did succeed in busting us up. They refused to hire Robin after they told me they would. I assured her that I would keep trying to get them to bring her up. But she got really mad at me and she went back to an all-news station in Baltimore. So it was just Fred and I going to New York, but before we even got there another arsehole intervened to make my life miserable. This scumbag also worked for NBC, but he was one of the network's television news talking heads. His name was Douglas Kiker, a name that, to this day, summons up my vomiting reflex. This story started in Washington. Douglas Kiker contacted us and said he wanted to do a favorable report on the Howard Stern phenomenon. I thought, that's cool. I had already done a few good interviews with Charlie Rose for his television show and Kiker's piece was going to appear on, NBC Magazine, which was a national show. Great publicity, I thought. At that time, we were doing a lot of live shows and they decided they'd bring their cameras down to Garvin's Comedy Club where I was scheduled to do the next one. Those shows were a whole story in themselves. I would come out in a bathrobe and we'd all be sitting behind tables and we'd do our normal morning show in front of an audience of rabid fans. So Kaika and his crew came down and filmed us. They interviewed me later. While they were preparing the piece, I signed with NBC Radio in New York. Fine. Now Kaika and I were working for the same corporation. A few weeks later, the piece aired. I sat down with Allison to watch it and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The piece was called, X-Rated Radio, and it started with Kaika saying this. What you're about to hear is going to shock you because if's vulgar, even obscene. A warning, if there are any children in the room you might not want them to watch this report. If sex rated Radio, Barnyard Radio, and there's more and more of it on the air because kids love it. That was just the friggin' introduction. I was going out of my mind. Then they went to a close-up of a radio and coming out of that. Radio was the voice of, you guessed it, me, I hear your pappy is so disgusting that he takes a bubble bath by farting in a mud puddle. Okay, so it was a fart joke. Big fucking deal. But then we saw a hand reach into the frame and shut off the radio. The camera dramatically pulled back and we saw the hand belonged to Douglas Kiker and he was sitting in his living room with a six-month-old baby that looked as if it came from Ivory Soap Central Casting. Give me a break. And now Kiker spoke again. This is my home in Washington. It's secure enough. 
I've got locks on the windows, locks on TV doors, even an alarm system. What's the matter, Doogie? Afraid of the Schwarzes breaking in? Show us your Uzi, why don't you, you big jerk? What I cannot prevent entering my home are the sounds that come over this radio. The idea for this story originated a few weeks ago when I heard my seven-year-old son, this one's older brother, coming down for breakfast saying the same things you just heard this DJ say. Hey, his son was quoting me. He should be thrilled. What's wrong with a seven-year-old kid into fart humor? Is that a crime? Arsehole. Okay, then they cut to me on the stage at Garvin's and I was singing, 50 ways to rank your mother, to the tune of Paul Simon's, 50 ways to leave your lover. My friends always enjoyed your mom they said to me. She was so generous, she did so much for free. Until they found she gave them all a social disease. There must be 50 ways to rank your mother. Then this jerk Kaika came back. His name is Howard Stern. His station is DC 101. He's on the air from 6 to 10 in the morning when grown-ups are on their way to work and their children are off to school. And he is hot. Back to me on stage, singing. I heard she's frigid though she might just be hard to please but if that's so why does she douche with antifreeze? She says she likes it cause it also kills her fleas there must be 50 ways to rank your mother. I liked this song. But Kaika didn't. Then he said that when, word got out, that he was doing this piece, a group of, concerned parents, contacted him and requested to be part of the show. Yeah, right, word got out. Who's he kidding? Anyway, they assembled a group of these mutant parents and here's what they had to say about me. I don't consider it humor at all, adult or child. I think it should be completely off the airwaves. Oh, this housewife was a comedy critic. And she wanted to ban me from the airwaves? Thank you, Mrs. Hitler. Kids are looking for rock v roll music and they get a guy pandering smut to kids. Kids call in with their own rank outs on mothers and I'm a mother. But my favorite one was this guy. Vietnam at dinner time was bad enough. But this stuff over my cocoa puffs is driving me crazy. It just doesn't need to be there. Great. He was comparing me to Vietnam. Who were these people? And what's more important, why were they giving these people so much time to propound their theories when they hardly mentioned the fact that I was number one? People wanted this kind of radio. And you, Kaika, you big jerk, you didn't need bars on your windows. You weren't being invaded by your radio. He sounded like one of Alison's mental patients. If you don't like what you're hearing, turn the friggin' radio off. The piece went on and they showed some other no-talent disc jockeys in other markets who were doing naughty humor. But the real kicker was the ending to the piece. After they ran the report, Keiko was in the studio. That is X-rated radio. And you could be hearing it next in your hometown. This is a story with a little twist to it. While we were in the process of producing this report, Howard Stern was lured away from his Washington radio station by a New York City station which offered him a big increase in salary. That station, you guessed it, is WNBC AM, which is owned by NBC. Dom Fi or Arvanti, the station general manager, told us that WNBC AM, and I quote, is mindful of its responsibility to present programs in accordance with acceptable public taste. Great way to start a new job. I couldn't even get the NBC guys in New York to return my phone calls after that piece. That one piece poisoned my entire relationship with NBC for the next three years and all because Douglas Kiker didn't like his son going around telling fart jokes. Man, I was happy when I heard that Kiker kicked the bucket. Big jerk. Finally, I got a letter from Dom Fi or Arvanti. He said they were excited about me coming to the station and that my show should blend, satirical, farcical an absurd comment, to expose, the inconsistencies and hypocrisies inherent in certain public standards, mores and norms of conduct. Sounded good. Then he told me what I couldn't do. No. 1. Jokes or sketches relating to personal tragedies. 2. Slander, defamation, or personal attacks on private individuals or organizations unless they have consented or are a part of the act. 3. Jokes dealing with sickness or death. 4. Jokes dealing with sexual topics in a lascivious manner. 5. 
scatological or other barnyard type material. 6. Ridiculing religion for the sake of ridicule or making fun of the religious faith people may have. 7. Use of the so-called seven dirty words. Great, I was the number one radio personality in Washington, D.C. And these guys had to remind me not to say fuck or cocksucker on the air. What was I, a baby? I tell you, they really knew how to make a new employee feel good. And it only got worse. NBC Press Photo I was fat with a bad moustache. They had no idea what to do with me, and that was evident from their first advertising campaign, Howard Stern Returns, they were trumpeting all over. Well, it was true that it was a return because I grew up in New York, but I had never been on the radio there before. Imus was the one who had been in New York then got fired and then came back. I was scheduled to go on the air right after Labor Day, 1982, but the station program director, Kevin Matheny, decided he wanted to test me out before that. He wanted me to do an overnight stint before my actual afternoon show. First of all, this was totally demeaning. They had hired me away with big bucks from a major market and now they were treating me as if I was a college kid doing an audition. But what was worse, Metheny and Fior Avanti kept telling me that I should develop characters for my show, just the way, Mr. Imus, had. They sat me down every day and forced me to listen to tapes of Imus's show while they cooed how brilliant and creative Mr. Imus was. It was amazing the way everyone at that station was kissing Imus's ass. And he was doing a lame, tame show with characters that were older than me. He had his reverend Hodges bits, and this stupid Moby Worm routine which was just his voice put through a synthesizer. The whole bit was that Moby Worm was coming to eat your high school. So he'd warn you a hundred times, coming up next hour, Moby Worm is gonna eat Rockle Center High, and then they finally did the bit and they played a few sound effects and Moby Worm at your school. No real conversation, nothing innovative, just the same stupid bits over and over. Lazy radio. If I had my preference, I would have come to New York, gone on in the morning and just beaten the crap out of him. I didn't get it. But, Mr. Imus, the genius, did characters, so. They wanted me to create characters for my show. I told them a hundred times that I don't do characters. I'm me on my show. But they wouldn't relent. They got me so crazy with this character stuff that I decided I'd give them a character for that first overnight. As a matter of fact, I did the entire show in character. I was Lance Election, a hairdresser who was getting his big break in radio, and Lance was joined on the show that night by his life mate, Bob, who was played by Fred. We were two over-the-top gay guys, thrilled to be on the air. Now you have to remember NBC at that time had a top 40 format. So while I was Lance, the prancing gay guy, I was also doing a parody of the typical top 40 guys who would do these inane intros to a record right up until the lyrics kicked in. There I was in my falsetto voice, commenting on Andy Gibbs' voice, how does she get up so high, what does she do? Is it the tight leather pants or, or what? I just got a note from the program director, it says, always say W in BC W in BC. Oh, that was another thing. The program director, Kevin, whom I started calling Pig Virus because he reminded me of a kid I knew in camp who looked like a stupid porker would always make me practice saying the call letters. He would come into my office and lie on the floor and make me repeat again and again, WBC. This pig virus would just lie there and shake his head and say, Nope, that's not it. Do it again. You're not doing it like Mr. Imus does it. I wanted to kill that creep, but I later realized that he was just a pawn in this whole game. The NBC brass were putting heavy pressure on him to get me in line and he was just doing his job but I resented the way he did it with such viciousness. I could never forgive him. So that whole first night I kept moaning, W in BC, almost like I was coming. Around one in the morning, Fred came up and I put him on the air. Lance election here at W in BC. I'm here with my friend Bob who just dropped in because when you work here at W in BC, excuse me, it's not W in BC, it's W in BC. When you work here late at night your friends can drop in and the program manager never knows the difference. 
I'm so glad it's getting late here at WNBC because I just spoke to the program director of the station and he's going to bed now and we're really going to have some fun as soon as all the network brass and my program. Director go to sleep. I'm going to gargle to all the songs here at WNBC. The fun begins when the brass goes to sleep. I love it, WNBC. It's kinda dry in the studio, don't you think? Bob said. It is dry, Bob. That's why I'm going to do the gargling thing now. At WNBC they give you a pitcher of water for the DJS. That's so nice. Let's play the next song, and I'm going to gargle over it. Fred queued up, don't you want me, by the Human League and I gargled through the song. I gargled the whole song. Pretty funny bit. My tonsils are killing me from this stupid station, you have to keep talking the whole time. And it's so dry in here. Would you like a neck massage? Bob asked. Give me a neck massage. Bob's going to give me a neck message. This is the first time I've ever been on the air anywhere. This is sort of an unbelievable story for me. From hairdressing school right to the studio. WNBC is the most liberal network in the whole world. Is it marvelous? Only in America. God bless America. God bless WNBC. We went on like that all night. And the reaction was incredible. The switchboard operators at WNBC were so flooded with calls that at one point they actually called upstairs to find out if there was something wrong. They said they never got a response like that before. I was thrilled. We came in the next day and pig virus was beat red. He said, in that slammy southern accent of his, you ruined us. Do you know how many phone calls we got? But you guys want characters. I protested, I did it in character. He brought me in front of five other empty suits sitting on a couch, the board of censors, and started telling me what I couldn't do. I was flipping out, because these guys didn't get it at all. They should have been thrilled with the reaction they got. All of a sudden, I was having a flashback to DC 101. I hadn't even started my show yet and these guys were trying to kill me. That was the way it was for the next three years. Except for one guy, Randy Bongarten. He came in as general manager and understood what I was doing. These morons had no clue whatsoever and tried to kill my show from day one. Meanwhile, I was desperately trying to reunite my team. I kept nagging and nagging them to bring Robin in from Baltimore. They wouldn't do it. Divide and conquer, right? So I started doing my show, in this incredibly restrictive format and I was on the air a little more than a month and, bingo, I was suspended. Again, it was God that got me in trouble. I was dying to do bits on my show but these guys thought the comedy was distracting from the real value of the show, the Trini Lopez and Neil Diamond records I was spinning. But I was able to squeeze in a bit or two an hour between all the music and the WNBC bullshit. I figured if they wanted characters, I'd give them characters. So I put God back on the air. Okay, now it's time for me to unveil another God video game. You've heard of Donkey Kong, haven't you? Now, are you ready for this? Virgin Mary Kong. Oh, my God, are you crazy? I said. The object of the game is Virgin Mary is being chased by all these guys in Jerusalem Singles Bar. You have to keep her away from those guys or she won't be the Virgin Mary anymore, if you get my meaning. At the end of the bit the virgin mother was impregnated by some dude who pushed her up against the wall of a singles bar. Anyway, I thought it was a great skit. I had no idea they'd suspend me for something like that. I was shocked by their reaction. Maybe that's why they call me a shock jock, I am always genuinely shocked by people's reactions to what I do. But the suspension was a blessing in disguise. I went to Pig Virus and Fiora Avanti and told them that I did that bit because Robin wasn't there. She was the one who made sure I didn't do stuff like that. Of course, it was all bullshit. Robin didn't rein me in. Robin's whole thing was after I did something outrageous on the air, she'd go, oh, Howard, that's terrible. But they thought bringing Robin in would keep me in line. What was really happening was we were about to go to war and I wanted more troops. I'll never forget Robin's introduction to Pig Virus. Her first day at the station, she was just sitting in the studio, getting familiarized. I went on the air, and I was rapping and we were about to go into 
some music and then we heard this loud thud coming from the other engineer's booth. It was really dark in the engineer's booth, so we couldn't see what was happening. But Robin turned to me and said, what's that? Oh, I think Kevin just threw the phone at the wall, I said nonchalantly. What? Robin was incredulous. Yeah, he does that. I must have broken format. For the next three hours, she stayed in the studio, sitting there a little shell-shocked. She was afraid to even go to the bathroom because she might get hit by a flying object. Finally Robin turned to me and said, what the hell have you gotten me into? I told you it wouldn't be easy. I smiled and put my headphones on. Pig virus made my life miserable every day for the next year. He sounded and acted like a real rube tourist with his southern accent. I pay $1,200 a month for rent for a studio apartment. Ain't it something? But I love it. I love it. I ate at Mr. Chow's the other day with Mr. Emmas. We doggy, Jethro. This guy was supervising my creative talent. After Virgin Mary Gong, I had to get every bit approved by committee before it could go on the air. Big Virus would yell at me because the scripts weren't typed. He'd yell if the bits went longer than two minutes. He'd say real encouraging things like, if the people don't like you, and if you only talk for two minutes before they can get so disgusted, you'll be back into music. Nice, huh? But what was worse was that he would memo me all these idiotic rules and ideas he had. And it wasn't just to me, he would CC everybody at the whole damn station, including accountants and security guards. This man was trying to publicly humiliate me, to break me and make me quit. It took every ounce of strength I had to keep from doing that. I got so paranoid, I forgot I was funny. It was like water torture in Vietnam. You begin to think you're an animal and the VCR gods. I was walking around a station full of untalented people who thought they were more talented than I was. Robin and I decided that Imus must have made a pact with the devil so that he didn't have to be funny but could still get ratings. You have to read some of these memos Pig Virus sent. He came up with this complicated terminology to make it sound as if he knew something, but it was all mystification. Any idiot could go into radio. But he knew the vocabulary. You did say NBC which is not the call sign, and it is not the primary identity of the radio station. As we have discussed before, WNBC is the primary ID, and that which should be stated first. In a, double cell, set, that is, a break, in a sweep, or on either side of a stop set, in which you have the opportunity to ID the station more than once, you may use WNBC twice or WNBC and NBC once each. But in a break where you only ID the station once use, WNBC. I would look at Fred and say, what the hell is he talking about? This was just a lot of bullshit trying to make a simple job look complicated. There's more. Jingles, please refrain from singing along with jingles, and play them per schedule. No more jingle things, no more playing of other jocks jingles. In other words, don't have fun. Don't let the listeners think you might be having fun. God forbid, they might think the show is funny. Clearly I had a different point of view. I was breaking all the rules and it was his job to control me. I was his nightmare. Bit placement, one bit per break is the maximum. Consider the Moroblant live spot say, bit, which will preclude another bit in the same break. Great, now he was telling me, and the janitor who got CC'd, that doing a fun commercial was the same as doing a comedy routine. According to his calculations, I could do three two-minute bits an hour, and that was my show. The staff, I'd appreciate it if you'd discontinue making deprecating remarks regarding the other talent's capabilities, styles, and performances. Again, no kidding around here. This was a serious comedy program. Music, discontinue making derogatory remarks about the music you play. God forbid I should make fun of Olivia Newton-John. In general, there's not a lot positive in this particular memo because I feel it's time to start moving forward again with the project of making the Howard's Turn show sound like an organic part of WNBC radio. So, yes, on balance I am pleased. Yes, WNBC does continue to have a strong commitment to personality radio, to Howard's Turn. Yes, I acknowledge and appreciate your efforts to date. And now there's still a lot of ground to cover. Is it any wonder that I would want to slit my wrists? But it wasn't just memos. 
Big Virus was actually monitoring my show. He installed a dump bell that worked from a hotline in his office. Whenever he didn't like what I was doing, whether it was what I was saying or a bit that it was running over his cherished two-minute time limit, he'd pick up the phone. That would light up a light and ring a bell in the engineer's booth, and the engineer then had to immediately go to a commercial or a jingle with no explanation. Can you imagine if you're listening and all of a sudden a bit is interrupted by a jingle? You'd think these guys were total amateurs. Then to top it off, he sent a memo about this to the engineer and cc'd the whole world. Subject, Remote Dump Procedure During Howard's turns air shift, at all times, there should be loaded a basic jingle, and a record. If the dump bell slash button goes off, instantly dump, close all mics, fire the jingle and record immediately. Do not pick up the phone and check, do not advise Howard over the talk back to get out of the bit, simply dump programming and roll the jingle and record. Pig Virus was single-handedly ruining my show. He took away my ability to talk for any duration. He took away any control over my show with this dump button bullshit. Then, to add insult to injury, he sent around another memo. Subject, non-after talent. A reminder that only currently active after members may speak on WNBC radio, and only via prior arrangement with the program director. This precludes regular appearances of friends of the family engineers, and any others not officially in WNBC's full-time or past-time employ for the express purpose of appearing on our air. There went the rest of my show. I couldn't call Alison or my mother. I couldn't talk on the air with the engineers or the cleaning lady or the security guards. Pig Virus had issued his edict. I was fucked. My show was like nothing anyone was doing and they were trying to make me sound like everyone else. Besides all this, Robin told me that Pig Virus tried to undermine our relationship. He called Robin into his office and, out of nowhere, he told her that he didn't have any money to give her because, Howard has taken it all. Luckily, Robin is an intelligent woman who didn't fall for that. But it was so demeaning to have any contact with him. He got a few of the interns to cut out pictures of happy, smiling families from magazines and paste them into a collage which he hung in the studio to remind me of the target audience of the station. I can imagine how the other jocks were laughing their asses off at me every time they saw this work of art hanging there. One of the people who was really supportive during those years was comedian David Brenner. Brenner would come in and do the show from time to time. He truly admired my style, David. These assholes are attempting to squelch all my creativity and train me to be a boring fuck like a mass. We'd have these discussions during commercials and David could tell I was at my wits end, who's in charge of the station? He said, Dom Fi or Avanti. With that, David marched into Fi or Avanti's office. He was in there for ten minutes yelling at him about how he had a genius at work and they should get off my fucking ass. This was a pretty spectacular gesture and I loved him for it. As bad as it was to go to work every day, I somehow knew that, eventually, they would all be worn out dealing with me, just like my parents when I wanted my own way. A drop in the bucket every day, get away with a bit one day, and then maybe get suspended the next. But in due time, I would get things my way. Big Virus just had no clue where I was coming from. Neither did my general manager. One of the worst things they ever did was have me co-host the Easter Seals telethon. I had been at the station a few months and they decided that I needed a good guy image, so they arranged for me to do the telethon. I was trying to be a team player. So I went along. I got dressed up in a ducks. But this isn't my scene. You can't be funny talking about crippled kids. I didn't know what the fuck to say. I was on for about seven hours and by the end of my slot I was grazed. I was saying stuff like, I'm gonna be a father in early NBC. I was broadcasting from listeners' homes. Here I even talked with a guy in his home who was bathing in a tub of red yellow. Two weeks and I've been going shopping for baby furniture and it's expensive. But what if I should have to go shopping for a wheelchair? Or an artificial limb? That's really expensive. By the end of the night, I was sitting in a wheelchair, doing my pitch, I'm about to fall asleep and this wheelchair is pretty comfortable. But at least I can get out of it. So many kids can't. The whole thing was a total nightmare. Even the engineers humiliated me at NBC. I'll never forget one engineer. 
This jerk was so busy filing union grievances that we could never get him to do anything for the show. It was hell. But this guy had plenty of time to walk around the halls of NBC when the ratings came out like he was a fifth grade teacher giving out grades. Let's see how everyone did, he'd shout, Howard's turn show, uh oh. This was our art, the stuff we lived and died for, and some arsehole engineer was walking around with a ratings book, evaluating us. It was amazing we survived. That's why Robin and I ballooned up in weight again. Every night on the way home on the subway. Oh, I forgot about the subway. Those bastards made us take the subway. They wouldn't even give us a damn car to use. I was begging them to help us out because we were making personal appearances after each show. After a while, when we were getting well known, we had to deny we were those people on the radio. Meanwhile, Vodka Brethimus had a 24-hour company paid limo. Robin said he was the only guy who looked as if he was being limoed to a park bench. Getting back to the subway, every night on our way home, we'd devise ways to torture management, to keep our sanity. Robin's boss in the news department was this woman Meredith, and all I'd have to say is, how are you gonna do it tonight, Robin? And she was off. I'm gonna hook Meredith up to a wall and take some five-inch spike heel shoes and invert her nipples with them. One day we were on the air and I could see that Meredith had fucked with Robin in some way. I started talking to Robin and soon I got her saying that she wanted to do a Big Ben test on Meredith. She wanted to take the Big Ben and put it in a rifle and shoot it through Meredith's head and then use her whole head to write, Big. We went off the air and we heard these footsteps rushing down the hall and Robin looked at me as if she was about to be fired. The door was thrown open and it was Pig Virus and he looked at Robin and said, God, I wish I could say that. Meanwhile, life struggled on at NBC. I got suspended again for a skit Fred and I did called Das Love Boot. It was a high concept bit. Doc Mengel was running the love boat and he was experimenting on the passengers. Seasickness, Mrs. Cohen? Come down to the infirmary and I will remove your ovaries. Eartha Kitt was the rotating guest star on that episode and Doc Mengel got to mate her with a black Angus bull for his latest genetic experiment. But basically we were working on one cylinder. Pig virus would always be butting in, presiding over the content of our show. When Princess Grace died, her body was still warm and Piggy was running in, forbidding us to talk about her. In fact, the only fun I was having at all professionally was on television. Judy Licht and Doug Johnson were hosting a local talk show called, Good Morning, New York, and they were about to be cancelled when I made my first appearance on the show. It was actually supposed to be a joint appearance but Doug informed everybody that Imus couldn't make it because of the snow. What kind of snow are we talking about? I wondered, a sly allusion to Imus's coke habit. I then proceeded to do a magic trick in which I handcuffed Judy in a most revealing bondage pose and then threw a blanket over her and tried to remove the handcuffs by Esp. Of course, I couldn't, so I just left her on the floor, cuffed. But the best part was yet to come. They mentioned that the show had been cancelled and they were going to be off the air soon. Hey, if this was my show and they cancelled, I'd bust up the set, I said, and I started knocking all the furniture over. The audience went wild. They loved that bit so much that they asked me to come back in three weeks for their last show. That time, I showed up in a hard hat and I backed a huge pickup truck onto the set and with the help of four hard hats, we actually packed up all the furniture and carted it off. The whole time these guys were lugging the furniture away, I was chopping the set to smithereens with an axe. But the funny thing was, even though the jerks at NBC had emasculated my show, we were still getting ratings. We were really beginning to show some numbers. Then Fiora Vanti left the station and NBC brought in Randy Bongarten as the new general manager. Randy was my savior. The NBC radio softball team, playing before a Mets game at Shee. I hated softball but this was one of those mandatory radio promotions I had to do to prove I was a team player. Randy was young, hip, and a keen judge of talent. He had to be, he thought I was great. He basically let me do my show and that meant trashing the format, playing a lot fewer records, and recreating the ambience I had started in Washington. By now we had added Jackie, the joke man, Martling and Al Rosenberg as writers and we hired Gary Delabate as our boy producer. We were ready to roll. 
Jackie was a Long Island comic who had sent me a few of his homemade albums. I liked what I heard and I envisioned him as the perfect good time party guy to hang out in our studio. When I brought him in, he proved to be an exceptional talent and collaborator. While we never hung out together outside the show, we had a magical meeting of the minds when we wrote the radio show. It was the same magic I felt with Robin and Fred. I knew we belonged together. Throughout my career there have been managers who've tried to get me to abandon these people I work with, but each of them is just as important to the show as I am, and no one will break us up. A major indication of the change in atmosphere was the way we dealt with Randy. I had bitched on the air about pig virus from the start. But now Randy got management off my back and allowed me to go crazy. I began to call his wife, Fran, and she became a semi-regular in our cast of characters. Whenever Randy gave us any kind of trouble at all, I'd call Fran on the air and beg her to give Randy some sex so he'd be in a better mood. In fact, sex loomed larger and larger as a topic of our show. We even instituted a feature called Sexual Innuendo Wednesday in which we asked women to call in with their stories about sexual harassment, child abuse, or rape. These women would call in and say, well, my coach took me down to the locker room. And I'd say, whoa. Slow it down, slow it down. What were you wearing? All in the interest of public service, of course. We began our great tradition of Christmas parties around then. Whoever wanted to come had to apply over the phone and had to promise to do something weird to be invited. For a guy, it would be something like belching out Christmas carols. For a girl, getting naked would do just fine. On the day of the party, girls were running around topless. Couples were making out in the corner. It was wild. Anything that came to mind, we tried. One time I had to take a piss during commercials but I was afraid to go because if there are other men in the bathroom, sometimes I get intimidated and it takes me longer to pee. I started talking about that on the air and my engineer told me about his bathroom habits and one thing led to another and he challenged me to a race to see who could take the fastest whiz. We got a wireless mic and our first bathroom Olympics were born. By the time we were through milking that bit, we had listeners calling in vying for prizes if they could guess the closest time. The bathroom Olympics evolved into the mystery whiz, in which callers had to guess who was peeing from the sound of the urination alone. This was a bit much, even for Randy, but when he complained, I found out that his wife had ratted me out, so I called Fran on the air and let her have it. Radio was suddenly fun again. When the infamous Vanessa Williams penthouse lesbo spread came out, I got an advance copy. And I rerouted the NBC studio tour into the studio, then I sold beaks at the pictorial to the tourists for five bucks a shot. We did so well that we decided to hold our own tour. We charged listeners a flat forty bucks to come into the studio, then we socked them for additional money depending on what they wanted to do. If they wanted to read the news, that was another thirty. It was 15 to intro a record. We even had Gary go down to the NBC commissary and buy some food and resell it for double the price to the tour. We made over $600 on one tour alone. Randy also encouraged me to do more television appearances. They booked me on, Donahue, but it was as one of a panel of controversial disc jockeys and the topic was totally lame. Donahue was bitching and moaning about the controversial lyrics of rock and I told him that I had no idea why the hell he had radio personalities there to answer these charges since we didn't write the lyrics, we didn't pick the records to play, and we didn't particularly like playing any records. But my best exposure was when I did the Letterman show. Dave was working in the same building as we were and he was a big fan of my show. He was the first guy, except for that other television genius, Petey Green to have me on as a guest in my own right, not as one of an assemblage of, wacky disc jockeys. And I killed. I broke all the rules of those late night talk shows. I touched Dave's hair. I talked about the pre-interview. I bitched about both my radio management and his show's producers. And they loved it. Suddenly every show wanted me as a guest and not me with nine other DJs. Howard Stern revised. Our next guest is the number one morning radio personality in New York and Philadelphia. This summer he will be seen in four one-hour television specials. Please welcome back to this program the always lovely, the always talented Howard Stern. We were on a roll. Our ratings were going through the roof. 
even Emma started coming around and dropping in on my show. If he wasn't there physically, he would make sure to call in. That was pretty weird since when we first got to NBC, nobody from Emma's show would even deign to talk to any of us. But when some of my bits started showing up on Emma's morning show, I realized why he was suddenly my new best friend. He was stealing my act. Suddenly, he was opening the mic, allowing guests to come in, breaking format. But he was so bad at it, it was laughable. He was very threatened by what we were doing. He had to change. It got so bad that Emma started calling up my mother on the air. But she knew how to get rid of him. She told him that he didn't want her for a mother because that would make us brothers. Things were almost too good to be true at NBC. In fact, things got so good that Randy got a nice promotion to president of the radio division. To fill his vacated post they brought in a young, clean-cut new general manager from San Francisco. His name was John Hayes. Soon I would know him as the Incubus. From the minute Hayes got to NBC, it seemed as if he had one goal in mind, to get his highest rated, biggest revenue producing, most creative on-air radio personality fired. We knew we were back in battle mode Hayes's first day when Robin bumped into him after our show was over. She made an offhand comment about how funny the show had been that day and Hayes gave her a look as if he wanted to vomit. But I had learned my lessons in my struggles with pig virus. The best defense is a good offense. I was all over the incubus from day one. In fact, even before day one. When we heard that Hayes had been hired, I dialed his station in San Francisco. I'm not even having lunch with him. If this guy comes on the air, I'm gonna lay it on him. For all you people out there, this is the way to deal with management. Someone answered. Is John there? This is Howard's turn and tell him to hurry. I don't have a lot of time. I got his secretary reeling, Robin. He's under the impression he's my boss. Carpe de tutti carpe. Who the hell does he think he is? Mr. Boss Man with his newfangled ideas. You should hear the DJ on the air now. They had me on hold. Way too long, I thought. You should hang up on him when he comes to the phone for making you wait, Robin said. Hayes got on. Hello, is this John Hayes? This is Howard's turn. You kept me waiting. I understand you were busy. Well, you don't keep me waiting. I slammed the phone down, that'll teach him, I crowed. I called him back a few days later. He was out but I left explicit instructions with his secretary. I wouldn't have lunch with him. I wouldn't meet his wife. I didn't do remotes. I didn't go to shopping centers, circuses, or dopey animal hospitals. He couldn't bring any of his stupid friends into the studio when I was working. He had to meet with my agent before he could even meet with me. All my material was copyrighted and he was not allowed into my writing meetings. He had no say over anything I did. And if I wanted to, I would belch on the air. That should set him straight, I thought. I made his secretary read back my message and hung up. Hayes finally got to the station on October 1, 1984.1 met with him briefly that day and then went on the air and reported on the meeting. I spent two minutes with him, I told Robin and the world, I don't have time to sit in meetings with the GM. He started in, it's great to be here. I'm going, oh, man, what a douchebag. Of course it's great, he wouldn't have come here otherwise. He seems to not have any ideas, which is great. He was respectful and kind of timid. It's great when they shake in their boots. I think he's a pushover. I think this show is gonna get dirty as hell. Well, I was wrong. Not about the show getting dirty. Hayes did have ideas, even if they were all lame. His major idea was to bring Soupy Sales to the station as the personality between Amos and me. Now, as a kid I idolized Soupy. I thought it was brilliant when he told a kid who called his show to go through his parents' pockets and sent him all the pieces of paper with the president's pictures on them. But I was now the personality. I deserved the perks. But no. They were still treating me like a child. Soupy came into the station as if he was a conquering god. Right off the bat, Hayes gave Soupy a limo while Robin and Fred and I had to squeeze into a fugazi fleet car every night and hear the driver bitch about how he wasn't getting paid. Hayes had a real investment in Soupy doing well, Soupy was his idea.
Supi even had Hayes bring a grand piano into the studio and hired a pianist to accompany Supi on his show. Whatever Supi wanted, Supi got. And I was jealous. So, of course, I got on him unmercifully. Supi and his crew were always leaving food debris around and stinking up the place for when I came in. One day they spilled some salad dressing on the floor. I decided to make a bit out of it so I called them on the air and told Supi if his producer wasn't in the studio. In two minutes cleaning up their mess, I was gonna cut his fucking piano wires. Fred went out and got some wire cutters and sure enough, the deadline passed and I started snapping away. I think I had about four notes out before they finally cleaned up the mess. After that, Supi stopped talking to me. NBC's dream team, left to right, Supi sales. That is it Don Imus, me, and Wolfman Jack. After a few months, my relationship with Hayes deteriorated totally. He was fucking with my show just like pig virus and I was fucking with his head every day on the air. I would rant and rave about Hayes being some punk kid who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, whose father gave him everything, whose wife was smarter than he was. He would sit in his office listening to this, seething. After nine months of this, things came to a head when we actually got into a fight on the air. I don't even remember what specifically caused the fight. I had met earlier with Hayes and he was insistent that I not talk on the air about what we discussed. But you know me, when someone tells me not to say something, I've got to say it. So I called his office to get him to talk about our earlier meeting. Could you put that idiot on the phone with me? I asked his secretary. No, I can't, Howard. He's in a meeting, she said. He's always in a meeting. What can I tell you? He's an executive. Who's he in a meeting with? Very important people. Who? I can't divulge that. Tell him to put down that magazine and zip up, Fred yelled in the background. I hear him talking, I said. I have the radio on. That's how I know what you're doing, his secretary said. That's how the incubus knows all. Poke your head in and say I want to speak to him on the radio now? That supersedes anything he could be doing, I asserted. She wouldn't comply with my wishes. I sent Gary back and he reported that Hayes's door was closed and his privacy sign was up. I sent Big Al Rosenberg and Gary back to bang on the door, all the while forcing the secretary to stay on the phone so we would be broadcasting all this. The incubus is back there talking to his father, the devil. I mused as we waited for Gary and Al to get back there. Rosenberg banged on the door and Hayes opened it, told them to go away, and slammed it shut. He's too busy planning a bumper sticker promotion. He's an idiot. He's a big moron, I ranted. I told you he was in a meeting, his secretary crowed. Scum, I cursed. He came out all authoritative, Gary reported, he said, this isn't funny. What's funny? Soupy? I smirked. I decided to go back there myself, get on the telephone, and yell at John. Who can he be in a meeting with? I mused, maybe he's giving the program director hot beef injections. I made my way towards his office. This could be it, Robin prophesied, either he'll resort to physical violence or he'll freak out. I got on the phone to Robin. I'm back here. First I'll yell. I won't bang on the door. He's got his privacy, please thing up. John. John. Hayes came to the door. I got him, I exulted. Another monument to radio, he said. Hey, nobody's in here with him, I noticed. He's just working. Hey, John, come on the air with us. This is great radio, Howard. Boy, what a bit, Hayes sneered. What are you working on, man? How come you can't talk to us? I was petulant. Because I'm working. On what? I'm not telling. He started closing the door on me. You idiots come. Don't talk that way to me, I shouted, idiot, you work for me. I told him off, ha, huh, Robin? He's really mad. He looked like he was gonna cry. He's got papers on his desk. He was doing budget stuff. He was seething. You should have seen the look on his face. Now he's not even coming out. Come out and talk to me. He's a baby. He's an idiot. Oh, here he is. He had come out again and he was pissed. But, 
Hey, this was great radio. And it was going to get better pretty quick. Howard, go back and do your show. You can't take it, can't take it, I taunted him. Howard, this isn't fun, Hey snapped. It's fun for us, Robin piped in, I love it when you squirm. I'm not squirming. I'm not even having fun. While Gary diverted his attention, I rushed into his office and looked at the papers on his desk. Hayes had a desk full of papers that detailed everyone's salaries. I started yelling that I could see a Mussy's and Soupy's ridiculously inflated salaries. Hey, Howard, get out of there, Hayes yelled. He freaked out and started pushing me out of his office. Actually shoving me forcefully and with bad intent. I couldn't believe it. I was doing a bit but he was dead serious. I went back to the studio. What a goofy guy to get upset like that. He doesn't understand me or my sense of humor. My audience loved that. He was all red and he was pushing me. Could you tell how angry he was on the phone? He hates us. He doesn't understand why it's funny when the Marx Brothers screw around with Margaret Dumont because he is Margaret Dumont. He dropped the phone, he was wrestling with me. He's an idiot. I can't deal with him. This was really war. Fred and I went into the studio and made a promo that we started running on my show. Your friend Howard's turn is in trouble and he needs your help. Here are the facts. Item 1, Howard's turn has the biggest ratings at WNBC. Item 2, John Hayes, the general manager of NBC, was born with a silver spoon in his little mouth. Item 3, how can a little rich boy possibly understand this radio show? Item 4, John Hayes wants to radically change the Howard's Turn show. That's right, change the Howard's Turn show. Item 5, would an intelligent, caring general manager tamper with success? What can you do to help? Be a part of a grassroots movement to fire John Hayes. Here's an officer from the 106th precinct. Officer, hey, John Hayes, know what I want to do? Tie him down and poke him with a sharp stick. No, no, don't do that. Let's get him fired. Here's a Manhattan art dealer. Art dealer, I want to take him up to Rockland County, fit him with a leather mask, you know, the one with the zipper and chase him naked up and down a hillside throwing walnuts at his anus. Good idea, but that's not what we're going for. The best thing to do is tell all your friends about the show. And with the biggest audience in hand, we'll vanquish the demon John Hayes. Here now is Kosama von below. Kosama, hey, if John doesn't knock this off, I'll tell my join millions of New Yorkers in an effort to drive John Hayes out of the radio station. And remember, never approach John Hayes in the evening when his powers are the strongest. We were really going wild. We were attacking management, we were dealing with sex and bodily functions and every known radio taboo. I was pretty out of control but I didn't care. I just wanted to do great radio. I've always felt you can't back down after a certain point. Randy Bongarten tried to give me a little message one evening when he insisted I let him drive me home to Long Island. As soon as the car got out of the parking garage he began to work on me. Your ratings are great, Howard. But I'm telling you, back off a little. You're doing very strong material. And the powers that be don't like it, he said. Be direct, man, I said, who doesn't like what I'm doing? We'll go sit down with them and explain the jokes to them. I'm trying to revolutionize radio. I was on a high horse, but I was serious. I wasn't going to back down. I was too fucking popular. I didn't even know how to hold back. I didn't know what Randy was driving at and, frankly, I didn't care to know. A couple of weeks later, I got on the air and announced my greatest dial-A date ever. I was going to do bestiality dial-A date. I was fantasizing on the air about how I was going to set up a listener with an animal. That night, Randy came over to me when I finished the show. It was time for another ride home. What are you going to do on the bestiality dial a date? He asked. I don't even really know what I'm going to do. I was getting into a thing on the air. I've done lesbians. Triplets. I've done it all. Just don't do the bestiality dial a date, he said. Are these guys thinking we're going to fuck a dog? 
What are you talking about? I said. It was obvious he wasn't understanding. We were still fucking with Hayes, too. He called us into his office for a meeting and he was talking his usual shit about how we had to clean up our act so he could get better, more prestigious advertisers on the show, and Robin and I looked at each other and just got up and walked out of his office in the middle of a sentence. As we were walking down the hall, Robin looked at me and said, are you sure we haven't gotten a little crazy here? We just walked out of the general manager's office while he was in the middle of a sentence. What are they gonna do to us, Robin? I shrugged, fire us. Meanwhile, I was out of control on the air. New York was in the middle of that stupid Statue of Liberty 200th anniversary and Robin was reading a news story about how Lee Iacocca had raised $200 million for the statue's restoration but he needed to raise another $200 mil. What do they need all that money for? I wondered, what are they gonna buy her, a bronze tampon? They gonna get 50,000 gallons of copper so she can douche? Here I was the number one radio entertainer in the world. I was invincible. Everyone wanted me. And no one could touch me. I don't know, call me naive, but I thought I could just go on and entertain my millions and millions of listeners at NBC as long as they were happy and still tuning in and the network was making millions and millions each year selling my ad time. Well, I was wrong. The bastards were going to fire me. Except God intervened in the form of a major hurricane. On September 27, 1985, New Yorker woke to howling winds and torrential rainfall. Most New Yorkers took the day off, but I called Robin and Fred, and we decided to go in and brave the storm. It never occurred to me to stay home that day. Dale Parsons, my program director, called to beg me to stay home. The truth was Dale was told by NBC management to make sure I didn't go to work because I was supposed to be fired that day. It was a Friday and this way the Saturday newspapers would carry the story and it would be forgotten by Monday. None of the execs were available to fire me that day because the storm kept them home. They just figured I wouldn't come in. I came in and did one of the most vicious shows ever. Ironically, I even predicted my own firing. The show was going fine until I heard that Soupy had announced on his program a few days earlier that he had just signed to do a syndicated version of his show on the NBC network. I became livid. For years I had been trying to get my show syndicated on the network. I had been promised that they were working on it, but it was all hot air. And now Soupy got to do his show nationally. I totally freaked on the air. I refused to believe it until I got confirmation from my bosses. The problem was, they weren't at work, they were all hunkered down in their suburban homes waiting for the hurricane to blow over. I frantically tried to call Randy at home but I couldn't get through. I reached Hayes and I put him on the air and he denied knowing anything about it. His denials sounded hollow. All the while I was ranting on the air that if this information was true, that was it, I was quitting NBC. Now here I was embarrassing all the execs by throwing them on the air, and they were freaking out because I shouldn't even have been on the air. They had promised Grant Dinker, the president of NBC, that I would be fired. I threw open the phone lines. All my listeners called in and said they'd hate to see me go but they'd understand. Putting Soupy on national was too much of a humiliation for anyone to take. It was nearing time for my shift to end. Jack Spector had already come into the studio to prepare for his show. I took one last phone call. It was the guy we set up for the bestiality dial a date. Howard, this is your dog lover dial a date. No one called me yet, he complained. It might take a month or two, I said. By the way, I heard Soupy talking about the show, too. You really not coming in Monday? I'm not sure how the scenario will play out. We have three offers from other stations. There's a lot to consider, I said. By the way, I hope your bathroom has towels in it. It didn't when I was there. I had to wipe my hands on my pants, he complained. Here's a guy who made love to a dog worrying about wiping his hands on his pants. I don't see how that would disturb you. It was a clean dog, he said. That was the last call I ever took at NBC. I went home that night bummed out. Over the weekend, I went jogging and tripped over some of the tree debris from the hurricane. So on Monday morning I reported for work on grudges. Robin and
I was supposed to have had a big meeting on Friday but since the top brass couldn't make it in, they had rescheduled it for Monday before we went on the air. We were to meet at 12.30, but I didn't arrive at NBC till 12.45. Fuck them and their meetings. John Hayes met me in the hall and escorted me to an elevator, Randy wants to see you alone. He smiled and put his arm around me like the priest who visits death row. Little did I know that Hayes had been given orders to make sure I got on that elevator. Hayes couldn't wait to get me on that elevator because it was his job to fire Robin while I was upstairs being fired. I hobbled into Randy's office. Sit down, Randy said. I sat. I'm going to have to put an end to the show, Randy said soberly. I figured he meant the syndicated show. So they were right, Soupy was going to get his show syndicated. Okay, I said, getting up, I gotta go to work. No, I mean the afternoon show. Okay, I said again, and started for the door. I was in shock. Do you want to sit down? Randy said. I said, no. If I'm fired, I'm leaving. I have no reason to be here. I hobbled downstairs to my office and called my agent, Don Butchwild. Within minutes, Butchwild strolled into the office with a cold bottle of champagne in hand, singing, Happy Days Are Here Again. Robin, who had just been fired by the incubus himself, looked warily at Don. But Don was thrilled. He was certain we'd be back on the air shortly, making a lot more money. Statement for Cause Re, Howard's turn. The Howard Stem program has been taken off the air at WNBC. The reason for this move, as explained in the statement broadcast, is that conceptual differences exist between Howard Stern and WNBC regarding the program. If you wish to state an opinion we ask you to write to John Hayes, Vice President and General Manager WNBC 30 Rockefeller Plaza New York, New York 10,020 Thank you for your call. Guidelines. A. Be as polite as possible to all callers, this is very important. B. John Hayes is not accepting phone calls on this matter. Dash please write if you want. C. We will forward mail to Howard Stern and Robin Quivers. D. If caller becomes abusive, politely end their call by thanking them for their interest, then hang up. I sequestered myself in my inner office. Hayes came around and tried to see me but I wouldn't let him in. He sat in the outer office and talked to Robin. You know, my greatest fear is that you guys are going to go across the street and kick our butt, Hayes told Robin. He said that, but he didn't mean it. I know he really thought we were not employable. He also figured it would be a snap to replace us. Meanwhile, in place of us. They were playing music and periodically interrupting it with this pre-recorded message. Now, WNBC Vice President and General Manager John Hayes. WNBC issued the following press release this afternoon. As of today, Monday, September 30th, WNBC has cancelled the Howard Stern program because of conceptual differences that exist between Howard Stern and WNBC management as to the program. I encourage anyone willing to express an opinion about the cancellation of the Howard Stern program to write to me John Hayes. General Manager WNBC 30 Rockefeller Plaza New York, New York 10020 Your comments are welcome. While this announcement was being made, Robin and I were standing outside of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, surrounded by a few boxes containing all of my valuable tapes and bits waiting for an NBC car that would never come. We finally took a cab. Later that night, Fred and Gary penetrated NBC security, using a forged pass, and emptied the entire contents of my office into a U.S. Postal Service van that Baba Bui had borrowed from a friend. They started at midnight and took load after load out past an uninterested-looking security guard. Finally it was 3 a.m., and they had packed up the last load and were almost out the door when the guard spoke up. Hey, you two, the guard yelled. Fred and Baba Bui froze in their tracks. You know what time it is? We were home free. The next day, every paper blared the firing in its headlines. The New York Post ran a full front page picture of me and Allison and our first daughter. One camera crew accused me of staging a disc jockey hoax.
that afternoon, I hit each local news show and told my side of the story, which was that I had no idea why I was fired. Not one NBC executive would take credit either, but I had my theories. Front page of the New York Post The Unemployed at Home One theory, which later surfaced, was that Thornton Bradshaw, who was chairman of the board, was riding in his limousine and said to a friend, I think we own a NAM station here in New York. For the first time ever they tuned in, and heard me setting up the dude with a dog for bestiality dial a date. Bradshaw screamed, fire that guy immediately, and told Grant Tinker he'd better not hear me on the air again. I confronted Grant Dinker several years later on the air. I was at the Emmy Awards show and Dinker had just been given the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award. Here he was beaming, glowing, stepping into the press room to answer very respectable questions. I stood up screaming, Grant Dinker, why did you fire Howard Stern? Why? He wouldn't answer. Meanwhile, my agent, Don Butchweld, starting sorting out the various offers we had immediately received. There were a few good ones coming from Los Angeles. But there was no pressure to take anything. NBC had just renegotiated my contract and they still had to pay me for the next three years. NBC acknowledged this in their conversations with Butchwild and they also told him that if we went to a station in LA, they would pay us $50,000. You call them and tell them to shove their $50,000, I told Don, I will never go to LA. Tell them that I'm going to stay right. The first few days at K-Rock, knocking Imus off his perch. Here and destroy that radio station. I'll make it so bad for them that they'll have to sell that piece of shit station. I'm going to rob them of all their fucking ratings. If Howard Stern beats me I'll eat a dead dog's penis. Dash Don Imus. I was grazed. But I was right. A few weeks later, I signed with K-Rock to do afternoons. A few weeks after that. K-Rock asked me to switch to mornings so I could go head-to-head -head against Imus and destroy him. I said I would do it and I did. My ratings soared and I dragged shit stain down to a one share. NBC wound up selling the station for millions less than it was worth. Big Virus wound up in some station in the Midwest. The Incubus is back in San Francisco, humbled. Thornton Bradshaw, the former chairman of the board of NBC, is dead of a painful cerebral hemorrhage. Grant Dinker, the other moron who now publicly takes credit for firing me, hasn't had a hit TV show for years and will probably die a very painful death. Don't fuck with Stern. Spill it. Celebrity True Confessions Chapter 7 How do I get celebrities to talk? I keep the studio dimly lit and I try to keep them in there for hours. After a while, I just wear them down and then they forget they're on the radio. That's the secret. I can't stand bullshit. I never like doing typical interviews. When you're on the radio, you have 900 competitors, and there's no loyalty. Your audience will abandon you in two seconds. That's why I hate my audience. They're so damn fickle. You'd think they'd have some allegiance. Just because I'm having a bad day doesn't mean they should ruin my career. And just because a celebrity is going to come on doesn't mean he is just going to come on and plug. I want people working hard for me. And besides, I don't need guests on my show because I've proven that I can get ratings without them. You come on my show, you'd better perform. I'm busy telling everyone that I jerk off every night and stick fingers up my own ass, you'd better open up, too. Here's a bunch of celebrities I like because they're honest and can laugh at themselves. Sandy Corn. Penthouse Pet Runner-up Penthouse Pet of the Year Sandy is one of my favorite guests, great to look at and incredibly naive about simple world events. Her claim to fame on my show has been her remarkable inability to answer questions that any sixth grader would know. Sandy told me Penthouse Pets were smart and that she was practically valedictorian of her school. Sandy, what country did Saddam Hussein invade during the Gulf War? I asked. Fred played some Jeopardy music as Sandy contemplated. Ah. What is? Jerusalem? Sandy smiled. Who gave a shit if the answer was Kuwait, Sandy was wearing a skimpy bikini. The lump in my pants grew heavier and thicker as I thought about tying her up and eating her for an hour. While I talked about world events. 
What political party is President Bush a member of? I asked. I know he's either Republican or the other one. But I don't know. I would say Democrat. Close enough, I exulted. What is the capital of New York State? Albany. What does the FBI stand for? I don't know, I have no idea. Where is it located? It's everywhere. It was fascinating watching this mind at work. I decided to give her a hard one. What's in iced tea? Water, she said brightly. And? Tea. Sandy Corn being interrogated on the set of my TV show. We got such a great reaction to her quiz appearances that we decided to milk this thing for an entire segment on my TV show, the I couldn't get into college bowl. So we brought Sandy back and had her match her intellect against a girl in the seventh grade named Jessica and a man with the maturity of a seventh grader, Kenneth Keith Callenbach, a charter member of our work pack. Suffice it to say that the seventh grader wiped everybody out. Here's a breakdown of how Sandy did questions Sandy was able to answer correctly. 1. How many days in a year? 2. Name an even number. 3. What is a clarinet? 4. What is Bush's wife's name? 5. What does E.T. stand for? 6. Who was the first president? Question Sandy was unable to answer correctly. 1. What does ESP stand for? 2. What country did the United States declare independence from? 3. What substance do diamonds come from? 4. Who built the pyramids? 5. Who was the host of all the Twilight Zone? Sandy with Chuck Norris and Shadow Stevens on the set of $20 Pyramid. Of course, Sandy didn't do that badly compared to Kenneth Keith. He thought diamonds were a substance unto themselves and that Pete Rose was the host of all the Twilight Zone. To this day, Sandy maintains she is intelligent. In fact, she wants to reaffirm that right here. No matter where I go, everybody remembers that show. And it's weird because I am smart. I really am. But Howard asked me about the war and I was traveling around modeling so much I didn't keep track of things like that. I really could have sworn that we bombed Jerusalem because I have a friend who lives in Jerusalem and I am sure he told me Jerusalem was bombed. But Jerusalem, Iraq, it's all the same, anyway. I like Sandy a lot because of her honesty. She once revealed that Donald Trump came up to her apartment and got on top of her and kissed her and dry humped her. Trump denies it, but it's a good story, anyway. Sandy's most recent photo, she's totally changed her look. Howard's turn broke the mold. Dasha Dasna. Bob Hope. Three are two great things about having Bob Hope on my show. First, I never know if he understands half the questions I'm asking him. It seems as if he hears every other word. I've asked Bob Hope questions nobody else would ever dare to ask him and there's no way of telling if he's just avoiding answering them or he's too zoned out to understand. What about Martha Ray? Did she ever come on to you? I asked. Martha Ray? Oh, sure. We started together. But the two of you were never lovers? We started together at Paramount. Hey, are you glad Carson's packing it in? Yeech, Bob growled. To heck with Carson already. It's enough, I said. Yeah, I'm doing Carson Friday night. What about Anne Margaret? Oh, Anne Margaret. I heard you said I was the brightest talent you'd seen since Anne Margaret, I said. Isn't that something? He had absolutely no idea what I was saying. I don't know if he's on the same planet with the rest of us. But one thing he knows is how to promote whatever stupid NBC special he's got coming up. He called in to plug his new program and it was right after the L.A. riots. I tried to get him to comment on the riots but he wouldn't bite. I hate that looting. I said, I hope with all those TVs they still they watch your special. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying. Saturday night. But the one thing that Bob loved to talk about was the fact that he used to play golf with George Bush's father, Prescott Bush. Like clockwork, every time I interviewed him he'd say exactly the same thing. Do you know that George Bush's father's name is Prescott? Prescott Bush. I played golf with him and Eisenhower.
he was a senator from Connecticut. I don't even know if he remembered that he had told me that story 19 times before. So the last time I interviewed him I told Robin I would find a really creative way to make him tell me the story, Robin, I'll get Bob Hope to tell the Prescott Bush story without asking him about George Bush, watch me. I then called Hope and about 15 minutes into the conversation I asked Bob if he was going to remember me in his will. Are you gonna leave me anything in your will? I think so, Howard. You're considering it? Yes, sir. Seriously, how about remembering me, Howard's turn, in your will? You have so much money a few million would be like nothing. I'll think about that today. There would be no greater honor to me than if Bob Hope, in his will, left me five million dollars. That's nothing to you. Something like that. Think about it, I'm a good guy. We may cut down on the zeros. By the way, Bob, my middle name is Prescott. Howard Prescott's turn. Make sure you put it in your will just like that. Bob suddenly came alive, Prescott? Come on. Yeah, Prescott. Do you know that George Bush's father's name was Prescott? Prescott Bush. I played golf with him and Eisenhower. He was a senator from Connecticut. There you are. Patty Davis Reagan. Not only did Patty tell me that old Nancy, just say no, was zonked out half the time on Valium and that Patty had actually gotten banged in the White House, but she then spilled the bins about a threesome she had once participated in. She said she found it distracting, logistically, you had to sort of figure out who was gonna do what to whom, you know? I pressed her for details. She did it with her boyfriend and his best friend. They'd been doing reefer or drinking and they all wound up sleeping together. She slept in between. She thought that was cute, but she wasn't a three-input woman. All this talk was getting me crazy. I started to fantasize on the air about having my way with her. I asked her if she'd ever been spanked or tied up. She said no, but that being tied up might be an interesting idea. You have to trust someone a lot to let them tie you up. I don't even trust people to be nice to me, so trusting someone to tie me up would really be a stretch, she said. I listen to Howard every day. Dash Patty Davis Reagan. I'll teach you trust, I promised, I'd tie you to the bed, spread eagled, with my neckties. I'd tie your wrists to the headboard and I would take a tie and tie up your ankles. Now you're completely spread eagled in your clothes and I walk out of the room. I'd leave for ten minutes. See, this is why I wouldn't let someone tie me up, Patty protested, what a schmucky thing to do. No that would be just to make you think about what was gonna happen. But that's really mean, she said. But that's taming you. In my mind, that's getting you ready for the session. This is why I'm never gonna do this, oh, you're gonna do it, I asserted. That's abusive to abandon someone there, she complained. Of course. That would piss you off. When you tie someone up you don't do stuff they necessarily agree with. So you're tied up. You're lying the pissed, but meanwhile, you notice, five minutes into the session, that you're getting sexually aroused. Even though you're mad and upset about it, you're getting sexually aroused, that's the sick thing about it. And you're going, this is the stupidest, schmuckiest thing. I hate this guy. When Howard comes back into the room, I'm gonna make him untie me. But meanwhile, this is like foreplay from hell, because when I come back in the room, you're completely excited. Patty started laughing now, this really weird piercing laugh from Mars. She was really getting into this scenario. I told her that she wouldn't be laughing like that if I was dominating her. And you're not laughing either, I continued. I wouldn't be laughing, she agreed, I would be really upset. Actually, I could hold out a long time with you, because if you laughed like that, I would definitely not be too quick. I went on with the scenario. I'd come back in, she'd yell at me, I'd tell her to shut up. I'd put some spiked heels on her feet. I'd cut four holes out of her leotard. Two on top, and then the other two. Then I'd leave her again, and then come back in and shave her completely. Now you're really pissed. You're furious. But you're completely sexually excited, I said. Has any woman ever let you do this to her? Pate asked. No, of course not. I pressed on, I do stuff to you for over an hour. 
I'd lick you. You'd have fifty orgasms and then you'd pass out. But I still wouldn't untie you. I'd leave for two hours. You'd hate me but you couldn't wait for me to come back. I'd come back, feed you lunch, and then we'd do it all over again. Then I'd untie you. That would be some session. Then I'd take the video out of the camcorder and sell it to hard copy. President's daughter has sex with disgusting animal. I could have sworn Patty would go for it but she had to go to another show to plug her new book. But my seed was planted, and my deep eroticism took hold. She's now writing a book on the subject of all, you guessed it, bondage. Tori Spelling If I wasn't married to Alison I'd go after that Tori Spelling. She's really cute, she's on a hit show, and any guy who bags her can back the brink struck up to the house. I had her on the show with Melissa Rivers once when we were broadcasting out of L.A. And I brought up the fact that people accused Oray of being an arid. That's my character, not me, she said. We decided to test her. I gave her a battery of questions. She knew that Daryl Gates was L.A.S. ex-police chief, that Woody Allen was being investigated for child molestation, and that Rodney King was the guy who was beaten up by the L.A. cops. But then I gave her a hard question. What's the capital of New York State? She hemmed and hawed, come on, say anything, I implored her. New Jersey? She guessed. I'm sorry, I said, but as a consolation prize you guess to kiss me goodbye while I grab your buttocks. What would I have gotten if I won? Tori asked. The same thing, Robin said. Donald Trump. Donald is probably the only person on the planet who's more afraid of germs than I am. We were talking about his germ phobia once when the conversation shifted to his womanizing. With all those girls you're screwing around with, aren't you? Afraid of AIDS? I asked. Germ phobia is a problem, the Donald admitted, you have to be selective. It's pretty dangerous out there. It's like Vietnam. Dating is my personal Vietnam. I love that quote. He's always one of our best guests. I tune into Howard to hear what you really get these days, straight talk and very close to the mark. Dash Donald Trump. The Donald and the Howard rating women. X Rose. The first time I ever had X Rose from Guns N' Roses on was when a listener gave me his New York hotel phone number and we called him cold. X, it's Howard's turn. You're on the radio, man, I greeted him. Oh, yeah. What's happening? Uh-oh, you're sleeping, I said. Waking up, he said. I bet you're there with a babe, I said. No. Calm down, man. I'll put you on dial a date, I offered. Maybe I need a breather, Axel said. Did you ever get Jessica Han? I didn't go after Jessica Han. She needs a diet. Did Slash get her? I said, figuring someone from the band had done the honors. Slash used her for a spittoon. He really enjoyed that, Axel said. Hey, you must be getting, I'd say, ten women a week, I guessed. Let's say psycho bitches, Axel corrected. You get to toot women? We just get crazy people. If they last twenty-four hours, it's amazing. We give them like a twenty-four-hour test. If they act normal for more than twenty-four hours, they get to stay. I bet you've had three women at the same time. What's that like? I needed to know. Usually someone gets pissed off, Axel said. Can't you get the other girls to get it on with each other? That's what I would have done. Yeah, that happens, he said nonchalantly. Oh, man, I was dying with envy. The problem is they all get upset. They don't want me looking at another girl. So I say, you didn't pass the 24-hour test. Then I call a friend and they politely escort the person out. That's what I need. A 24-hour test, to weed out every cook and arsehole in my life. I learned a lot from Axel Rose that day. Joan Rivers Although I like Joan a lot, there are two odd things about her. How is it that a rich woman can go on TV and sell that fake jewelry with a straight face? And say that she thinks it's beautiful? And how much longer can she go on milking the death of her husband? Edgar, for ratings. At first she did a few magazine articles, then a book. Okay. That was cool. She got it out of her system. Then she had her daughter, Melissa, on the show and they both cried embarrassingly, on national TV. 
I envisioned Joan's ultimate sweep sweep lineup as she ran out of ways to milk Edgar's death for ratings. Come on baby, you know you need a hot sausage. Coming on to Edgar's widow. On Monday's show I'm going to have my doorman. You know, when Edgar died the doorman came up to me and opened the door. You want to talk about class. He's a very special doorman. Joan starts sobbing here. Tuesday, we'll have Edgar's embalmer. He's the man who last touched Edgar. A real class gentleman. He put the formaldehyde in Edgar, who looked so handsome. He was a handsome man. Now Joan's hysterical. All next week, the man who built Edgar's casket. And during sweeps week we're going to get the guy who dug the hole in the ground. He was the last man to see Edgar. Joan's inconsolable. For my Christmas show. I'm climbing into the hole with Edgar to decorate him and I'll cry the whole show. I'm going to decorate his skull like a hemant ashen. We're going to put Edgar's skull on top of the tree. We'll be right back, I can't go on. Joan sobs all the way to the commercials. Now, as soon as Joan comes back from commercials, it's time to sell gold jewelry. This jewelry is replicas of all the jewelry Edgar has given me over the years. Of course, I have the real thing. You're going to wear this fake shit that I wouldn't be caught dead in. Now this is a replica of a bee Edgar gave me right before he died. The Greek word for bee is Melissa. That's why he gave it to me. I'm all about class and now you'll be full of class, too. Now I have this next item on sale, available only through QVC. This is a solid silver miniature booze bottle. The same booze bottle that Edgar drank from right before he committed suicide. Joan weeps bitterly. This is a solid gold replica of Edgar's thumb. Different Edgar body parts are available to wear around your neck. I'm wearing right now a tiny diamond studded coffin, the same coffin that Edgar put himself in. A class box. And these are my eggs. Edgar put his sperm on these eggs and we made Melissa. I had my eggs removed like caviar right before I stopped menstruating and they've been petrified and I've made copies of them, so you can wear them around your neck. Can anybody else turn personal tragedy into ratings like Joan? How Joan remained friendly with me after all those Edgar routines I did amazes me to this day. She even invited me on her show. One time I went to her show carrying a hidden video camera. I put it in my dressing room and called Joan in before I went on. I gave her this long sad rap about how I was not getting along with my wife, Alison, and how much I'd like to take her out that night. I made a move to grab her, but she ran away. I don't know why, but she was repulsed by me. He's honest, he's forthright, he says what we all think. He has no fear, he's a great showman and a loyal friend. My hand would go into fire for him, but I'd make sure there's a fire extinguisher nearby. Dash Joan Rivers. David Lee Roth. I once got pissed off at him because he was making the rounds of the rock stations to promote his album but he neglected to come on my show after he promised me he would. I really like David and think Van Halen sucks without him. So, naturally, I was angry that he didn't show up. I was so mad at him that I grabbed his record and scratched it up pretty good and then I smashed it into a million pieces. I've always been good to him, I whined, I've even avoided talking about his new hair weave. I've been kind to him. Hey, screw him. I'm going to talk about this. He's David Weaveroth. He looks like my Jewish accountant without that hair. I've had it with him. A listener called up with his New York hotel room number but he didn't answer. He's probably putting on his hair, I fumed, hey, whenever you see him just call him David Weaveroth, I instructed my listeners. That night I got a call at home. It was David Weave, you're killing me he said, everybody on the street was fucking with me. The next day I went on the air. So who calls me at home but David Lee Roth, I gloated, you mean David Weave Roth, Robin said, you better keep your mouth shut, Robin, I said, he's going to be here in about 20 minutes. He's making the peace. Well, David did show up, and he proved to me he wasn't wearing a weave. At any given time, Howard says what is really on his mind. Most of the time, Howard says what is really on your mind. This makes Howard unique on American radio. Dash David Lee Roth. Sandra Bernhard. Sandra used to come on my show a lot before she got a job with that fatso Roseanne and Tom Ono.
who, because they hate me, have prevented her from coming on my show. But Sandra was really open about her relationship with Madonna. I had her on my TV show the night we did a roast. While she was roasting me, I leaned over and pulled something out from between her teeth. I always wanted to see Madonna's pubic hair, I said. Whenever Sandra would come on the radio, I'd ask her if she ever got it on with Madonna. I've gone to some dumps before, but I've never gone to that place. I have a little bit of dignity, she said. Did Madonna steal your girlfriend? I went on, a real friend wouldn't steal your girlfriend. I know and I couldn't be happier. It worked out beautifully. I can't stand Madonna, I said, I think she's the biggest bitch phony. Beyond, Sandra said. When you girls don't get any penis, you all fall apart, I observed. Sandra plugged her show and hung up, I would do Sandra, I said, she's got a good body. And those lips. Lips so plenty, lips to do things with, lips to make up for everything else, lips that, maybe after you finish with her, might make you a little nauseous. But I don't care. I'm proud to admit I'd fuck Sandra. Jessica Hahn. Jessica carries a pocketbook full of lingerie when she visits my show in case I ask for a striptease. How we first got to know each other is a great story. Jessica was an obscure young girl from Long Island who was propelled into the headlines when she was caught up in the Jim Backer sex scandals. I really felt sorry for her. It was clear that she had been manipulated and used by these phony preachers. Meanwhile, she was holed up in her little trailer on Long Island, hiding from the press. Baba Bowie had gotten hold of her home phone number from a friend of a friend who worked for a television station. Apparently the entire New York media had her number but Jessica would never pick up the phone when someone from the press called. We decided to give it a try. I dialed the number on the air and got the answering machine. Hello, Miss Hahn, my name is Howard Stern. I don't know if you've heard me before but I'm a reporter. Not a reporter. A friend. I'm a DJ. Suddenly, we heard a click, is this really Howard's turn? A female voice said, yes, I said. Do you listen to the show? Robin said, yes, I do, Jessica said and we all cheered, this is really cool, you're like a newsmaker, I said, I appreciate it, Jessica said, at least you geese make me laugh. It's a great way to wake up. I immediately began a role that would continue throughout our relationship. I counseled Jessica on dealing with her new fan celebrity. The next day we called back with a gift for Jessica an all-expenses-paid trip to Montego Bay for seven days. Of course, I made her promise she wouldn't talk to any other New York radio stations, especially WNBC. And, in this second phone conversation, I began a sexual flirtation with Jessica that over the years has put tremendous strain on my marital vows of fidelity. The strain was intensified when Jessica came into the studio for her first live appearance, almost four months after that phone call. Jessica had just gotten back from Chicago where she had done the Donahue show. In fact, I was furious when she told me that the Donahue audience had the nerve to laugh when Jessica revealed that I had been giving her advice. Morons. I have fun with you, Howard, Jessica said, people don't want me to relax. They want me to start preaching or sit in a corner and cry, I stuck by your story the whole time, I told her, I know. I love you for that. Jessica gushed, I just love you so much. You could cut the sexual tension in the studio with a knife. In fact, it got so heavy that Allison called in. Gary came in and conveyed her message, she loves you, but watch it. We got Allison on the phone. She exchanged pleasantries with Jessica. Dominic Barbara, Jessica's lawyer, offered Allison his services for the divorce, Allison knows she's on the gravy train, she ain't jumping off for anybody, I said. Listen, I trust you and I know when you're carrying on for the show, Allison said. But Dominic, if anything happens, I'm taking him to the cleaners. We had a lot of fun with Jessica over the years on the show. One time I made a phony phone call to her posing as Bob Trellis, a fictitious editor with Doubleday. She once told me that she wanted to write a book, but nothing dirty or pornographic. I wanted to see if she would stick to that premise if I offered her a lot of money. I told her that after hearing her talk on the Howard Stern Show about how she exercises her vaginal muscles, 
I realized it would make a perfect book. A step-by-step -step instruction guide would be fabulous, I said. But I'm not a pro on anything, Jessica said, not recognizing my voice. We're interested in your talents as a reproducer, I said, perhaps we'll have drawings. Dating habits, safe sex, lubricants, whatever. I offered her a $15,000 advance. It's a fledgling idea, I pitched her. The idea of the inside mechanism of a woman's parts being exercised and used is an incredible concept. Obviously, a strong book would include the story that you used a milking machine for sexual use. Jessica's best breast press photo. While Jessica teases, she pleases the crowd at the outdoor funeral that I staged for my competitors. The King of L.A. Celebrates at the ratings death of his morning competition. I have to see this whole thing in my mind to be able to accept it and see if it'll work, Jessica said. It will work, I pushed, you could do a whole chapter on using a candle. Or a loom rack. Or a plumber's helper's handle. A whole chapter on that would be fabulous. I really don't know, Jessica said. Look, I don't want you to get perverted for the book. If Jessica Hahn had used a propane hose, then we'd do a chapter on propane hoses, I said. Look, Playboy paid me a million dollars and they asked me to do 1% of what you're asking. I am not going to put myself on the line like this, this is too far out, she said. I barreled on. Let's say we find someone who uses road flares, for example. Then we'd put it in the book. Not necessarily you using a road flare. I don't think you'd use a road flare, you're a very beautiful woman, but some people are desperate. Look. I can only go so far, Jessica said, I've done a lot of things that I don't regret at all, but this is going a little beyond that. So you're saying you're opposed to posing with weird gadgets and strange people? I said. Yes, she said firmly. She began to act a bit suspicious. She asked me for my phone number. Would it be out of the question to name the book a red snapper ain't just for fishing? Can I ask you a question? Is this a joke? Did Howard put you up to this? I cannot believe in my wildest dreams that anybody from a book company would call me up like this. I ignored her, you have to be willing to put out when it comes to books. Books are bucks. Who is this? This makes Playboy look like church, she said. Your breasts were made for print, I whispered, you know, a picture of you watching a guy spank his Franklin while looking at your Playboy spread would be unbelievable for a book. It's short-term bucks. There isn't enough money on the face of the earth for the idea you have, Jessica decided, no. I'd do this and I couldn't get a job cleaning toilets. You know, squeezing a man's jolly rod with your hey nanny nanny means dollars, I urged, if we could just shave you down like a four-year-old. I started cracking up and I couldn't go on and I let her in on the joke. Another five minutes and I swear I could have signed her. Jessica became a regular on the show. We found a pattern to her phone calls. She'd leave New York to go to Los Angeles for the weekend and she'd call in to say goodbye. I love you, she said. No, I love you, I'd reply. I miss you guys, she'd come back. No, we miss you, I'd say. After a while we started taking bets on the air to see how long it would be before she told us she missed us. It got to the point where she was calling in so much that we had to brush her off a few times. Then she started leaving messages on Gary's answering machine at home. Gary would call in for messages and there'd be 80 messages and 78 of them were from Jessica. Gary would bring the tape in the next morning and we'd play it on the air. Jessica was shrewd enough to know that this was another way of getting on the air. One day before Thanksgiving we were bickering with Jessica and I told her not to call any more if I was causing her too much pain. So it was the day before. Thanksgiving and Gary got stuck in the office until 4. He left and went to rent a car to go to his Thanksgiving dinner the next day and he drove back home and he had to circle the block about 90 times before he could find a spot. So it was 6 now and he was really bumming. He walked in the door and the phone rang. It was Jessica, ranting and raving, you fucking people are supposed to be my friends, blah, blah, blah. Gary lost it, you're a fucking nut. Fuck you. He screamed. No, fuck you, Jessica yelled. They told each other to fuck off for ten minutes. Finally, she hung up.
Seconds later, Gary called me at home, hyperventilating. Boss, I can't take this anymore, he said. The Friday after Thanksgiving, Gary got the phone company out and they installed a second line and he's never had to pick up his phone for Jessica again. She drove him to a second line. But I'm proud to report that I never did have a physical relationship with Jessica, although, to be brutally honest, I could have nailed her any time I wanted. It was especially hard resisting her temptations since Jessica began to make it a habit of undressing in front of us. It began when we were all out in Los Angeles during Grammy coverage. Jessica was so homesick that the minute we came to town she rushed over to our hotel. We were hanging out in Baba Booey's room and Jessica flipped out over Gary's K-Rock t-shirt. Gary had brought a bunch of them with him, so he told her to take one. She grabbed the t-shirt off the top. It turned out that Gary had cut the sleeves off it. Jessica was so excited, she rushed into the bathroom to put on her new gift. She came out wearing the t-shirt, what do you think, guys? She said and put her arms out, like Jesus on the cross. Boom. Both her tits flopped out on both sides. We went crazy. With each succeeding Jessica appearance for us she's worn less and less clothing. It culminated finally when we were shooting our last video. But bongo fiesta. I came into her dressing room and she had like 900 outfits laid out. What do you want me to wear? Jessica asked me. Why don't you get something really sexy? I said. Well, I have this, she said and held up a piece of silk that was smaller than a G-string. My heart dropped. This was gonna be the world's greatest videotape. Put it on. Let me see if it's sexy, I said. Trying not to froth. Jessica asked me to turn my back while she put it on even though. I'd already seen her naked about 900 times. So I turned, and when I turned around again I saw she was like completely nude through this thing. I couldn't believe she wanted to go on the video totally nude like this. That's pretty good, I said. Do you think it's too revealing? She worried. No, I lied. I left her dressing room and ran downstairs. Don't make a big deal when Jessica comes down, I lectured everyone, if we make a big deal, she'll get nervous, and if she gets nervous, she won't do it. With each ratings victory, Jessica's outfits got skimpier and skimpier. So she came down and nobody reacted because she was wearing a robe. We started to roll and she took off her robe and she was standing there almost totally naked and everybody went nuts. But a few months later, we would get an even better view of her physical attributes. We were out in L.A. Again, this time for the funeral of those two idiot DJs, Mark and Brian, whom I had just usurped as the number one show in town. Jackie, Gary, Fred and I were hanging out at the bar of our hotel. It was a Saturday night at about 10 and I told Gary to give Jessica a call and get her over to our hotel to give us a fashion show. He left a message on her machine and ten minutes later he got paged by the bartender. It was Jessica. She was throwing some things into her bag and she was coming right over. We went up to my room. By now, besides us, we had stuttering John, some guys from Fox, my L.A. program director, Andy Bloom, and half the L.A. police department in the room. Jessica and I went into the bathroom to prepare for the show. I dragged Gary in there, too in case she tried to rape me. Instantly, she was completely nude and doing the whole grooming ritual. She was shaven down and she was putting baby powder all over. I swear, she even pulled a piece of lint out of her love canal. Gary and I were cracking up whenever she turned her back to us. We started out showing the natural progression of her nakedness. I went out and introduced Jessica to the crowd in the room. This is the outfit that Jessica made famous at the Philadelphia Zoo funeral. Then I told her she had to show more, then she came out with the mini skirt and heels, but she'd lost the top. The guys were whooping it up and they started chanting, take off your dress. Take off your dress, so she took off her dress and she wasn't wearing underpants. She acted as if she was embarrassed and she went back to the bathroom. We followed her in. Why don't you just come out naked in high heels? I suggested. I don't know. She acted coy. It's just Jackie and Fred and the guys, we begged. She agreed and she came out totally naked. She was naked but demure, she was holding her breasts. Turn around, 
the guys started yelling. I don't know if my ass looks good, Jessica worried as she turned around. Two minutes later, she was running around the room, totally nude and totally unselfconscious. But it was Jessica's total obsessiveness about her personal hygiene and grooming habits that made for one of her most memorable appearances on the show. I knew that if I pointed out the slightest imperfection on her body, she'd go into a total snit. So one day Jessica was in the studio and, out of the blue, I stuck my finger in her belly button. Let me smell your belly button, I demanded, whoa. I started coughing, hey, Fred, come over here and smell this. My finger stinks. You probably stuck it in somebody else's, Jessica screamed. Fred picked up on this, it smells like she was picking her toenails. It does not, Jessica protested, I put baby powder on it. I use Nivea. It's not true. She actually began to cry. Robin wondered if it was Jessica's time of the month. That got her going even more. Just because I detect a little belly button odor, you're freaking out. I said. I tried it again, hey, there's something living in there, Jessica was beside herself. She said she used half a bottle of Nivea skin creme a day. Four months later, Jessica was in the studio again, so naturally, I brought up her belly button odor. She went into this whole rap about how she'd consulted a doctor and now she goes through elaborate belly button rituals. I haven't been the same since. I've done so much to my poor belly button that I probably can't have kids now, Jessica said, you ruined my life, Howard. Richard Simmons. Dietmeister Richard is one of the greatest all-time nuts I've ever encountered. He's a warm and generous person and I love him. And that lovable TV guy has a lot of pent-up anger and hostility that surfaces every once in a while. Actually, we're a lot alike. The first time I had him out to my house. He was totally manic. It was summertime and we were sitting outside by the pool and we brought him a tray of cucumber dip and he said, this is wonderful, and started throwing the food into the pool. Asshole, what are you doing? I yelled at him. He started giggling like a maniac. I told him to calm down and relax. We went into the house and there were two big grapefruits sitting on the counter, so Richard picked them up and started juggling. Then he started running through the house singing Streisand songs. All of a sudden, he grabbed our housekeeper and gave her a bear hug and picked her up. Then he ran up to Alison and did the same to her. I swear to God, Alison thought her ribs were cracked. She was moaning in pain. Then he went after my kids, grabbing them. He was like a terrorist. It wasn't really funny. It was frightening. My daughter's ribs hurt for two days. Besides his general nuttiness, I was always fascinated with Richard's sexuality. I never got a straight answer out of him on the subject, but he's one of the most effeminate men on the planet. In fact, one time Richard showed up in my studio with a beautiful woman and he told us they had just gotten married. He even showed us the ring. He said he had hit 40 and it was time to have kids. How long has she been a woman? I asked, is today April 1st? We broke for a commercial. Hold it, I just got some calls. The flags are flying at half-mast on Key West and Fire Island, I said when he came back on the air, in San Francisco, the whole town is in mourning. Richard dressed up as a real man for my TV show and later went so far as to make out with Sandra Bernhard. That wasn't the only joke Richard tried to play on us. A few months later. Robin was in the middle of her newscast when a nurse walked into her room, Ah, uh, excuse me, mom, you can't come in here, Robin said. Then she realized it was Richard. He was in full nurse regalia, with fake nails, earrings, a beehive hairdo, the works. Then he spent the rest of the show denying he was dressed like that. He did the same thing a few months later when he showed up on Ash Wednesday dressed as a nun. Even though he was. Showing up in full drag, we still didn't really poke fun at his sexual orientation on the air until Richard himself gave us the go-ahead in an indirect way. One time he came to town to promote one of his charity events and he was going to make appearances on a number of different radio stations. The night before he did our show, Scott Shannon's producer at Z100 called Richard and told him that if he did our show, he shouldn't bother coming to their show. 
Richard explained it was a charity event and he was trying to promote it in as many places as he could. They still wouldn't budge so Richard told them to screw off and he came on our show. About a year later, the Zoo morons realized they had fucked up, so they called him the night before he was supposed to do our show. We were in a commercial break and Richard was recounting the conversation. Kman, come back on, Scott Shannon's female producer said, don't hold a grudge. You tell Scott Shannon I would rather eat pussy than do that show. And I think you know how much I like doing that. We were all silent, we didn't know how to react. Then Richard went into his little cackle of a laugh. Little did he know it, but Richard had just unleashed the floodgates. The next time he came up, Richard entered the studio singing. He was dressed normally for him, which meant he was wearing shorts that were cut up to his navel. Could those shorts be any shorter? Do you design each pair of shorts so your sack will hang out? I asked, I can see your meat. You know what this outfit is? He's trolling for Cub Scouts this morning. Another time Richard called in and I invited him out to my house for dinner. So Richard, what do you like to eat? I asked, you like hot dogs? Sausage? Carrots? Zucchinis? Bratwurst? How about a giant cucumber for dinner? You get so ugly and it isn't even seven o'clock yet, Richard hissed. Hey, for dessert, how would you like three Cub Scouts? I said. Richard hung up. I guess I'll be dining alone, I said. I didn't want Richard to leave with a sour taste in his mouth, so I called him back. Hey, my newsboy asked me if he could meet you, I told him. Click. He hung up again. Why doesn't he calm down and take a Valium enema? I wondered, and I was planning on serving cream of anything soup, too. Good thing I didn't tell him I was going to cook the lamb in key mint jelly. We got him on the phone again. Hey, do you think the Zodiac Killer is attractive? I asked him. Again he hung up. But he did make it out to my house for dinner. My parents were there and Allison had made a really great spread. Chicken, fish, the works. There was even a tray stocked with the most incredible desserts all sorts of cakes and chocolates. But Richard wasn't doing too well with the eating. He was just picking at the food. Then I got a phone call and I left the table. Richard was sitting there and Allison came running in. Richard, Howard had to take a private phone call, she screamed. With that, Richard grabbed the dessert tray from the center of the table and he started shoveling the food into his mouth. My mother told me it was the most incredible thing she'd ever seen. We always used to give Richard a hard time about his diet program and those fatsos he was constantly dragging around with him. In fact, I booked Richard and his human balloons for my third TV show. Richard came out with two assistants who put baskets of fruits, flowers, and balloons all over the set. The highlight was a poodle made out of mums. I told you this guy was nuts. After we calmed him down, I told him that we were going to play some clips from his exercise and diet tapes. Howard, what have you done to my tapes, he yelled. He guessed right. We started out showing Richard leading a bevy of fatsos in sweating to the oldies. However, off to the side of Richard we had superimposed Fred in a full leather dress and dem outfit, including a shaded mask. Stop teasing me, Fred was saying on the tape, let's go upstairs and play house. Why are you ignoring me, Richard? I stopped the tape, all right, all right, we're just kidding. Let's show the real sweating to the oldies now, I said. We ran the tape. There was a line of blimps on either side of the screen. Then one fatso who had lost a few pounds would run up toward the camera, the way football players do when they're introduced. We let a few legitimate ones go, and then a fat woman we had superimposed on the tape ran right up to the camera. She looked straight at the camera and then barfed her guts out and fell down. Richard was flipping out. All right. You know I love you, I told him, let's bring out the two fatties he's got with him. Hey, Richard, your wallet weighs more than your porky friends. The two blimps came out and sat next to Richard. Richard was bragging about how well they were doing on his DLA meal program so I decided to put them to the test. While we were interviewing them, I grabbed a fishing pole that had a huge bag of Lay's potato chips hooked onto its end and I dangled it in front of the fatties' faces. Can they resist? I said. Howard, how could you? 
Richard yelled. I put the pole away, but a few seconds later an entire roast chicken was lowered down from the ceiling almost into their laps. I guess his program worked. They didn't eat it. Richard kept making appearances on the radio show and we kept dragging him endlessly about his suspected sexual proclivities. The last time he appeared in person we were relentless. I was talking about the time Richard had gone to Barber Bowie's house for dinner. You just wanted to put a black leather hood over his head and stuff a rubber ball in his mouth, put clamps on his nipples, and squeeze them, I said, hey, you ever been tied up? Tied up? Mercy, Richard said. He was laughing strangely under his breath. He was eating a bagel and extending his pinky as he ate. Hey, I just noticed something about you, you're very effeminate, I said. This is something new? Richard choked. One of Richard's fatso friends called and was upset about the way I made fun of fat people. We had to shut off Richard's microphone because he was blabbering too much. Pipe down, I told him, your belly is hanging out like your nuts. Richard almost started crying and he bolted for the door. Jackie blocked his way. You have picked on me from the moment I got here. All you've said is horrible things, Richard complained, I can't take it anymore. Let me out the door. Damien has a brother and his name is Howard Stern. No one has ever made me cry and broken my heart like Howard has. He's the bully in every schoolyard and for some reason I love him very much. Dash Richard Simmons. Hey, I'm just trying to make you interesting, you're boring otherwise, I said, to make him feel better. He calmed down. Be a man, Richard, I said, let's beat off and smoke cigars. I just want to know. After all this time in our friendship, why you have to feel that you have to put me down and be so mean every time I come on the show, Richard asked. I told him I wasn't being mean, just honest, you're outrageous today. Did you ever kiss a man on the lips? What is wrong with you today? Richard laughed. Where are you off to now? Where will you flit around, a shopping mall? Richard barged out of the studio but Gary dragged him back in. He started talking about his recent appearance on, Evening Shade. Then he said he thought Lonnie Anderson was beautiful. If you saw Lonnie Anderson nude, would it be exciting or would it be like looking at a building? I asked him. Richard laughed but he also said he thought it would be best if he didn't come on the show anymore. He didn't realize how prophetic he was. The next time he called in was right after the Globe had printed a story that Richard had regularly paid young men to spank him while he dressed up as a young girl. Of course Richard denied it all. The only person in the whole world that I would actually let spank me is Howard Stern, Richard said proudly. We read the article on the air. It alleged that Richard had had up to eight men in his house at a cost of $400 each. Do you know what my fantasy is, Howard? My fantasy is a buffet that costs $9.95, he joked. Bad girl, I yelled at him, have you been naughty? Did you wet your diapy? Hey, for 400 bucks I'll give you such a session you won't be able to sit down for a month. No wonder he can't sit still in the studio. His ass is probably beat red. I haven't seen Richard for almost a year and I really miss him, but he's pissed because he thinks I've gone too far discussing his sexuality. We had a lot of fun together off and on the air. He calls a lot and leaves messages that he wants to come out and see our new baby, after all, he did name her Ashley. But I refuse to see him until he returns to my radio show, the show that revived his career. I think he's great. Dash Sting. Al Hendricks. Further of Jim. Hendricks. You should have had a lot of kids, I told Al, cause you got talented sperm. Seriously. Did you ever look at your own sperm and go, my god, I wonder if there's another Jimmy inside me? Did anyone ever approach you about your sperm? No. He seemed befuddled. Jimmy's male member was legendary. Mr. Hendricks, is he a chip off the old block? I wondered. Who's this? He asked. Did Jimmy inherit your huge size in the male member category? I'm ordinary, he said, modestly. Really? I was surprised, you're ordinary? Because Jimmy was legendary for the size of his penis. When he was a little boy, did you know? Was that how you picked him up? He was average, Al said. 
it sounded as if the whole family was hung like horses. He was average? When did he get to be so large? I guess in his teenage years, I said, Mr. Hendricks, seriously, didn't he get it from you? Because Robin'll be over there in a minute if you say yes. He did get it from you, didn't he? Silence. Hendricks was befuddled, all right, I understand. You're a little shy about that. What's the most embarrassing thing you ever caught Jimmy doing? Playing the brooms about the only thing, Al said. We all laughed. He was making believe the broom was a guitar. Oh, I thought you meant something else. I call that playing the broom, too, I said. Mark Harris. Husband of Martha Ray. One of my favorite guests in the sex revelation arena is Mark Harris, the young man who married the very ancient comedian. Martha Ray. The first time he came on, Mark was very reticent to talk about both his sexual relationship with Martha and his sexual relationship with the rest of the world, possibly because he was in line to inherit her five million plus estate when she finally kicked. But we did find out that the first time he met Martha he washed her hair, hair which hadn't been washed for over a year and a half. He also revealed that he was smitten with Martha because she, like his mother, was a stroke survivor. He told us that he masturbated to relieve his sexual drive, but not with Martha in the room, doesn't use a picture of Martha to get off, and, surprise, he had sex with a man. Yes, he said, and a very famous one who he wouldn't reveal. Bingo. It's always weird when a guy says to me, yeah, I've had homosexual sex, but not with that many guys. One sounds like plenty to me. Any farm animals? Did you pitch or catch? Catch. Mark said, oh, you're talking about sex. I'm talking about baseball. No, I've never bent over, not even for a banana peel. Everybody's a comedian. Then he talked about the weirdest sex he probably ever had, making it with Martha. Martha proposed to him through her nurse, he told us. He wasn't sexually attracted to her at first, it was more of a business type marriage, to protect her estate from relatives. Now what got you hot when you saw her? Was the wheelchair especially shiny? I probed. He avoided the question. I asked him about their wedding night. The night they consummated this strange union, you didn't plan to have sex with her? No. Joining us for homeless. How he would squares, whether downtrodden win prizes. Are you sure it wasn't the nurse you banged when the lights went out? He described the scene. Martha was in a trousseau and he was nude except for a silk robe. Are the teeth in or out? I asked. In. Did the nurse do anything to prepare her sexually for you? Any jellies? I really would have to ask the nurse, he said. You unwrapped your robe and you were completely nude in front of her? No, I lay beside her, and we were talking and I was drinking champagne and she unwrapped me, let's say, he said. She unwrapped you like a birthday present, I exulted. Like a cigar. This is getting crazy. And then you leaned over and you began to kiss? Absolutely. Lovingly. Were her hands scaly or smooth? Very beautiful. And you went all the way with her that night? Would you like to know that before the evening was over, in the wee hours of the morning, we all wound up in the hospital, he reported. Why? Martha had another stroke? Abdominal pains, he bragged. So from your lovemaking she experienced some pain? Take it as you wish, he said. Andrew Dice Clay. Replies. Not everyone loved hearing Mark. One time, when I had him on, Andrew Dice Clay called in. Dice is always brutal, always great. His call in to Mark Harris was a classic. I'm getting sick and tired of parasite faggots like you, the Dice man started. You want to tell me you're in love with her? You want to tell me you fucked somebody that should have been dead 30 years ago and nobody told her yet? Everyone went wild. Mark started yelling at Dice but Dice kept at him. What about young girls with big boobs and great tasses? You don't. Like that? What does he do when he sees a real chick, like one from this century, walking around? Harris, you're a parasite. Dick Cave T.T. I always love having Cavett on because I know he's good for some juicy stories. They usually center on his various mental ailments and the drugs he was taking to combat them.
I was convinced that he wasn't on antidepressants but anti-ratings drugs. Dick said that his mental problems were in no way connected to the abysmal ratings his shows always seemed to produce. What's worse, Dick, when they cancel one of your shows or when they cancel one of your prescriptions? He didn't answer. He did come through with an amazing abuse story. He said that he was molested when he was a kid growing up in Nebraska. I claimed that this was merely a career move to get on the Arsenio show, but Dick gave us some details. He was five years old and at a Hope Along Cassidy movie and there was a guy sitting next to him with his raincoat over his lap. The guy said, put your hand under here and squeeze. Did you? I probed. Sure, because I wanted to see the rest of the movie, he said. Homo, I coughed. Likes boys, Fred coughed. Loves testicles, Jackie cleared his throat. Hugging Dick. Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester called into my show and didn't plug anything. That's a big plus. At the time he had just done two comedies and I yelled at him for a good five minutes. I gave him some good advice, keep doing action pictures. God bless Rambo. I love Rambo. All you action guys always want to branch out. I would make action films all day and night. The more blood, the more gore, the more banging girls, the better. After imparting my career wisdom, I told him that if his girlfriend, supermodel Jennifer Flavin, was my girlfriend, I'd make love to her three times a day. When you left the room that there nothing left but a black smoky hole, Sylvester said. Then he revealed that he especially liked the segment on my TV show featuring the Cobbasa Queen, a lady whose prodigious talent consisted of being able to deep throat an entire massive sausage. You know what? We watched that show last week and I tried to ram a thermos down Jennifer's throat, still Owen wise cracked. Then in gesture of complete trust, he did something very un-Hollywood. He put his hot girlfriend on the phone. In my own devious and subtle way I got her talking about sex. So, when you met Sly, what were you wearing? A miniskirt, she said in her innocent little girl voice. Was it the miniest of micro miniskirts? Were you wearing panties under that miniskirt? Were they thong underpants? Were you wearing a bra under your shirt? Was the shirt the kind of shirt that exposes your rock-hard belly? Did Sly nail you on the first date? No, she shyly answered. On the second date? No, no, she protested. I imagined she was fingering herself with her dainty 19-year-old feminine and the entire time we spoke. Were you a virgin when you met Sly? I whispered. Practically. I only had one guy before Sly. My high school sweetheart. Her pussy must have smelled like daisies, I imagined as I clutched my hot beef. I shuddered. After a month, Sly asked me to go to Hawaii with him. But my mom wouldn't let me go unless she had a serious talk with him. Then when we got there, she called me every day. So, did you make love in Hawaii? Yes, she giggled like the near virgin she was. I imagined her clitoris was heating up with passion. All this sex talk had to be making her hot. Sly's a painter. Did he paint you in the nude in Hawaii? Did you wear a thong on the beach? No, she giggled. A bikini? Yes. Then Sly and you check into this room and like you guys have never made love before? Right, she sweetly answered. Weren't you nervous? I sensitively asked, as I gently fingered my arsehole. Yes, she giggled orgasmically, was Sly gentle? I asked, I would have been so rough. I would have tied her up spread eagled, poured cement up her ass, and sucked it out with a straw. The bitch would have grumbled with desire. I would have filled her love pouch with my cock cheese while she did the shmgahini dance. Did you guys go to a nude beach? Did you fuck in the woods? Did you suck him off? Did you beat his meat? Were you jerking his gherkin? Dash I forgot to ask. Sly stopped the conversation and grabbed the phone, she learned everything she knows from her first boyfriend. Great guests. I'm still waiting for them to call back. I love him, I really love him. Dash Sylvester Stallone. The Wacky Stallone Family. I could write a whole chapter about my exploits with the Wacky Stallone Family. You never know what's going to happen. Especially when Jackie, Stallone's mother, shows up.
if she isn't making some cuckoo astrological predictions or claiming that Jesse Jackson offered her the vice presidential spot in 1988, she's having huge fights with her ex-husband. They were reunited for the first time in six years when Frank S.R. called in when Jackie was in the studio. They seemed to be having a pleasant enough conversation but then Jackie got real and revealed that Frank was the one who got tired of sleeping with her. Let me tell you, when she was pregnant with Sylvester, she put on 65 pounds, Frank S.R. said. I did not, Jackie maintained. Soon after, he hung up and Jackie started whispering, not realizing she was still on the air. Thank God I said the right things about him, or he would have shot me. He was the worst lay in the world. We all cracked up. But we weren't laughing the next time these two tangled horns. He couldn't get it up when he was 25, Jackie complained about her 72-year-old ex-husband, who was now dating a 25-year-old he'd met when she was 17, what's he doing with her? She railed. It didn't take long for Gary to come in and tell us that Frank S.R. was on the phone. I'm ready to jump through this phone. I just can't believe this wrinkly, messy, vulgar woman saying things about her own family that just won't quit. He bellowed, she is probably the lowest vermin that I've ever known in my life and it was a sorry day when I met her. Listen, you pig, Jackie countered, let me tell you, you old son of a bitch. You beat me up and put me in the hospital so many times, and choked me to death so many times, and you like to go on the air and say you're basically a nice guy. You prick, you never supported your kids. You never gave a goddamn for, you are the biggest goddamn liar, he screamed. Fuck you, Jackie said and we screamed. Thank God for seven second delay. Get this slob off the phone, Jackie ordered. You were nothing when I met you, Frank said. What the hell are you doing with an 18-year-old girl? Jackie wondered. She's giving me more than you ever could, that's what. What the hell did you ever give me, you old bastard? I supported you for years. You goddamn half-ass hairdresser. I opened the business, I put you to work, and then you stole all the money. And I bought the house and goddamn it, you put a gun to my head and made me sign it over to you for another old broad married to a cab driver with five kids who dumped you six months later, Jackie railed. You are absolutely insane, Frank said. You can go to hell. And don't you ever talk to me again, you fucking creep. You gave me no pleasure. Goddamn it, you couldn't even fuck. Oh uh, wait a second, I jumped in, you're gonna lose our license. I can't bleep you that fast. Jackie was still yelling off mic while I waited for the delay to build up. I begged her not to use the F word. I won't use the F word, but as far as sex, twice a year, he'd say, okay, if you're ready, lay down. And then if I pretended I was excited, he said, look, if you're gonna act like you're excited, forget it. You're from hunger, she screamed, he'd bring home bushels of tomatoes and peppers and tell me to can them. I'm not an Italian housewife. What do I know about ganning? He punched me in the jaw. Why don't you keep quiet and listen to the truth? He said. That is the truth. You're insane. Well, I had to be to have you, she said. You are insane, woman. But you two produced a movie star, I offered helpfully. No help from him. Any guy could have done the job in three seconds. He didn't even want Sylvester. He tried to get me to have an abortion. Yes, you did. And I pretended I got one. You were very surprised to find out I had a kid. Is that true, Mr. Stallone? I asked. It certainly is, Jackie butted in. She's really off her rocker, he said. You didn't want this kid and you know it, Jackie screamed. You remind me of an old crinkled up Genoa salami. That's all you will be all your life. Goodbye. He yelled and hung up. You know, you have to say to yourself, why? 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 I questioned, why does this have to happen at 10.30? Why can't it happen during drive time at 7 o'clock? I'll have to replay this tomorrow at 7. Frank Stallone, Jr. I even got Frank Jr. in on the act. I skillfully interrogated Frank on his relationship to his superfamous sibling, utilizing my best Barry Mason. You and Sylvester never tickled each other? No. You never saw Sylvester naked? Of course, he's my brother. 
Did you admire his large penis? No. You didn't even look at it? Did you look at his genitals? Have you seen your brother's genitals? Of course. And you looked at them, is that correct? Of course. So you do admit to looking at your brother's genitals? Looking at, no. It was like a glance. Did you look at Sylvester Stallone's genitals? Answer the question. It wasn't like sitting there beaming in. No, but did you see them? Yes. Of course I've seen them because we're brothers. Did you compare who was bigger? Ah, uh, yes. You did. So you admit now, not only looking at your brother's genitals but doing. No, I was doing this in my own mind. Oh, in your mind you were thinking about Sylvester's penis. Admit it. No, 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 no. All right, so there you go. You're as homo as I am, I said triumphantly, I should have been a lawyer. His show is great. He possesses brilliance. Dash Billy D. Williams. Stern's conversation is. The national ID run wild. His over-the-top humor draws a road map of American society's taboos of public and private behavior and brings them audaciously, often hilariously, into the open. Dash Richard Zoglin, Time Magazine. Chip Znuff. Rock star from the band Enough Znuff. It started out innocently enough when I was asking Chip and Donnie, the two rock stars from the band Enough Znuff, if they got any famous women. Enough Znuff is one of my favorites, and I cannot believe that, after three albums, they are not superstars. Chip got Madonna, Donnie squealed, he got her back when she was a drummer in L.A. Is that true, Chip? I was out of my mind, you nailed Madonna? Let me smell your hand, I ain't telling, Chip said. Did you smack her around? I can't believe you got Madonna and you never told me in private. The next time they came on, Chip was foolish enough to tell me the details of what happened before we went on the air. He said he had sex with Madonna and peed inside her. We argued, because I said that it was impossible to be inside of a woman. It was impossible to carry on with this graphic discussion on the radio, so I cleaned up the story a little. But I couldn't wait to talk about it. These guys told me what went on with Madonna, I teased, Robin, if I told you, you couldn't do the news. It would be the news, at a break we told Robin. Then she started in, was it out of disgust? Was it an accident or did you really want to? She wondered. It was time to go for it, Chip, no kidding, Madonna goes for that? Did she get mad? These guys use women as a toilet and I'm sexist? I blurted out. Hey. Maybe Chip just had to go. He gets wild with women and he can't make the trek to the bathroom. When you see one of her videos, Chip, do you say, I've got to go to the bathroom, I asked. After they left, we told a less graphic version of the story, how cool is that that Chip peed on Madonna? I said, even though he insisted that he had peed in her, that story should carry him for 20 years. And he's so casual about it. I would do bits on that endlessly for the rest of my life. Talking about it, analyzing it. And he's going, why are you guys making such a big deal about the fact that I peed on Madonna? Chip, don't you get it? You peed on Madonna. Naturally. The next time they came on, I brought it up again, where's Madonna? I have to urinate, I said, poor Chip. Hey, you should be proud of that. That's a rock and roll legend. It says something about you. It means you got street years on you. All these other guys are waiting to get Madonna and you just abuse her that way, just to teach her a lesson. Okay, shut up. I have to go to the bathroom now. That's so cool. Hey, there's no bathroom available and I'm a man. This is what I'm doing. That's so cool. But I don't understand it. Couldn't you go to the bathroom? You did this as a thing to turn her on, right? It was a long time ago. Chip protested, it wasn't like that at all. You see that guy Fred over there? I pointed, he farted in front of Gloria Estefan. It was really cool, she was all fouled out. But you take the cake. You're our hero. I began to fantasize them winning a Grammy, we'd like to thank the Academy. We'd like to thank God. And we'd like to thank Madonna. When we didn't have a toilet, we used her. Chip was uncomfortable. I tried to press him, but he would only say it was a one-night fling. Off the air, he couldn't stop bragging. 
Let me ask you something, I said, if you had stayed with Madonna for a couple of weeks, do you think you would have built up to something? Like doing number two or something? Chip wouldn't answer. The, Howard's turn radio show, has made its own fairly major contribution to the rancid nature of public talk on the East Coast. Dash Alexander Coburn, The Nation. Howard is an improv factor. I don't think he believes half the things he says. He's picked his role well and he's given people the vortex to let the arsehole in themselves come out. Dash Sally Kirkland. Another celebrity you have to love, Joe Franklin. I attempted male-to-male -male sodomy on the set, but he wouldn't hear of it. Sally Kirkland, right, on set with Tawny Kitten and me as Larry King. Howard Stern without a radio microphone would be a goofy, lost child from the Aerosmith generation. Radio without Howard Stern would be a bore. Dash Geraldo Rivera. Howard knows I love him. Dash Steven Tyler, Aerosmith. Yakking it up with actor-slash-motorcycle accident victim Gary Busey during the head injury club for men sketch on my TV show. M. More hate mail. I received your reply to my letter and decided to try what you suggested about listening to Howard's morning radio show with an open mind. Attached is a typed copy of a daily diary of sorts with my notes on what I heard each morning for one week that offended me, insulted my intelligence and made me want to change channels. 7-25-91 In discussing Linda Lavin's divorce, Howard says it is okay for a man to commit adultery if his wife is ugly. 7-26-91 Howard says, all women should be skinny, with enormous breasts. 7-30-91 Pee Wee Herman is a pretty easy target this week but Michael Landon? Howard bashes Landon as not being a real family man because he was married three times. Howard believes himself to be a real family man, he has only one wife and family. However, if his wife gets fat, he will be forced to bang the millions of women who hit on him because he is so famous. Dear Mr. Stern. So you're no. One in the ratings. That only proves that America is a land of perverts. Howard. Your show sucks. That person that says it's the Howard's turn show now hears Howard's turn. He sounds like a Jewish guy eating corned beef in a deli. You're jealous of Mark and Brian because they have national TV show. The reason the ratings on TV is not higher because they're competing with the most popular TV show 60 Minutes. Why can't you get a national TV show? Why don't you do plastic surgery on your ugly face? I f you're not like me I hate you chapter 8. Every once in a while I have this fantasy that I should be lying in the sun somewhere on vacation. But where? To tell the truth, I hate every fucking place in the world. I hate Europe. I hate the Bahamas and all those islands filled with hostile natives. I'm uncomfortable asking black guys to serve me. What about Mexico? They have a corrupt government, endless begging in the streets, and you get diarrhea from eating a piece of fruit. I also hate the hassle of going on a plane and feel no excitement for seeing strange and unusual places. I have no desire to expose my children to other cultures and give them incredible learning experiences. Hell. I hate leaving the house. I like the food here, and I got a pool for swimming. A rare out-of-country experience, my honeymoon in Mexico. The Mexicans do everything to humiliate you. No Mexican would wear that stupid hat. Here's a 51st of my least favorite peoples, in ascending order. 3. The French 2. The Filipinos 1. Everybody else. Z French. Let me tell you why I hate the French. First of all, those bastards wouldn't let us fly our planes over their precious country when we were on our way to bomb that rakehead Gaddafi. A lot of people forgot this, I didn't. That's some gratitude after we saved their snail-eating asses during wee-i when they lay down like sheep for Hitler. People talk about the French resistance. That was a myth. There was no French resistance. Those rat bastards were manufacturing more stuff for the Nazi war effort than any other occupied territory. Did you know that the French actually became the number one producer of goods for the Nazis? They couldn't wait to please those pricks. If I should ever go to France I'll pack a tape recorder so I can play a tape of Hitler's speeches every time a Frenchman gives me a dirty look for being an American, remember that voice, 
I will say, that's who we saved you from. You should kiss my feet daily, worship my cellulite ridden ass, and say God bless America for kicking some ass when you were lying down like sheep. No one remembers. I remember. I play that fucking tape every day. My tape recorder would blare German screaming, Sig he isle. Sig he isle, through the streets of France. And if some arsehole tried to fuck with me I'd scream from the top of my lungs, Lafayette was a pussy. The Bastille fell like it was cardboard. Most people say, don't live in the past. But look at the French today. We offer them money, technology, and business opportunities, and they dump shit on us. And we take it. We bring them Euro Disney, a multi-billion dollar industry, and at the opening they have the balls to throw tomatoes at Disney chairman Michael Isner because the Disney uniforms are not part of their precious culture. Would putting Mickey Mouse in a beret solve their problem? Those dirty scumbags with those stupid berets. They're not even hats. A piece of cloth should cover your head if it's going to be called a hat. That's not a hat, it's an oversized yarmulke. That ridiculous cowboy hat Garth Brooks wears is more sensible. Think about it. Why would any sane American businessman want to invest good money with those dogs after they piss all over a new enterprise? Screw them and their Eiffel Tower. I don't know anyone who's been over there and hasn't been disappointed by the Eiffel Tower. They should knock it over on its side, point it toward Euro Disney, and use it as a road directional sign. This Eiffel Tower is a major tourist attraction. It looks like it was made with an erector set. We should take all the French to New York and show them the Empire State Building. That's what the Eiffel Tower would look like if they ever completed construction. But Howard, you might say, what about the French women? The hell with French women and their hairy legs. Unless they're chambermaids and they're using their legs to pick up dust in the rooms, they're useless. We got the best women right here. Catherine Znuve is fat and has small tits. Bridget Bardet was okay in her prime but now she looks just like those fucking dogs she takes care of. And what's with those bidets French women use? I once asked a Frenchie on my show what the hell those bidets were for anyway. Something about cleaning the vagina and arsehole. What about toilet paper? You mean this great French inventor felt a need to develop something beyond toilet paper? A porcelain water fountain for my arsehole. This is overkill. You want to work on something? Work on a cure for cancer. Unfortunately, the only time I get to directly rag on French people is when their broadcasters come to observe me in the studio. They really come to steal whatever they can understand of my radio show. One time I got a visit from this guy named Louis who was the musical director of some station in Paris. He was one of those smooth, good-looking French guys that women get a fond of going in their panties over. Radio in France must really blow cause his idea of good radio was to play a lot of so-called world music, which is mostly weird Japanese noises and a lot of African stuff, with people sitting around bong going on rocks and every once in a while banging the plates in their lips to break. Up the monotony. So I really unloaded on Louis. Charles de Gaulle was a pussy. Maurice Chevalier sucks. Laurence Olivier sucks and Charo was a pussy. But Laurence Olivier English, and Charo, she is from Spain, he said. Big deal, it's all Europe, I said, your whole country is filled with snail eaters. Your only hero besides a hunchback is that little bastard Napoleon. And what's with Jerry Lewis being a genius? He's considered an arsehole here. Know what else I don't like? You're hiding that child rapist Roman Polanski. Send him back. I was on a roll but the lad was here for fatherly radio advice, look, the only purpose for radio is to make money. You can buy a stereo and play weird world music records in your house. This is a business, get the most you can, cut the balls out from under your competition. Screw em and make the most money. You French guys don't like the Jews, either. You're anti-Semites. No. We have no such, he protested. Your auntie is real. What's the beef with them, a bunch of Jews just trying to live in the desert? Hey, what's a dreidel? Do you know? I don't know. What's a yamulka? I don't know. At the mic berating the French, Jerry Lewis is an arsehole. What's a Hanukkah? I don't know, my English isn't so good. I rest my case. He's totally ignorant. Yves Montand sucks. Louis Mal's a creep. 
Toulouse-Lautrec was a troll. And we know most French designers are homos. Yes, that's true, he was forced to admit. Since he'd come for my advice as a respected radio personality in America, here's what I offered, the more money you make at a radio station, the better it is. Because when you have money you have power, and when you have power, you have freedom, freedom to bomb Libya. Just remember these words, radio is business. Don't put up a fight. Repeat after me. Radio. Radio. He was doing it. Is. A business. Say it. He repeated it like a frog parrot. Now you've learned and now my job is done and you can leave. Good luck. Yeah, good luck, too, he said. You're not insulted, are you? I said solicitously. No, not at all. You should be. I don't understand. What, am I slipping? Did I forget anything? Jerry Lewis. Libya. The Eiffel Tower is ugly. I couldn't get to him. So I had Fred put on a Hitler speech with sound effects of sheep baying over it, remember that voice, I said, that's who we saved you from. You should play that on your station every day and say, God bless America for kicking ass when we were lying down like sheep. Play this every day instead of all that Japanese music. Japan was bombing you. No one remembers. I remember. The Krauts. But it's not just the French. I get Kraut broadcasters, too. The Casey Kasems of Buchenwald all come to learn at the half-Jewish feet of the greatest radio personality in the world. I guess they can smell a gold tooth a mile away. And they all have such stupid names. Fritz, Hans, Claus, those names are no good for the radio. I give them good wacky radio names like Adolf the K, Cousin Nazi, or Wolfman Jack Boots. One time I was invaded by six of them, at once. Six of Germany's future broadcasters were booked to come to my studio and observe American radio. These six sons of stormtroopers were here to soak up all of my great radio wisdom so I put them through the usual drill. When they first came into the studio, I told them, I do crazy stuff on the air. Crazy stuff like let's throw Z Jews in Z oven, we have a contest today. All you Jews line up. Ninety second caller goes in the oven. Shouldn't you give us your ovaries now? Okay everybody, it's human lamp shade Thursday. They looked at me with tight grins and steely blue eyes. They didn't think I was funny. Meanwhile, they were one generation away from the shitheads who fucked with us during World War II. Let me tell you. I suddenly got serious. As Germany has known for years, gold is the way to invest. You guys have been into gold for years. In fact, my grandmother had a lot of gold teeth I want back. Nineteen people in her family were wiped out. Hey listen, let bygones be bygones. Seriously, some of my best friends are Germans. My grandfather thought he'd outsmart everyone, he swallowed his teeth before they took him to the chambers, but they found them in the ashes. They weren't laughing. But I wanted the Germans to understand that this ugly American still held a grudge about that stupid Holocaust thing. Nobody would have gotten so upset if you didn't exterminate people. You move too quick. Japan's got the right idea. Now they're our friends, and they're conquering us. Let's band together, let's be brothers. Now they really looked confused. Seriously, you guys are the master race, right? You're good looking guys. Blonde hair blue eyes. Wish my parents would have been bred better. I'm wearing dark glasses to hide my big nose. Hey, I forgive you. Look how quickly we forgave the Jews for killing Jesus. Remember we're all brothers. Next time some drunk goes into a beer hall, ignore him. If he starts talking about world domination, say, look, we're happy, our standard of living is way up. We have jobs in radio. Just then my producer, Baba Bui, came into the studio. There was an angry listener calling in. We put her on the air. Is this Howard's turn? I think you're the rudest person in the world. Everything you said about Germans I found very rude and offensive and I don't know how those Germans can just sit there and let you talk about them like that. How old are you? Robin asked. I am 16 years old. I was born in Germany and I find everything you said very rude. Making fun of Germans, talking about Hitler, all that garbage. 
she was whining like a girl from the five towns. You don't think we should talk about Hitler? I asked. It happened about forty years ago. Why don't you just leave it? You're acting like the Germans today still act that way. We're a new generation of Germans, we had nothing to do with what happened back then and the most of those people didn't want it to happen. Even though she was sixteen, I lost it. I started yelling, most of the people didn't want it to happen, honey, is that it? Your father ought to take you and spank you, you big dummy. You're a real asshole, she retorted. Well, you are, too. Go to hell. The hell with you. I hung up on her. What a world-class philosopher this moron was. On the air teaching the crowds about a human lampshade Thursday. Gilbert Gottfried, who was in the studio with me that day, started. Imitating her in a whining voice, stop talking to the Germans about Hitler and play more new kids on the block. Stop talking about the Holocaust, we want more Debbie Gibson. The Germans had had enough history for one day. It was time to wind this down, you're gonna have to hide up in the attic with Anne Frank, Robin said cheerfully. God forbid, with my flatulence problem. I cut a big one, ha, adieu. My immigration policy. Wherever I'm born, I stay, that's my rule of thumb. I don't try to go anywhere else. I'm happy where I am. The problem is, nobody else feels the same. Take the Mexicans. They're nice people. I got nothing against Mexicans, but if they're Mexicans, they should be in Mexico. And the ones that come here are so angry. Of course, I'd be confused and angry, too, if I had dark skin and white people's hair. Speaking of hair, how do you like those Hispanic chicks who dye their hair blonde? That's an attractive look. No wonder some Spanish guys are ready to rape any white woman who comes along. Look. If it was up to me I would open the world's borders to everyone so they could go anywhere. The only problem is that the United States is the only good country in the world. I don't see the Japanese opening their borders. The Germans try to rout anyone else out. Even Australia, a nation of criminals, keeps immigrants out. We take everybody's trash. We used to have an immigration policy in this country. During we are a boat of 900 Jews tried to get into this country and we turned them away. Now no one's turned away. We used to get lawyers and professors coming here, fleeing intolerance. We got German rocket scientists, the Sea Army de la Sea Army. Now we get guys who aren't fit to be janitors. We're bankrupt because it costs a fortune to assimilate all these immigrants. We're spending a fortune on social programs for people who come here with no skills, no jobs, and nothing to do. They have to be put on welfare. And we have to hire special bilingual teachers. Then they want signs in Spanish. Excuse me, this is America. We speak English here. It's not just the Mexicans. A lot of people who come to this country don't want to assimilate. That's the difference between now and when my grandparents immigrated from Russia and Italy. They were so embarrassed that they couldn't read that they spent all their time trying to learn how to read and speak English. When my grandparents came here, this was a huge, underpopulated country. Now it's filled up. But people still come and it's the fault of the damn French. They gave us that stupid Statue of Liberty to trick us. Some gift. Look what it's been attracting. I remember one Haitian woman who called into my show the day that I was discussing the Dominicans burning down Washington Heights, their own neighborhood, to protest a white cop who shot a drug dealer named Garcia. Hey, where I'm from, we give medals to cops who shoot drug dealers. Apparently, this Haitian woman was still steamed up about some comments I had made about Haitian immigrants. Hello, oh Odd, she said. You got an accent. My grandparents worked their asses off to get rid of their annoying accents. You should do the same. Where are you from, honey? I replied. Haiti. And I believe in voodoo. And if you don't stop saying bad things about Haiti, we're gonna send a voodoo spell after you, oh or... You know what, honey? You can do all the voodoo you want on me, it's okay. I'm not a backwards idiot who believes in voodoo. Don't embarrass the Haitian people. She started screaming, I will. I will. A bitch like you comes over here and starts screaming about voodoo and Haitians everywhere are embarrassed by you. You know what, lady? 
because you are such a moron I'm gonna put a voodoo spell on you, what do you think of that? All of a sudden she started screaming about Washington Heights, and Garcia was shot in the back. Police are shooting people in the back. I couldn't take her irrational behavior, okay, lady. Here it is. I'm now going to reverse the situation. Because I'm the greatest radio man alive I will now put a voodoo hex on you. Here you go. Ooga booga, ooga booga luga. It was an ancient voodoo curse I had picked up. Oh Ord, you're a jerk, oh Ord. Shut up, lady. I'm not done. Ooga booga luga. You think we're playing? We're not playing, oh Ord. Ooga booga. Ooga booga luga. We're gonna make a doll after you, oh Ord. Ooga booga luga. And Robin is sitting there, a black woman and she's taking all that shit from you, she yelled. What? A filthy word came out of your mouth? Is that what you learned in America? Ooga booga luga. Voodoo is a religion and it's my religion. Good. Voodoo is my religion, too, so, ooga booga luga. I'm going to kill a chicken today. What's your name? I'm not telling you. Tell me your first name so I can put the chicken's head on a stick and run around my house nude with it, I said. I'm going to make a doll and put some needles in the heart and you're gonna have a heart attack, she replied. Do me a favor. Answer me honestly. Do you own a television set? I asked her. Yeah. You own a car? Yeah. You got a car here, you got a TV here. It's pretty good here, isn't it? No. She screamed, I want to go back home. Ooga booga. I couldn't resist. I want to go back to my country. George Bush is a moron. Let me say something. In Haiti you don't have the balls to say anything about your leader, do you? You keep your mouth shut, Miss Voodoo. But all of a sudden you come to America and you got a big mouth about our president. How come if Voodoo works you didn't stay in Haiti and put a Voodoo curse on your president? She's screaming over all this, no, I'm gonna put it on you and George Bush. George Bush is a KKK. 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 I'm going to send you a friggin' in a tube and float your ass back to Haiti. That's what you think. That's what you think. I continued the assault, let me tell you something. Tonight with your voodoo, you cut up a pigeon and you put the pieces in your underwear, you smelly wench. You put your finger in your butt and you smell, so I could do that, too, she screamed at the top of her lungs. This is America, the phone system works fine here, I explained, this isn't Haiti, you don't have to yell out the window when you're on the phone. I heard a male voice in the background. Who's in the background, Papa Doc? Maybe. I could sense that this poor woman was tense, so I signaled to Fred and he pulled out a relaxation tape done by an Indian guru. You are completely tense, I want you to listen to this. Do what this tape says. Suddenly mellow music filled the air, along with the heavy, wooden tones of an Indian. Let's come to the neck area. Slightly roll the head to the right and then slowly to the left. Do this a few times and as you roll the head imagine that you are relaxing. Are you doing this, lady? No, she screamed. Do it. I encouraged her, roll your head. Roll your head right out the window. Do you have a job? Robin asked. None of your business, Robin. You have no job and a TV and a car. God bless America, you. Should kiss George Bush's feet every night, I said. Oh, really? I spit in his face. What has he done that's so horrible to you? They kicked the president of Haiti out of the country and George Bush is part of this conspiracy. Why are you here? I wondered. I don't want to be here. So why are you here? Because of George Bush. George Bush brought you here? I came here and I wanted to go back home. Do you want to go back home? Yes. Okay, I'm going to do you the biggest favor of your life. I'm going to buy you a plane ticket to go back to Haiti one way. But that wasn't good enough for her. Before you do that, there is a new government in there, get them out. Oh, now I have to topple a government. You know so much voodoo, why don't you go back there and get rid of them? They have guns. So. You don't need guns, you have voodoo. 
Ooga booga boo. Tell you what. I'm gonna put you on hold, Gary will get your phone number and I will buy you a ticket. Leave your color television and car here and go home to your godforsaken Haiti. I hung up on her. Just another day at the office. The Filipinos. You can't even open your mouth on the air without having some interest group write a letter. Here's a letter we got that I read on the air. It was addressed to K-Rock's general manager, Tom Shiyuzno, from some California assemblyman who wanted to complain about my remarks about the Filipino people. I don't even remember what the hell I said about the Filipinos, but thankfully this group had monitored my show and they provided this guy with my remarks. This guy is from the Office of Asian and Pacific Affairs. They got a whole office for these people. And he was writing to demand an on-air apology from me. Like I'll ever give him an apology. Anyway, he wrote. Dear Mr. Shiyuzno I would like to bring to your attention the recent racial remarks made by Howard Stern, Filipinos are terrible people. Filipinos are the most depraved people in the world and probably worse than people from France. First of all, I never said that. I was talking about a segment of the Filipino population that caters to horny Americans by selling off their women. It disgusted me that so many Filipinos were so poverty-stricken that they condoned the selling of their daughters into prostitution and, worse, slavery. And besides, I never said the Filipinos were worse than the French. They're not worse than the French. The French are the worst. If in a moment of frenzy I happened to say that there was somebody on the planet worse than the French, I stand corrected. Besides, what's so distasteful about my comments? The reason we have Asian Pacific Americans is because the Philippines is so despicable they left. Why are these people complaining about what I say? They should be back there and they wouldn't have heard it. I have to say nice things about Filipinos because a couple of guys came over here and suddenly they had balls? If they had such balls, why didn't they kick Marcos out? Where were they all those years with the shoes? It took them 10 million years to get rid of Marcos. Everybody's so brave here in America. In their own countries they never speak up. The letter went on. Comma Howard Stern said, Parents are selling children for prostitution. You can go in there and screw just about anybody. Well, prove me wrong. My leader, Tom Shiyuzno. There was also said to be a comment by a caller, he was in Manila and stayed at the Manila Hilton. He hired four midgets for sexual purposes and paid $1,000 for them. Mr. Stern responded, you pay $1,000? For half the price you can own one of them. It's true. Truth is my defense. It's unbelievable what goes on in the Philippines. There are men who will sell their daughters to you and it is documented. Why am I a bad guy for pointing that out? I'm not saying all Filipinos, I'm talking about a segment of Philippine society. By the way, this doesn't hurt the Philippines. Me saying that you can own a woman there for half the price of renting them certainly will help Filipino tourism. Most of the deviants in this country will run right over there. Am I the first one to point out that you can get a Filipino bride for 10 cents? I think not. Yes, I'm Fartman Chapter 9. Why is it that guys who come from other countries like India, a country that's totally destitute, a country with no medical facilities, decide to stay here after they get their M.D.S? Why don't they go back and help their own people? No, they wind up here, buying expensive real estate. Then they dress normal, in business suits, and make their wives wear those saris with their bellies flopping out all over the place. It's demeaning to the Indian women. I don't see Indian men wearing those diapers that Gandhi wore. And what is it with the dots on their heads? Someone told me that the dot is actually a garage door opener. If the husband presses the dot, it opens the double doors on the garage. Look, the Indians are very nice people but they worship cows and make bad movies and have dots on their heads. Then they move into white neighborhoods and ignore everyone in the town. They should loosen up. This is America. They should assimilate. Here's my philosophy and it's very simple, it's very important that we all act as one. I'm all for different races being here, but make an effort. Don't wear your culture like a badge of courage. Those wacky dots. Italian women don't walk around with pizzas on their heads. Jewish women don't go around with matzo on their backs. There are a couple of wackos like the Hasidim, 
but nobody takes them seriously. I'm trying to solve the world's problems. When they ask me to lecture before the United Negro College Fund, I know they will one day, I will tell them to try to act like white people. I tell the Jews to try to act like Christians. Everyone should try to act like white Christians. But, you know, maybe it would be better if everybody just went back to where they came from. The Hispanics who come here and get into college by passing those ethnically weighted entrance exams, question 2, recite the words to, La Bamba, go back to your people. Use your education to help them. Nobody wants to go back, nobody answers to a higher calling in life anymore. Except for me. I'm busy saving my country every day. I serve my country by marshalling my extraordinary superpowers in the pursuit of truth, justice, and the American way. Yes, I'm Fartman. Fart Boy, age 3. The Origins of Fartman Like all great superheroes, I had a traumatic childhood. My planet didn't blow up and my parents weren't killed, but I had hardships to overcome. I had nervous stomach. And who wouldn't with a father who terrorized me so much? My father would yell at me all week and then Sunday was family day. Sunday, my parents would take me and my sister into the city to get some culture. We'd go to a play or a movie at Radio City Music Hall, whatever. I hated going into Manhattan. I had a fear of the city. I don't handle things that well to begin with. I don't like walking around. I get confused. For me, it's better to stay at home where I know my environment. But the main reason I hated going into Manhattan was gas. First, we'd eat a big meal at some place like Joe's Pier 52.1 was kind of a pudgy kid and I'd go wild. I'd have lobster bisque to start, and they kept bringing out this fresh hot bread so I'd eat a couple of loaves of that then a whole bunch of salad and then a nice piece of fish and fries. Plus I ate real fast because at home when I got up from the table for a moment during a meal, my parents would assume I was done and would just grab my food. So I ate like a maniac and as soon as we left the restaurant the gas pains would start. During the show, I'd get horrible gas pains. I'd be moaning, fidgeting in my seat, and my parents would be really annoyed. I was ruining the show for everyone, what's wrong with you? My father would say. I gotta get home quick. I gotta go to the bathroom. I have bad gas. What's wrong with you? Why don't you pass some wind here? Do what I do. At the intermission, after the rockets are finished, go out in the lobby, walk over to the side, and let a few out. Fatherly advice. You're kidding. I should do that here in Radio City? Who's gonna know it was you? He said. I couldn't believe my father was telling me to pass wind in Radio City Music Hall. At intermission my father took me out to the fancy lobby with the big chandeliers and everything. We walked over to the side and he said, make like you're talking to me. Just force it out while you're talking to me. I couldn't do it. I couldn't just force it out in the middle of the lobby of Radio City Music Hall. He was saying, go ahead, do it. Do it already. What's the problem with you, you're ruining the day. I'm sorry, I couldn't pass wind in the middle of a theater with my dad yelling at me to hurry up and fart. So we went back to our seats and I suffered through the movie. I was really in pain. I sat there for two hours wishing I was home. Misery. Finally, fucking family day was over. We got in the car to drive back home to Long Island and I was in the back seat with my sister. My parents were in the front and I was holding my stomach and moaning. My father was yelling at me to fart but I still couldn't, I was too embarrassed. I was moaning and my mother couldn't take it, so she said, Ben, pull over and take him into a men's room and let him pass gas. We were in the middle of Manhattan, and my father was not too thrilled with all this. He was annoyed, he was yelling and screaming. My father saw a seedy hotel and pulled over. He grabbed me by the neck saying, come on, I don't see why we have to stop. We're going to be home in 25 minutes anyway. All this time, he was pulling me into the bathroom and pushing me in a stool. Now I'm sitting in this filthy stool in this seedy hotel with my old man pacing outside the stool, waiting to hear me pass gas. He's pacing, and my mother and sister are outside, alone in the car. How the hell am I supposed to be able to perform? You can't just let out gas on command, it takes a long time to let out gas. 
My belly is distended like a biafran baby's at this point. I can't even move. Oh, my God. After pacing for five minutes, he said, what's going on in there? Dad, I said, I can't fart. The old man was steamed and he was screaming, get out of there. He pulled me out. Back in the car, I was moaning the whole way home. And then, at home, when I was comfortable, like a dog, I went into the bathroom and passed my wind. I always had that problem with gas. Alison learned that early in our relationship. We were on a date. We had been going out a couple of months. Every time I'd be out with her, and we'd go to dinner, I'd have the same stupid problem. So we would get back to my apartment, and every couple of minutes I'd be talking to her and I would disappear for a few minutes, come back in, disappear another few minutes, come back in, disappear another few minutes, come back in. So finally she said, when you disappear, where do you go? Maybe she thought I was a drug addict or something. To tell you the truth, I'm a little uncomfortable, I'm a little gassy. She said, why do you keep doing that? Why are you uncomfortable around me? You can pass gas in front of me. Feel free. Well, with that, the floodgates opened. I was farting day and night in front of the woman and she was nauseous. I smelled like death. Like a rat crawled up my ass and got buried way too deep in my sphincter and died. I was sure she was expecting to be gassed maybe once or twice a month. Never did she realize that she would be exposed to constant heavy doses. About a week after that, she was disgusted. Listen, she said, I want to go back to our original arrangement. But it was too late. I think that's why I married her. I couldn't go through that with another girl. Fartman to the rescue. How many people do you know who can turn their faults and disadvantages into something that works for a positive higher cause, a greater good? That, my friend, is what separates a common man from a superhero. I could have glided through life, making a nice living as a radio personality, secretly excusing myself from meetings and writing sessions to repair to the bathroom to rip off her at. That would be the easy thing to do. But when your country cries out for you, when the greatest land in the world is threatened by the organized, synchronized, and simonized forces of evil, yes, when the going gets tough, the tough get blowing. There was no way for me to escape my destiny. I had to be Fartman. I created this character out of frustration. Whenever there was a problem in the world I would call foreign embassies and yell at dignitaries in a very deep voice. When they ignored my demands I would fart into the phone. Real dignitaries, real people, getting farted on over the radio all over the world. Fartman first hit the air when I was in Washington. I remember it well. A few miserable Poles had just declared martial law and poor Lech Valencia looked like he was going to have to organize a union of solitary confinement prisoners. This was a job for Fartman. I got on the air, called the Polish embassy, and actually got through to the Polish ambassador, farted into the phone, and the rest is history. Years later, Fartman was called back to active duty. We were at K-Rock, it was July 6, 1988 and the United States had just made a dreadful but honest error. We had shot down an Iranian airbus, killing 290 people. The Iranians were outraged and milking the incident. These were the very same people who had funded and orchestrated the terrorist groups that had taken innocent American civilians as hostages. As far as I was concerned, this was war. I decided to take some positive action. We would call the Iranian consulate on the air that day. I can say the things the president can't say, Robin, I said as I dialed the number. Is this the Iranian embassy? This is Fartman. We're on the radio. Yes. Are you Iranian? Yes. Listen, douchebag, I told him, I'm gonna try to talk sense to you and if you don't listen I'm going to fart into this phone. There was silence, I had his attention. Look, let me explain America's position. Sometimes in the heat of battle you look up in the sky and see a plane and feel you are being attacked. It was an honest mistake. My logic must have stunned the madman because he remained silent. And silence pisses Fartman off. Now get ready. P-H-H-H-H-H-T. I unleashed a masterful gas missile, that is all I have to say about this issue. If that makes you feel better. Was his reply. 
He was nonchalant but the reaction was instantaneous. Our switchboards were flooded by calls from listeners who called to pay homage to their new superhero. It is not a coincidence at all that the Ayatollah soon shuffled off this mortal coil. The Return of Fartman Unfortunately, we had to call on Fartman many times over the next few years. When a hostage was killed, Fartman called the Tehran Hyatt and chastised a reservations clerk. When the dreadful massacre took place in Tiananmen Square, he called the Chinese consulate and then called the world-famous FAO. Schwartz Toy Store and demanded that all their Chinese checkers be removed from the shelves. When Iraq invaded Kuwait, it incurred the full wrath of Fartman. Saddam has not recovered to this day. Wherever injustice reared its ugly head, Fartman was there. When General Noriega ruled Panama with his pockmarked despotic face and hand, Fartman reached out to the Panamanian Marriott to offer his services. My tushy rules and drools, my digestive system pumps foul air for truth and justice. I squat and fart and wash my way into the hearts of my people, as my hemorrhoids sway in the breeze, my stenching toots burn nostrils and bowl over bad guys because I am Fartman. I can blow Bert Reynolds's toupee from here to Panama. I am calling the Panamanian people to offer my services. Hello. Panama Marriott. My name is Fartman. I'm calling from the United States. May I speak to the reservations desk? Reservations. Can I help you? This is a radio station, this is Fartman. Are you familiar with Fartman? Are we familiar with Fartman? No, sir. In the United States I am considered a superhero. Because of my unique colon, I am able to help the people of America. I would like to offer you help in your trials with General Noriega. If you need me in time of war 1 a.m. El Vaste Coambre. Do you hear what I'm doing? Listen. P-H-H-H-T-T, are you in fear of General Noriega or can you speak? No, I cannot. My first appearance as Fartman, with Adam West on my TV show. I threw the costume together in five minutes, complete with a toilet seat necklace. Friends of Fartman, Fred Norris, the King of Mars Man, and Belly Button Man, Jackie Martling, right. Poor woman. She was afraid to speak, I will help you. I will come over with my farting power. I will blow up General Noriega and his armies. My flying dingle Eberys will put his eyes out. Okay, so whenever we need you, we can call you? That is correct, I replied. She was completely out of it. What kind of a lunatic would take Fartman seriously? We'll be waiting for you then, she politely responded. And I'm sorry about Ricky Ricardo and Zorro. Fartman defends Salman Rushdie. Fartman's greatest test came at the hands of a Libyan peasant. It all started when we decided to support the great author Salman Rushdie, who was under a death decree from the Ayatollah for his book The Satanic Verses. I decided that Fartman should read from the book. When the Iranian embassy didn't answer, an alternate plan was hatched. I asked my producer boy Gary to call any hotel in Iran in order to establish diplomatic ties, I've got the Tripoli Hilton on the line, he proudly announced. Hello. Is this the Tripoli Hilton? This is Fartman calling from American Radio. Robin was the first to realize boy Gary's error. Tripoli? Robin said, confused. Boy Gary was in a state of confusion once again. We had called Libya in error. Oh, this is Libya? I asked. Yes. Wait a second. This is Libya? I was supposed to be calling Iran but this will have to do. It wasn't the first mistake Gary had made and it wouldn't be the last. Let's call Australia next, boy moron. Hello, this is Fartman, is anybody there? Hello. This is Fartman, you dothead. Somebody must be there. Finally, hello. Yes, this is Fartman. Can you speak English? Yes. I am going to read from the satanic verses. I began my narrative, you couldn't find your way to heaven or what? Insensitive words to speak to a woman. Apostrophe, maybe Rushdie did deserve a death decree. Yes? The sequels to Fartman, the movie. Can you say anything but yes? I wondered. Yes. We laughed. What's funny? I am not afraid to read the satanic verses. Are you afraid to read them? I think you are crazy, said the infidel on the phone. 
I am not, I am Fartman. I can blast you with just one fart. I will toot until all is well. Because my farts are wet. I think you're crazy, you know. I don't like Gaddafi. He sniffs camel farts, I unleashed a mighty blast. P-H-H-H-H-T, I'm not afraid of him. One sniff of my gas powers and he'll be knocked unconscious. You know all those holes in Gaddafi's face? There from the time that I met him and blasted him with one of my farts. This was war, if I see you, I will fart in your face. Where do you fart? In your house, in the market, in bed with your hairy wife. P-H-H-T-T-T, I am not afraid of Kadaf, everybody is afraid of my leader. He suddenly bellowed. Was it something I said? I'd found his weak spot. He's a coward. He's afraid of us. That's why he resorts to terrorism and cross-dressing. You're donkey. I'm not the donkey, two schlips, I'm Fartman. America's the greatest country in the world, where everyone is allowed to practice freedom of religion. Unfortunately, even the Muslim religion. You are sick, I think, he said. Robin suddenly interrupted, I don't know why we're railing. Against the Libyans when it's the Iranians. This is the only number Gary has. Gary, you're an idiot. Why am I talking to Libya? Gary stepped into the room, he's Islamic. The whole nation of Islam is against the book. Let me tell you, your country stinks on ice. I wish you were here so I could fart in your face. Are you wearing sandals? No. Aha. You are wearing sandals. My rectum knows all. P-H-H-H-T. He grunted, obviously weakened by the cumulative effect of my blasts, then cursed, and hung up. At least we found an Islamic. We would have spoken to a Puerto Rican if it was up to Gary. Fartman goes to Hollywood. Hey, what's more American than doing something heroic and then wanting to cash in on it? Altruism goes only so far. I decided it was time to take Fartman to Hollywood. To the MTV Awards. The first problem was finding a co-presenter for me. MTV couldn't get anybody to appear with me. For about a month they made phone calls to everyone in Hollywood, endless phone calls, and no one would appear with me. I wanted Cindy Crawford but she wouldn't appear with me. Then I wanted to get that girl from, Beverly Hills 90210, Shannon Doherty but she's a friggin' young Republican. She wouldn't do it. No one would do it. Then Luke Berry heard me bitching about it on the air and he volunteered to co-present with me. He was really nice about it. A designer put together my costume to feature my ass cheeks. And I made the belt tight so my belly would hang out. I wanted this to be the most disgusting thing people had ever seen. I wanted people to retch over my outfit. I ate my ass off the weekend before so. I put on 25 pounds so my belly and butt would look extra gross, hanging out of my costume. The backside needed full openings to gain maximum comedy impact. These are shots of the fitting session. Believe it or not, it took three fittings to develop this mess. Designer Ted Shell's working sketch of Fartman for the MTV Awards show. The costume would be extra gross. I also decided that I was going to fly in as Fartman. I figured I'd fly in about five feet above the stage. When I got there before the show, the same guys who flew Peter Pan were going to fly me. Oh, great, this'll be a piece of cake, I thought. When I showed up for the rehearsal, they said, you gotta go up there. Thirty feet in the air. Suddenly I'm a flying warlander. Wait a minute. They want me thirty feet up in the air suspended by two little wires when I ate like a pig all weekend? They had to raise me up in stages. And I'm shaking. I'm trembling with fear, because you have no idea how scary it is. They got me up there and said, stick out your hands. Let go of the wires. I couldn't even move. When I got down, the one thing they kept saying to me was, when you're on the stage, don't spin around, because you'll tangle the wires. And if you tangle the wires, it's not good. Backstage before the show, I suddenly felt like I was back in high school. Everybody there was trying so hard to be cool. The blacks were on one side, the whites on the other, everybody was going out of their way trying to look like this whole gig was a burden, trying to out each other. That, my prerogative, guy, Whitney Houston's husband, Bobby Brown, 
was back there with about 900 black guys hanging around, bodyguards or something. If you're a white guy, they all stare at you, and they don't smile. Nobody can smile at each other. When I saw Bobby Brown, I said, what's going on in there? He barely smiled. Hey, Bobby Brown's a multimillionaire married to Whitney fucking Houston. How tough could that be? It's gotta be fun to get up and dance. On his worst day his feet are sore. My ass was so fucking embarrassing, I kept covering myself. Everybody was staring at me. You have to remember, my buttocks were full of fucking pockmarks, cellulite, hairs, all kinds of shit. But the reaction from every celebrity I passed was unbelievable. I walked my Mick Jagger, and he was disgusted. I'm standing in this dressing room, and all of a sudden, there was a Michael Jackson look-alike in there and he was looking at me like I'm some kind of jerk. He was a fucking Michael Jackson look-alike, and he was staring at me. I passed by Shannon Doherty, and she gave me a look-alike, you fucking piece of shit. It was a very strange vibe going up to do this. Then it was showtime. Time for my segment. I was 30 feet in the air and I looked down and saw Luke Perry being introduced. Key went to the podium and said, I would like to introduce my co-presenter cause no one else has the balls to show up and do it. Pretty cool, I thought, from a land far away and long, long ago, it's a bird, it's a plane, dash hey he was really getting into it, it's a really bad smell. Ladies and gentlemen, FFFF Hartman, whoop. I was on my way down. The farting noises were coming right on cue, I was booming out, yes, I'm Fartman. I'm the superhero Fartman. I landed on the stage in one piece. So far, so good, Superman is nothing. Yes, behold the most beautiful of sights. It is this. I turned my back to the audience and stuck out my buttocks. The audience was going wild. We were stealing the show. Luke was going wild applauding, yes, I'm Fartman. I turned around with my back to the audience again, is the camera getting a good shot of my beautiful ass? Look at it. It has powers. The place was going wild, allow me to demonstrate the greatest farting powers of all. I bent over, tensed up, and boom. The fucking podium exploded in a cloud of smoke. I blew the podium apart with my fart. I couldn't believe I was fucking doing this. I mean, I was almost 40 years old. How sick was this? Luke, look at my ass. Luke was my disciple now, touch it for power. Rub it, Luke held his hands up and grabbed my cheeks as if he were worshipping at the altar of my anus. Then he held his hands up, like he was cured. I felt like Jimmy Swaggart, yes, you may be laughing at my ass now, but when my movie Fartman becomes number one, all of Hollywood will kiss my ass. I farted to punctuate the sentence, do not adjust your televisions at home. This is really my ass. Another fart. There was no stopping me now. Who of you would like to touch my ass? The whole first ten rows started squealing in delight. A cute young girl jumped onto the stage, come on up here, honey, touch it for power. I had this total stranger needing my buttocks. This was too weird, yes, thank you, darling. It was time to present the awards, but I was on a roll, how did that ass feel, Luke? Great ass, man. He pinched my belly fat. I was beginning to really like this kid. Now that you have saved us from the dangers of clean breathable air. He was starting in on the business at hand but I wasn't through yet. I leaned over, grabbed his face, and planted a wet kiss on his cheek. He's the next James Dean, I crowed, let's get to the category filled with flashbacks and smoke machines, the best metal slash hard rock video. They showed the clips of the nominees. When they came back from the clips, I had my back to the audience and I was shaking my jello ed ass. I opened the envelope, the winner is Metlica, I boomed. I love the band Metlica, and their last CD is some of the best music I ever heard, but these guys were taking the event way too seriously. These two creeps from Metlica came down to accept the award. One of them, Lyle Ulrich, was this total idiot who thought he was God's gift to the world of compact disc technology. The other guy, a Carlos Santana look-alike, was wearing a beret. Enough said. This last jerk immediately went into a little self-pitying speech about how long it had been before these creeps won something from MTV. Meanwhile, 
the audience was going apeshit over me and Luke fooling around on the side. This jerk last started screaming at the audience to shut up. I couldn't believe he was telling his so-called fans to shut up. Then he started yelling at me, in the middle of his acceptance speech, Hey, man, don't steal all the attention here, okay? What a dick. Afterward, I was in the press room, having forgotten I was in my outfit. I was walking around and people were like nauseated. I went and posed for all these pictures, and they made every newspaper, with my disgusting ass and belly sticking out. Then there was all this debate in the press as to whether or not I should have done this, how it was such a terrible, terrible thing, how it brought a complete lack of decorum to the MTV Awards. I'm going, excuse me. Decorum? This is Mount fucking V. What do you think of Howard's turns ass? Asked of celebs at the press conference after the MTV event Anthony Kiedis, Red Hot. Chili Peppers, I was more impressed by other things this evening. Dennis Leahy, comic. Watching Howard Stern's ass was the most fun I ever had, man. Dana Carve, comic and host of show, I'm still haunted by it. I tried the Fartman outfit on later and we took snapshots and compared our asses. I thought he was really funny. It was great. We love each other very much. Cindy Crawford, model, I thought it was disgusting and if my ass looked like that I wouldn't show it on national television. Hey, Cindy, you better hope your ass doesn't look like mine because your looks are the only talent you have. To tell you the truth, I'm thinking about stuffing a balloon up my ass to make it look better. Or, better yet, maybe I'll buy Cindy's incredibly dangerous exercise video. Give me a break, idiot. You empty-headed bim, it was disgusting. No kidding, honey, that's why I showed it. All she has is the ability to look good. Let me tell you, Cindy, I guarantee as soon as you start looking a little old, I bet Richard Gere starts seeing other women. What do you think, he's there for your brains? Believe me, in ten years we'll see if you're still together. I'm sure your religious husband, the cerebral Richard Gere, will stay with you when you look bad. Your personality is great. When you look like Cindy Crawford, but Cindy Crawford at 40 is not going to be Cindy Crawford. I want to be there the day Cindy Crawford gets into a disfiguring car accident and Richard Gere has to live out his years staring at a legless, toothless, tightless Cindy Crawford. Oh. Please, dear. Lord, let me be there for that big event. Lord, I offer you this prayer so that I might be a witness to Cindy Crawford's disfiguring car crash. Dear Lord, I am a sinner. I need Jesus Christ to come into my life and become my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you in Jesus' name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My prayer is that you will allow me to be a part of this tremendous event when Cindy loses all her looks and is forced to rely on that dynamic personality. Thank you. I wouldn't mind sitting across the table from Howard. He's cute. Dash Carol out. Cheers to Shock Jock and Fledgling E. Entertainment television talk show host Howard's turn for his asinine appearance on the MTV Video Music Awards. Where was the infamous blue dot when we needed it? Dash TV Guide. December 26, 1991. What do you think of her awards turns as? Sammy Hagar, lead singer of Van Halen, Howard's turn is a jerk. He ruined the whole show. I don't know why you let him up there. Here's a guy who's desperately searching for an image. He has no image so his new image is he's street tough, a scrappy fighter, Hagar the horrible. His big beef with me is that I don't enjoy him in Van Halen. That's pretty pathetic, isn't it? So now he's walking around strutting his stuff, I'm gonna kick his ass? He's not kicking anybody's ass. A multimillionaire who's smart enough not to kick anyone's ass, who's he fooling? But he's going to come off like some scrappy young rock star. He's full of shit. He's a phony. I was sitting right there, three feet from him. Hard to miss me. He's a calculated businessman, that's all. I'm so sick of these millionaires trying to be street tough gangsters. Wait until Van Halen starts going out in concerts and they start screaming out, 
Howard Stern, wherever he goes. Whenever you see Sammy Hagar just scream out, Howard Stern, make him nuts. If I was selling zero records, he wouldn't be on my case. He's a loser. I'll kick his ass if I ever see him. Dash Sammy Hagar. More and more hate mail. Dear Robin and Howard this morning I happened to tune into your talk show and I have a question. What is the aim of your program? It didn't entertain or inform or instruct. I also have some comments to make. Mother Teresa, Cardinal O'Connor, and the Knights of Columbus are all good people and should not be the butt of your jokes. Concerning Mother Teresa's garb, she lives in India and is wearing the native woman's dress. Why did you have to emphasize anything about her derriere? Sirs. Stern, you constantly use the name of our Lord in vain. You are a full-blooded Jew. You look and smell like a Jew. You are evil and slander others like a Jew. Use the name of your chief rabbi or Moses when you must curse. Leave the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ off of your dirty tongue. You are a disgrace to the human race. Die you bastard die. Dear Mr. Stern. I was very troubled by your discussion with Linda Blair in which you again alluded to your wife's breast cancer from which she is expected to die suggesting Miss Blair would be a suitable replacement. This USA founded by Christians ha nothing now to brag about. The Howard Stern show out of New York is filtering the people's airways with dirty, filthy, talk, salute to dirty to mention and something needs to be done. Men's minds are evil continually the Bible says. Howard Stern will eventually rot in hello. To Howard Stern sleaze I'm so incensed and ashamed after listening to your program today where you bashed, poor Mrs. Bush. I'll say this. If it were me, I'd get to that studio, and blacken your miserable crossed A's, as you would deserve it truly. Here I as a woman who has done no harm to you or the American public. You have demeaned and defamed her in your worst thoughtless manner. You have also offended all women regardless of what age they are. How about your mother Howard? Maybe she has cheese in her folds too.